Thaddeus Cray Productions presents Werewolf Hunter. The Hunter of Dogman. Part 1. The tavern is small. And it's just about closing time. It's late Tuesday night. There's only a few people in the place. Of course, they're pretty much finishing up their last drinks. A couple of them are even acting a little bit of a fool. The balancer promptly shows them the door. One guy, not too willingly. The bartender ignores the shenanigans of the two idiots and looks to a friend that he's known for close to at least nine years. Hey man, uh, Alex. Yeah. This, the short, stocky man sitting at the bar looks up to his friend. Hey, I'm about to shut down at about... 30 minutes, okay? So, yeah, it's looking a little rough. Just one more and I'll move around. All right. Shot of whiskey is poor for him. Alex knocks it back. He tips the man. Sam sighs lightly. You know, I know. I don't really want to talk about it. I'm aware you don't want to talk about it. I know I wouldn't either, but... I just want to make sure you get home in one piece. Should kill both of us if I didn't. Yeah, no. Alex says grimly. However, a tall, thin man walks up to the bar. I got it. You sure? I got him. Don't worry about it, Arnold says. The two are co-workers, Alex and Arnold. They work for a pretty small welding company. But it pays well, despite the mess with the pandemic that's been going on. Brookhaven's a small logging community. It's the middle of winter. So business is good despite, uh, well, the lack of business. Due to the COVID pandemic. Despite this, like I said, the town is affected enough and it's hard to keep in good spirits. For Alex especially, tomorrow is the anniversary of his wife's death. Six months, anyway. It had been a year since she'd been diagnosed with leukemia. It had been stage three. It had happened quickly, but she had fought for as long as she could. Arnold holds out his hand. Come on, give me the keys. And how the hell are you going to get home? <laughs> nice try, old man. <sighs> Arnold is roughly five years younger than that of Alex. I had Rachel drop me off. That way I can get you home in one piece. I don't have to worry about that piece of crap car I have. You're the one usually calling my Jeep a piece of shit. Well, maybe so. Besides... Should kill me if you weren't home in one piece. Come on. I'm not in the mood to fight with you. Not here. Alex at first considers telling the man to piss off. But in the end, the scrawny asshole's right. Fine. He gives the man his keys and they walk outside. I'm not in the mood for a lecture before you even begin to start it. I'm not going to give you one. Matter of fact, I have a proposition for you. Once the doors are closed and the engine fired up, Alex looks to his friend. What do you mean by a proposition? Well, before I drop you off at that here to be cabin you and her built, I'd like to invite you cordially to have the chance to spend uh, some time in a larger one, and a much nicer one. <laughs> okay, and what exactly are you proposing? My uncle. David. He is currently needing me to uh, babysit the place for the next week. That's kind of surprising. Figure that place would be packed, especially with the time of year it is. You wouldn't be wrong normally, but with this fucking pandemic the way it is. Yeah, I figured as much. Plus, there's a few renovations that are going to be needed to be made pretty soon. And, like I said, he's just wanting me and uh, my family to keep an eye on it for a little bit. Plus... 
I'm actually eventually going to possibly buy the property. I'm not sure yet. All right. Maybe you're right. Maybe I don't need to be by myself right now. <laughs> There's no maybe about it. I'm not going to let you do that, man. It's not something that she would want for either of us. What are you getting at? She wasn't just your friend, Alex. She was mine, too. The man understands where he's going with this. He tries to change the subject. How's Timothy? <laughs> nice try, old man. He's doing good. He's been asking about you. Wondered why you haven't been showing up. Alex shakes his head angrily. That was kind of low, don't you think? It was intentional. You've been drinking yourself away with self-pity for the last three months. It's kind of old, don't you think? Yeah, you're right. I just don't really know what else to do. At least not right now. Well, I think that it would be good for you if you came with me. Besides, the place, the place needs a few repairs, and honestly, it might be good, I think. You're right. So you're good for it, then? Yeah, what time? Tomorrow, we'll meet at Becky's. The diner? That's right. 6 p.m. You good for that? Yeah, sounds good. All right, I'll meet you there. Time passes. And needless to say, the two part ways. Later that morning, the next day, Arnold wakes up. He doesn't sleep easily. He never has. The man has had anxiety issues all of his life. But now... Maybe do with stress at work and just the worry of being laid off. It's a very real thing. Alex was lucky enough to get vacation time, and he himself was also. But the boss had warned them both, you know. Chances are, <laughs> there's a good chance you may not have a job to come back to. Enjoy what you can while you can. A slim woman, almost as tall as that of Arnold. Very gently embraces him from behind. You gonna be all right? The woman is a very lovely woman, as I said. Thick curly hair that spills down her back. This is Rachel. She's a very young woman. She's a very lovely young woman. Roughly about six years to seven years younger than that of Alla. Young, than, younger than Arnold. Arnold himself is roughly 40, is roughly 38, 39. Alex is about 44. Rachel is, has just turned 30. So let's say there's a good little bit of an age gap between the two. But despite this, their attitudes as well as their natures balance out to each other. Arnold is definitely a take-charge kind of guy. But again, like I said, he has anxiety issues, especially as of late. He's not a coward by any means. Far from it. He's one of the more bold, he's one of the boldest individuals you'll ever meet when it comes to doing the right thing. But at the same time... He has problems. Rachel, on the other hand... There you go. Let's see. Rachel grew up in a small town not too far out of uh, East Texas, if you get my drift. She was, raised to a, she was raised in a very liberal family. Overall, very decent people. So, suffice to say, it's kind of... She's very well grounded, if you get my drift. Unlike, unlike Arnold, who is pretty high-strung. It's always been a good... It's, like I said, they two balance each other out. Their son, a young man named Timothy, who's just turned 13 not even a week ago, he is a very precocious boy. Fairly sheltered between the two of them, but not smothered by any means. As a matter of fact, he's a hard-working boy. Want to talk about it? The lovely Southern Belle from Louisiana asks her husband. I'm all right. Just, I'm worried about work. 
It's not just that. Well, I'm looking forward to our time in Uncle Dave's cabin. It's not just that, though. I'm worried about Alex. Well, he said he was coming, wasn't he? No doubt about it. I just hope that he doesn't change his mind. He's like my brother, and I don't want... I've never seen him like this. I mean, his time in the Marines, it was hard enough for him, but this... This is different. He always had my back, you know. Yeah. Always. She listens to him, simply rubbing his back, comforting the man. He squeezes her hand and continues. I grew up pretty hard, you know. Mom and Dad, they were there, and... They always did what they could for me, but I was always bullied in school, and I don't think they really knew how to teach me to defend myself. It's just something... <sighs> Dad was always busy with work, and Mom was... <laughs> she was always drinking herself damn near to death, but before she actually did drink herself to death, he says grimly. Alex, hell, he wouldn't even go to the same school that I did. He was... <laughs> When I met him, I was still in elementary, and he was in middle school, but he saw those boys beating the crap out of me, and he put a stop to it quick. We kind of stuck together after that. And of course, we lived our lives, but he taught me a lot. And then, of course, when he was, when he was in his 20s, he went off do his thing, and I always worried about him. I felt like, I guess I felt that I was kind of jealous of him at the time. You, know, you already know I tried to enlist, and they wouldn't let me, because my psych profile had flat feet, it's just how it goes, but when he came back, he was a mess, and I felt I had the chance to actually repay him, and he recovered so quickly, especially when he met Sarah. I mean, <laughs> weren't you the one that introduced him? As a matter of fact, I was. That asshole Mark had abused her so badly. The man sighs. She was a classmate of mine, you know. She'd always had my back when Alex didn't, and I figured <laughs> she's kind of a hero of mine in a way. I figured why not hook the two of them up? This didn't know go as well as it did, and then, well, you know the rest. That's right when I came in the picture. Exactly. And Timothy was not there, was not Arnold's biological son, but he did allow his boy to take his name. Because needless to say, very similar to Sarah, Rachel came out of a horrifically abusive relationship. Arnold had, with Alex's help, dealt with the asshole who, uh, who had abused both of them so badly. Needless to say, the man was still in prison. Leave it at that. I owe the two of you everything, and if you need me to help you, I will. I think you and Timmy need to come with me, obviously. It'll be good for all of us, and if we have to... I just miss her, you know. She's like the big sister I never had, and... I want to be there for him. It's the least I can do. She silently gets out of bed. And begins to head to the shower. She smirks. You know, he's going to be waking up pretty soon. She means her you know, She means Arnold Stepson and her son. Why don't we go ahead and do something? Before that happens, Arnold chuckles lightly. You're in a mood, aren't you? You could say that. He can understand this. This is actually very common for people. At least when it comes to us human beings, you know, especially when they're speaking of death. It's natural for other instincts which are involved to create life as a counterbalance. It's pretty healthy. And Arnold's always accepted this. Rachel has never been one to be, how can I say this, a, of a dark mind. Just, it's just not there. So, so to say, 
Arnold agrees, and he joins her in the shower. After they uh, have a very nice little uh, quality bit of time, and they clean each other up, to get dressed. There's, you know, the, the, the boy, that is Timothy, has already woke up and fixed himself breakfast. Hey, uh, Dad. Arnold looks to the one that he considers his son. Yeah, boy. What do you want to know? Well, we're going to be meeting Uncle Alex in that place. You know, the cabin. That's the game plan, yeah. I'm kind of glad to know that. I missed him. I've also been worried about him. I have too. But he's a man of his word. He'll meet us there. We're going to go ahead and go over to Becky's first. We'll meet him there. Sounds good. Uh, what do you want me to bring? No electronics. Nothing like that. You rot your brain enough as it is on those damn video games and that cell phone. Enough's enough of that, at least for a week. You can go ahead and plug right in when we get back. We clear? If you say so, the boy says, rolling his eyes. <laughs> Rachel smirks. You heard your daddy. Put that crap up. You ain't gonna need it. And don't make me put a boot in you. Get moving, now. Fine, Mom. The boy rolls his eyes and grumbles under his breath. They get ready. And time passes. It is roughly that evening. They pile up in Arnold's old beat-up car. And they get ready. Little do they know, the trip they're going to make will be something that changes all of their lives forever. They're heading down, they say they're heading down the main road, a back road. You have to understand, Brookhaven is in the middle of <laughs> literally the piney woods of Iowa. So you're talking deep, deep, deep woods, hills, everything. Literally in the middle of no freaking bleeping where. However, it's late at night, <clears throat> and while the cabin itself is not, is roughly about a 50 mile drive away outside of Brookhaven. It's easy enough to get there. You don't really have too many police or any type of road traps or anything like that slowing people down. Of course, you know, you naturally have logging trucks that come in and out. But right now, because of the pandemic, everything is kind of slowed down to a crawl. Plus, it's Wednesday night. So, suffice to say, it, it, because of the fact it's winter, nightfall hits early. So, so, so you know, as I said, they're already heading down. You know, everything has been discussed. And Alex told them that they'd be late. You know, he'd be late after they had their little dinner. You know, they all talked and planned everything. Alex said he had to get a couple of bits of supplies and he'd meet them down at the cabin. So everything has been set. All of them are pretty much have full bellies and they're heading on down there. However, Arnold is very anxious for some reason. He's, as I said before, he's no coward. He just has, he's worried. He's horrifically worried. And Rachel can sense it. She can sense it coming off of him in waves. Alan, honey, you really need to calm down. Slow down. We're going to get there. <sighs> Sorry, just... I don't like driving in this weather. I'm not a fan of it either, but... Don't worry, we're going to get there in one piece. <sighs> he nods. Sorry about that. No, it's all right. I understand why you're nervous. <sighs> you're worried about him. He'll be all right. Hell, not even 20 minutes ago, we was all talking. Shooting the shit in that little diner? Stuff in our bed is full. We're going to be all right. And so is he. <laughs> Timothy is already asleep in the back of the car. His, his say, you know, late night dinner has definitely uh, gotten to him. Our looks to him and chuckles. <laughs> Not even ten minutes he's out cold. I know, right? Why don't you go ahead and take a hand out of his playbook? All right, all right, I get you. She meant to say a page, not hand. So needless to say, the two are simply relaxing. They have roughly about another, 50, you know, about another forty-five miles to go. They're driving the back roads. Needless to say, there's not much traffic. It's pretty dead out there. You don't have a lot of police. You don't have too many trucks. It should be easily. Without too much of a hitch, no problem at all. 
Arnold decides to go ahead and speed up just a wee bit, and it's a mistake. He sees the massive tree that's been pulled out into the middle of the road. Rachel screams at him to look out, but it's too late. The last thing he sees, feels, and hears into the steering column. The car is smashed and flips over at least twice to land into the side of the road. And then blackness. The Alpha is pleased. Very pleased with his handiwork. He is a massive creature, standing on his hind legs at least a good nine foot in height. His weight is probably close to 800, 900 pounds of pure solid muscle. This trap in which had been sprung had been very risky. Needless to say, normally he wouldn't do this, but during the wintertime, deer and other types of prey animals can be scarce. This has been somewhat of an emergency. His mate is hungry. She has just birthed a very decent-sized litter of pups. He cannot allow her to go hungry. This... It has to be done. He is a massive brown furred creature. His muzzle, long, powerful, rows of teeth. His clawed hands flex like that of a massive big cat as he drops to all fours, his scythe of a tail moving back and forth, sending signals of communication to his brethren. Two other dogs, dog men, I should say. Him and his pack have traveled the have traveled the waterways all the way from the southern states up here to Iowa, you know, to the northern parts of Iowa. He is one of the he is one of the let's leave it this. His pack is one of those of the tribes in which do not stay in one spot. They have to constantly move. It's simply the way of it. The only time they ever really slow down is now. When uh, you know their females give birth to, to litters of pups, and once everything is settled and those, you know, and they're strong enough, and the puppies are strong enough to move around, they'll once more continue their migration. But this, well, is simply the way of things. Normally, they're born in spring; they were born off a of season. <sighs> However, he cannot allow them to be abandoned. Their numbers are so few now, and so preciously needed. He looks to his two younger brothers and motions for them to quickly flank the car. He sniffs the air. The Beta, who will be called Blackie, and the other one, the Gamma, who is known as Greyback, he is actually the older of the three, Greyback that is, but he is smaller and stumped over with age. The Alpha, like I said, his coat, massive, dark, brown. They're all, him and Blackie are both magnificent and beautiful creatures. Blackie is obviously the youngest. He looks to the Alpha, questioningly. The Alpha nods and snorts, as if saying, it's okay. Be careful. Make sure that they're not armed. He is all too well aware of the Thunderstick, in which these humans may have, once it speaks. In the direction it is pointed, it can be fatal. Arnold awakes very slowly. <laughs> Rachel, are you all right? Oh, my God. Timmy? I'm all right, Mom. I just... I'm not sure. I think I broke a leg, she says. Jesus! She winces and realizes her right leg is stuck in the wreckage of the car. She looks to Alice. She looks to Arnold with a look of terror. What the hell happened? I don't know. What the hell could have pulled that thing out in the middle of the road like this? He says. He spits off blood. He realizes his two front teeth have been knocked out from hitting the steering column. And he feels a very heavy sense of dread. He realizes they are being watched. <laughs> and that they are not alone. Black is excited. He can smell their fear. He hungers. He also wants to get this over with. 
It is all too well how dangerous human beings can be. They have actually taken down small bands of loggers before. In this area, there were pretty much very little trouble. But this is different. Those men had not been in one of these strange metal boxes. They had been out in the open. One of them had had a thunderstick, but it had been easy for them to pounce upon the man and rip him apart and take him back to the den. They had all eaten quite well, but this, this was different. They could smell the fear and it's intoxicating. They even have a young one with them. He shouldn't put up a, much of a fight. Gray, Grayback snarls at Blackie as if telling him, Slow your roll, boy. The young one, who is not much more than a pup himself, snarls back, impatient. The alpha barks, as if saying, knock it off. You, Greyback, he notions. The elder looks to the one, and whom it, and whom it is actually his much younger brother. Greyback is too old now to be the alpha, but his younger brother, the alpha, now, currently, has wisdom, and he listens to what the massive dog man has to say. He motions with his muzzle as to say, go through the back. Make sure that he's not armed or has any type of weaponry. You, Blackie, go to the side. I will take the front. They all nod, and they quickly make their way into their actions to be known. Arnold looks slowly. Outside, through the windshield. My God. What? What are you seeing? Rachel, don't move. Dad, quiet, Arnold says. I'm not trying to be angry with you, boy, but I need you to be quiet. Do you understand? All right, Tim says, terrified. The Alpha steps forth. The car has flipped back over. It's literally, even though it's smashed and has rolled over twice, it's literally sitting in the proper position. Of course, the axle, as well as the engine and everything else, is totally destroyed. And the windshield is completely smashed as well. I need you to get my gun. In the glove compartment. Rachel says nothing. She hands it to him and presses it in his hands. He makes sure it's loaded. He's terrified. He has never had to fire this thing except outside of a firing range before in his life. He looks to the massive creature that grins, or it seems to grin, as it snarls low. The Alpha drinks in Arnold's fear. Timothy, do not say a word and lock the back doors. Do you understand? Roll the windows up. They're already up, Dad. All right. The doors are locked, too. Good. Rachel, do not get out of this car. What are you going to do, you damn fool? She, she yells at him. I need you to be quiet. For once in your life, please. Grayback quickly rushes forth, digging his claws into the back of the car, slamming them literally through the hood. Tim screams in horror. As the massive beast licks all the way, literally up and down along the back panel of the car, the back window, and then across the back side window where Tim is. He's screaming and crying. Rachel, of course, sees Blackie coming forth. He snarls viciously right into the side, literally into the passenger's side, and he slashes forth. Arnold screams in horror. As he then screams for Rachel to lean back, he shoots through the window with that revolt, with that revolt, hitting Grayback right in the jaw. The, the slug rips right through the dog man's jaw and out through the side of his face. Grayback screams in horror and agony as he drops to the ground, clawing at his face. His jaw, of course, is completely ruined. The Alpha is infuriated. He says nothing. Arnold realizes he's going to die. There is no way to look out of this or run from this. I'm sorry, Rachel. 
he says. Close your eyes to me. And with this, he actually pulls himself out of the, literally through the driver's side window, which is open. The alpha, in this, he aims for the alpha. The alpha grabs him by the throat and tears him out of the car. <laughs> and tears him apart. Arnold is killed within a matter of minutes. Just limb from limb by the Alpha and Blackie. Grayback is still horrifically injured. And the Alpha looks to his elder brother with pity and grief. Rachel, her, her leg is still caught in the wreckage. She's going nowhere. She screams Arnold's name as Blackie looks in, at, you know, with grief and horror to his elder brother. And the damage that's been done to him, he looks to Rachel slams through the passenger side and rips out her throat with his massive claws. He grabs her face and rips, tearing her face completely off of her body, literally away from her head. And with this, the massive jaws of this clamp around her shoulder and he rips her out of the car. Timmy is screaming in horror as all of a sudden, the sound of a shotgun pierces through the night. Once the sound of the shotgun fires through the night, Blackie feels horrific agonizing pain as his back is literally pierced with dozens of pellets that rip into his flesh. A dogman's flesh is very thick compared to that of most animals. Think of like that of a boar. Or maybe even something beyond that. If you get my drift. Pretty much anything short of a very high velocity round isn't going to do much damage to these creatures. They're far from bulletproof, but they are very strong and very powerful. Needless to say, when Arnold has shot at, Gr at Greyback with that revolver, that had been a very high velocity round, the man kept a forty-four in the glove compartment at all times. You might think it's overkill, but Arnold was not one to take chances, and he was always a dead shot, despite the fact he was a nervous wreck half the time. Alex had taught him to shoot, and the man was actually a better shot than his friend. So suffice to say, shotgun slugs, on the other hand, while at up close range, they're very devastating to any human being. To a dog man, not really. Needless to say, Blackie drops to all fours, wheeling about. The Alpha makes his move. He's already seen one of his own. He, he already has seen one of his brothers practically murdered right in front of him. He's seen his younger brother shot. No, to hell with this. This two-legged bastard is going to die now. He lunges forth. Alex is the one who has fired the shotgun. He had stopped right in time to see the carnage. He's never seen creatures like this before. He's horrified but also just in shock. Now, he's seen some crazy stuff, but nothing like this. And the Alpha rushes forth, grabbing onto Alex, ripping the shotgun away. His jaws flash forth, and he rips out Alex's throat. And with this, he casts him aside into a tree. With enough force to damn near shatter every bone in his body, his back is broken in two. Alex is killed immediately, or so one would think. The Alpha looks angrily to Timmy, who even now is basically crying, and he can, he, <laughs> he's not getting out. He's seen both of his parents murdered, but he knows better than to try to run. He knows these things would kill him. The Alpha looks to Greyback, who's whimpering and trying to stand, but the, his jaw is literally hanging off of his head. He, he looks a mess. The dog man is very, very angry about this. He also knows he cannot let his brother suffer. Had he been in Greyback's spot, he would want the same done. He looks to Blackie, who whines in pain and anguish. He snarls to say, I'm sorry. Greyback looks to him, his eyes pleading for death. The Alpha nods, and with a vicious slash, he, he quite literally rips into Greyback's face, killing him instantly. The force of the blow, as well as the sharpness of those talons, 
enough to immediately end his life. The Alpha and Blackie howl under the night in their grief and their pain. Now at this, the Alpha snarls, looking to the direction of the one in whom had been responsible for hurting Greyback. Him and Blackie had acquired the revenge needed. They had torn the bastard to shreds. He will feed. He will definitely feed his pups well tonight. His mate is in their den, and he needs to get him and Blackie both. They need to get this prey quickly back to the den where they can be fed to his mate and their pups, and they themselves can feed. There's possibility more humans could come. The trap, while it was definitely ingenious, this right here, too much time has been delayed. Of course, they'll have to take Greyback with him and bury him. And make sure that he cannot be found again by any of these two-legged freaks, he thinks to himself. However, he looks to the direction of Alex, the one and who had shot his younger brother, Blackie. Blackie whines. Alpha drops to all fours and sniffs his back, and growls softly as if to say, You'll be all right. Blackie nods slowly, and they look to see where Alex should be, and they see that his body is not there. <laughs> we now go into Alex's memories. As his body shuts down from the attack from the Alpha, he is left for dead. However, the regeneration that constantly flows through his body due to the lycanthropy quickly brings him back to life. His mind, the synapses fire, and we see through his memories. The first memories of him as a child, with his mother and his father, fairly happy. His father, one night, is simply sitting down, talking with him telling him what he expects of him over the summer. His father is like most of the men during this period of time in Brookhaven. They're a logging family. He expects his son to be able to handle things as he grows older, and he will guide him in the ways of affairs and becoming a man who lives up the land. And he tells his boy that he is proud of him, and to keep doing as he is. He is making awesome progress. Unfortunately, the scream of their mother... A woman named Rose cannot be denied. Isaac tells his boy, he tells Alex, stay here, do not move. He tells him to hide, in the, to literally hide in the barn, and that's what Alex does. Isaac grabs up a rifle and quickly runs up into, the, into their home to aid his wife. It's the last thing he will ever do. <laughs> Alex being a very, <laughs> well, even back then, he was stubborn. He runs after his father when he hears him scream. And what he sees is pure horror. He sees a massive, wolf-headed beast. Not a dogman, but something slightly smaller. And the face, not quite as elongated. The creature is black, black as night. His eyes filled with rabid hatred and insanity. The beast is upon Alex. Alex is able to get one lucky shot off of that rifle, right as the creature rips into him and bites into his shoulder. He's able to shoot the creature right in the head, right between the eyes. His father had taught him to be a very good shot. Yes, a young boy, no older than that of seven years old, with a damn crack good shot with a rifle. The beast had grabbed him, and threw him after it had bitten him. Alex had been able to pick up the rifle because the, the fiend had been too mindless and insane to even recognize the rifle as a threat. He had simply come into that home, torn everything apart, <laughs> and pretty much intended to do the same thing to the boy. The lucky shot is what killed the creature. He had not been silver. That, of course, that is not necessarily what is needed to kill a werewolf. It helps. <laughs> However, being shot in the head will definitely do the job, especially if the brain is irreversibly destroyed. And unfortunately, that's, 
Pretty much, those are the three things that will kill a werewolf there than a doornail. A good headshot shot down the brain. Or enough trauma, be it blood loss. Or decapitation. And, of course, fire. And silver, naturally, will do the job. It slows down their regeneration. Alex had been infected that night. Subs to say, he had had no other next of kin to help out with anything. They simply, you know, the authorities have passed it off as a wolf attack and had been put in an orphanage. He had been traumatized, but he was able to recover pretty quickly. However, 13, you know, by the time he hit 13, the full moon, he had changed that night. He had been in a small little group home, orphanage, whatever you want to call it, a foster home. He had been on good terms with the other 11 boys that lived there, as well as that of... You want to call her the foster parent or the house mother, whatever you want to call her. It was one of the better places in which a child in those situations could live. Unfortunately, it had not mattered. The full moon had happened, and he had changed. We now see horrible images, horrific images of Alex changing. There's a young boy trying to halt it, but not being able to. He tore everyone in that house apart. He remembers every bit of detail. Unable to control what he is doing. Just the hunger, the rage. Everyone is torn to shreds. He remembers now, after that, being hunted by men with guns and an older man, a Native American man, stopping them. He remembers one of them refusing to see reason and the old, let's say the old man, kills him, deader than a doornail. He himself had changed into the same type of creature Alex had become that night. A massive Greyford beast. So to say, the other two had halted. There had been an agreement made. Charles would take him in. This is the old man's name, Charles Blackfeather. He would take him in. And he would raise Alex, teaching him the way of the wolf. <laughs> Charles Blackfeather takes in the boy as his own. He is a very powerful, high-ranking elder, part of the Council of Ten. Ten elder werewolves that rule the packs and the tribes with an iron fist. For those of the breed must be careful about how they reproduce. It is simply the way of it. Many ferals are tracked down and killed every year. Had Charles not understood the situation, Alex would have joined their ranks in the slain. However, Alex is also something of a rarity. It is not known for one who has been bitten by a feral so young to survive. Into near adulthood, it had been puberty in which it set the beast off. Such infects, such transferences of the infection are, are strictly forbidden. For usually one so young cannot survive. It is taboo as well as an unforgivable sin among their kind. Usually both the one who was infected and the one who dared cross such lines, they are both slain. However, this is an exception to the rule, for the pharaoh, and whom had brought Alex across, had already been killed. Charles is speaking on his behalf, and he teaches Alex. Alex is a rare one, as I said before, due to the fact he was bitten and infected at such a young age. His powers progress terrifyingly quick. He is taught the ways of the beasts. He becomes an alpha rank by the time he is well into his twenties. Such a thing is not impossible, but is very rare. Needless to say, Alex at that time has kept it straight, you know, kept it straight and narrow. There are very few who actually knew of his secrets. Sarah was one. Arnold was not among them. Because the fact is, those who know of the werewolf's secret, of course, are also put in greater danger. It is simply the way of it. Now, moving on to the current situation. Alex slowly begins to awaken as the beast takes over. He looks to his palm. The mark of the beast, the pentagram, bleeds freely as his body contorts. The three, the two remaining dogmen, the Alpha and Black, look in shock. The Alpha had heard stories from his own elders of his own tribe of such creatures, wolf changers, 
and this may be why he cast the bearded one aside so quickly. He sensed something was wrong, and now he looks in shock as a change happens almost within a matter of seconds, not minutes, but seconds. Alex's clothes are ripped to shreds. He himself stands on his hind legs, massive, digital grade legs, massive woven head, clawed hands, but no tail. He's also smaller than the dog man. Even Blackie is larger. Alex stands roughly six foot, six and a half feet maybe. However, his weight is massive. You're talking at least 450 to 500 pounds with a muscle of beasts. The alpha snarls low. And he does not hesitate. He looks at Timmy, who is still terrified, and has actually wet himself and defecated himself in terror. He can smell the fear. Any other time, he would have enjoyed making the boy a meal. It's simply the way of it. Blackie is hot-headed. He does not hesitate. He rushes forth to engage the black-haired werewolf right before him. Alex dodges under Blackie's slash, and his shorter... You know, he basically lunges forth with his own shorter muzzle. His jaws open, and he crushes down on Blackie's arm, breaking his forearm with pathetic ease. His claws leap forth, and he slashes down, gutting Blackie. Before he can even make a move or a yelp, he is killed within a matter of seconds. The Alpha steps back in horror. He has just seen his last brother slain. He goes insane. He loses it. Timothy has not lost consciousness, even though he has come close to fainting in fear. He looks to that of Alex. Surely that has to be Alex. He had just seen him, but he had seen him killed some minute ago. This makes no sense. The Alpha engages Alex, head on, literally head on. He grabs Alex by the throat, his size proving the greater advantage as he slashes, quite literally intending to disembowel the werewolf right before him. However, the dogman is not strong enough as Alex grabs his hand, grabbing it at the wrist with his free hand. And with this, he pulls with enough strength to actually dislocate the dogman's arm or front leg at the shoulder. A hideous pop of flesh and ripping meat can be heard. The dogman howls in agony as Alex kicks him with such force. He slams, ironically, into the tree that had been drug out into the road to cause this carnage to start with. The Alpha feel, literally feels one of his back legs break. He does not have the ability to heal himself as a werewolf does. These are powerful creatures, they are not supernatural beasts. The dog man whimpers angrily. He has to he has to get away. The fact is his mate is vulnerable. She is alone. If he does not find a way to get back to her, she will be defenseless. True, she can hold herself. But in the end, this is not acceptable. No, no! He cannot allow this to happen, as Alex says nothing. He drops to all fours and slams himself into the Alpha, knocking him on his back. His claws reach forth and slash down, but the Alpha bites at Alex's hand, damn near breaking the bones on his wrist. His jaws crush down further, and he's actually able to render Alex's hand useless. However, Alex's other hand is free. He slashes forth, damn near ripping the muzzle off of the Alpha, who howls in pain. Alex allows his other hand to regenerate, and with this, he grabs both the upper and lower parts of the muzzle, and he wrenches the dogman's jaws apart with a sickening crack, just like Charles Blackfeather had taught him when it comes to fighting other werewolves. The Alpha shrieks so loudly, and his vocal cords rupture with such a sickening shriek that the, that the windows in the back of the car were finished break and shatter. But his death is instantaneous. Alex snarls angrily and raises up on his hind legs. Timmy is crying horribly. Alex very calmly stalks forth, snarls, very able to contain his hunger and his anger. He realizes he cannot change back in this state 
you'll lose control, and you'll possibly have a permanently feral mindset. He looks to the one that is Grayback. She snarls low and drops to all fours, ripping into his flesh, eating, consuming, holding the beast at bay. He's now possibly able to will back the change. He focuses. In a matter of minutes, he changes it back. He's in horrific agony, horrible pain. However, he's able to focus. He damn near blacks out. But he's able to hold his own. As Tim looks to the bearded man that approaches him, he wants to scream in terror. He's just seeing his parents torn to pieces before him. They're both, of course, very dead. Alex looks down in shock <clears throat> at the two who were literally like a brother and sister to him. He looks to the one that is like almost a, a nephew or a son. Yeah. He shudders as he gains control of the beast further. He makes no hesitation or effort to hide his tears. He doesn't break down. He's at this moment too far gone for that. He looks to Tim once more and says, I'm sorry. Alex? Yeah, it's me. Mom, I know. What? I don't know what they are. Right now, I need you to stay in that car. Do you understand? I have a couple of phone calls I have to make. I need to make sure that whatever these things are, they're not found. The boy nods. And they say he makes a phone call to his old friend. What's going on, boy? Charles called, you know, answers on the phone. I need some help, old man. What's going on? Alex tells him of the entire situation, as well as the carnage that's been left behind. Jeez. My God, Charles says. Have you ever encountered? I'll answer your questions in a few. Right now, we need to get that boy to safety your friends dealt with and those monsters disposed of. I'll answer all questions you have once all that is done. Do you understand? Alex knows better than to question his mentor on such things. Within a matter of hours, men in black vehicles, SUVs, vans, quickly show up. Suffice to say, every last one of these individuals are either connected to that of the Brotherhood of the Wolf, or they themselves are part of the Brotherhood of the Wolf, as in werewolves. The dogmen's carcasses are quickly rounded up and thrown in the vehicles. One of them gives his console condolences to Alex. The short, stocky man nods as he's giving clothes. Tim, of course, is taken to a place where he can at least be kept safe for now. The boy has family who will take care of him. However, it will be a very hard road for this child to actually overcome. Time passes. And we now focus to a, to a very old home in Texas. It is roughly close to three weeks after the events of what have happened. Alex is demanding answers. Sit down, Alex, and I will talk to you about them. It's about fucking time. Alex rarely cusses. So what needs to say, when he's doing this, he's furious. Sit down! Charles snarls. Alex throws his hands up in the air and says, fine. First off, how is the boy? He's all right. He's with relatives. He knows better than to say anything. He's not dumb. That's wise. Because if he doesn't keep his mouth shut on certain things... We can't protect him. So what are these things? Who in the hell would want to threaten him? 
people in the government, if you understand where I'm going with this. But of course. The CIA has the CIA and other alphabet agencies, they have long, long they have long fingers, you know that. And while us and the Brotherhood, we have power, unimaginable power. There's only so much we can do. Our influence only goes so far. It took a lot of convincing. I can leave it at that. He's safe. That's all you need to know. Good. I will make sure that he is watched after on my end. His... His great uncle is keeping an eye on him. A man named David. He's a bit of a hard ass, but actually... I think that's exactly what he's going to be needing right now. He'll give the kid what he needs, and he's viciously protective, too. He can hold his own, and then some. Some ways better than me. All right, that's good to know. So tell me, what the hell are these things? They just killed two of my best friends in front of me. I want answers, and you're going to get them. They go by many names, and they go by different stories of their origins and legends. I don't know exactly where they come from, but they are known as the Sinocephali. Dog-headed ones. Exactly. I know my Greek, old man. <laughs> of course you do, boy. Every five years, we have what is known, a pur known as a purge. These creatures outnumber us five to one, if not more. They reproduce quickly, and as you have noticed, they are very resilient and very intelligent. <laughs> yeah, that Alpha, he was a powerful one. He damn near killed me. He made short work of all of them. One on one, these creatures are no match for us, even a feral of our kind could easily rip apart a lower ranking of their number. However, these creatures fight in packs, in case you have not noticed. Just like we do, but there are more of them. Alex nods grimly. But why? They were hungry. It's that simple. These creatures are not human. There's nothing human about them. I see. So these are not... No, they're not one of us. They never were. They don't think as we do. You have to understand that. These are... They're animals. Very intelligent. In some ways, empathic. Animals. But they are animals. They don't see right and wrong like we do. There was nothing personal in their actions. However, they reproduce quickly. Very fast. Within a matter of eight years, <laughs> they're practically in full... They're practically full-grown. That Alpha was roughly that age. He was in his prime. They're usually, they usually strike out on their own after two to three years, and they reach full maturity by around six to seven years. By eight to nine, they're usually fit to lead their own pack. All right. Either that or they strike out on their own completely. We do have Ronin among their numbers. Because they reproduce so fast, and because of their appetites, they're not very picky. When uh, they avoid humans for obvious reasons. They have no desire to be hunted or killed themselves. But when prey is scarce, they're not above setting traps. They're not above hunting. Anything they can get their hands on. And naturally, I think you can understand why we hunt them. We have had, over the last three centuries, very bad attention towards us. This damn near wiped us out. Yeah, I put two and two together on that quick. I want to destroy these things. You want revenge, I get that. By the way, we found out why there was such a strong concentration of them. What are you saying, there's more of them? Of course there's more. That right there was a small scouting party. The Alpha was going out to uh, make sure that, he, that his mates and her pups were well fed. Oh yes, we found them, and uh, they were dealt with as well. I have a proposition for you, but I'm not sure you would uh, be fit to take it. But it might actually uh, help you get some of this anger out of you. 
You know, Sarah wanted a lot for you. She, she had big concerns. But I also know that you were not meant to settle down. None of us are. She was a good woman. You know, we talked. I offered to bring her across. I remember the conversation we had, and she refused you, even though I gave you my blessing. You don't have to bring that up, old man. It's fact. The fact is, Alex, your self-pity, why you fight it? And I admire you for that. It's still there. The fact is, you bury it. You need to focus it. That's what I've always taught you. When you, when you enlisted, I was proud of you for that. I have to admit, believe me, some of my contacts definitely had your back, and you performed very well for your country. And you did a few favors for us as well out there. You killed a couple of ferals as well as a couple of renegades. Your service has always been impeccable with us. You're possibly maybe the strongest of our kind that has ever existed. And I don't regret raising you as I did. But I'm offering you a chance. There are those among our ranks called dog hunters. Do you understand where this go where I'm going with this, possibly? Good. I'm giving you the chance to hunt these creatures. Each term of service is two years. It's considered a tour. How many of these dog hunters are there out there? There are five at any given time. Every two years we trade one out. The longest the maximum tours you are allowed is four. Of course, eight years to one of us is nothing. You have to understand, your average werewolf, of course, you know, due to their lifestyle, violence and death go hand in hand. So many of them, of course, didn't live to be old. But those who did would usually live at least twice the length of a span that a normal human being would before their death of old age. So need to say, eight years to one of these guys is nothing. All right. You'll be paid well, too. And uh, you damn sure will have uh, almost near impunity with your actions. But don't abuse that. I wouldn't do that anyway. I'll make sure that child is taken care of. Timothy will not need to want, nor will his uncle. David's a proud man. He may not accept help. Fair enough. That boy is going to definitely need help. A lot of it, I know. So there you go. What do you say? You have a deal. I want to end these creatures. We'll never be able to wipe them out, but we can at least keep their numbers low. We've had enough problems due to these creatures. They're part of nature. They're part of balance, of course. You know, to drive a species to extinction is insanity, not to mention pure evil. But these creatures have become too numerous. And plus, I want to know why they've become so numerous. They have been around as long as we have, possibly since the beginning of time itself. But I want answers, and I think that you can help me find them. Alex narrows his eyes. All right. And thus, the end of Chapter 1 of the Dog Hunter series is done. I hope you guys enjoyed my first uh, chapter involving uh, Alex McIntyre and his situation with the Dogmen. There will be more chapters of the Werewolf Hunter coming out there. He will not just be dealing with Dogmen, he'll be dealing with other creatures as well. I guarantee that. I'm more than willing to take suggestions in the comments. The fact is, though, I'm just warning you guys ahead of time. This is a, a project I've been working on for many years. I just have not had the guts to really release it until now. I'm just letting y'all know that right at this moment in time. But I'm always taking suggestions. Leave them in the comments. Believe me, I'd love to hear it. Even feedback. You know, believe me, I actually welcome constructive criticism. Disrespect I laugh at, but we, I think, uh, know that already. But as for constructive criticism and ideas, hit me up. Or single say is no. I mean, you know. But believe me, I mean, I enjoy having my work critiqued and reviewed within reason. Just like any human being. But more than you know, believe me, I hope you enjoyed this, and believe me, I love making it. I'm just letting you know that it will not be uh, the final work by any means. There's many more chapters coming out. Give me ideas, believe me. I would definitely love to uh, give the chance for Alex to have to face 
many other types of cryptids, even supernatural affairs, you know. But as I said before, some of this stuff is already preset in my mind, but I'm more than willing to definitely add new ideas. Let me know what you think. And of course, you guys already know how to reach me. Wes Vic at dogmancams.com If y'all need me uh, to be sharing your cryptid experiences, I'll be glad to do that. That's on John Bell's side, the Dogman Cam Show. If you guys are needing me to, or wanting to have your supernatural, paranormal experiences set out there, and listen to and heard, and that chance given to you, let me know, and I guarantee you, I'll put you on Sean Graham's show, Chasing the Truth. Hit me up. You guys know how to reach me. I will talk to you guys soon. Be blessed and be safe. Thaddeus Cray Productions presents Grey Wolf. A Werewolf Hunter Tale. This story revolves around the origins of Charles Blackfeather, the man who trained Alex in the ways of the werewolf. Follow with me, dear listener, the path of Charles' father to saving his people from the threat of the dogmen and to his final redemption, the sacrifice which would bring young Charles to the ways of the lycanthrope and his path in life itself. Many of you know the story of Alex, the only known living werewolf to have been infected during childhood and survived. I will now tell you of the one who taught him the way of the wolf. The old man was born during the turn of the 20th century. He was born Charles Legrand Sanchez in the tribe of the Sioux. His mother Elise was concerned for his well-being. He had been born under the glow of the full moon. The boy lived a very troubled life with an alcoholic father who loved him dearly despite the abuse he heaped upon him and his mother. He thought to strengthen and make Charlie a man. He succeeded in doing so, but also cemented a deep hatred within the man as he grew up. Dear old dad was named Emmanuel Sanchez he at times was called Red Thunder in the Sioux language. It was not a compliment due to his temper. However, despite this, the elders of the tribe respected him. Despite his violent anger for reasons hidden from his family. The reservation had many strange denizens that would dwell amongst the people and within their woods. One, of course, was a Sasquatch. And while there were situations of conflict, this was rare. As long as their families and territory were let be. And so were the people of the Sioux. The standing wolves were another matter. They traveled the waterways and were not above picking off a straggler or even a child, when prey became scarce. The Bigfoot outnumbered them, and when they would also travel through the res, they would drive off the dogmen. This balance created an agreement between the Squatches and the Sioux of the reservation, that would pay a small tribute to the mass of beings in the way of food and different animals. This was not a habituation, but a true, almost spiritual, understanding. Many years passed, and the upright wolves would always be driven out or killed by the combined effort of man and Bigfoot. Unfortunately, disaster struck, and a vicious plague came through, killing many men, and also Sasquatch, as they themselves are primates. They were forced to leave the territories as they needed to preserve their children and their dwindling numbers. It was found later that an insane shaman drunk on a desire for power had called forth the plague, seeking to draw in the dogman and drive the Sasquatch out. He succeeded, all right, but whatever evil forces told him he could control the dogmen and make them his slaves lied. He was found by angry members of the tribe, already dead torn apart by the dog-headed ones. 
the attacks began in earnest. It was during this time, in the 1930s, that drastic measures were taken. War parties were gathered to end the pack of dogmen's reign of terror. Cattle, dogs, children, the elderly were all taken and devoured. At times, heads would be placed on stones, even sticks, as a way of saying, you are our prey. We are to stay. Despair is all you have to look forward to. Soldiers, even contracts, and mercenaries could not end the Alpha and his packs reign of terror. It was then that Emmanuel was forced to make his move. He had been tolerated by the people of the Res for one reason. This reason was a secret he possessed for many years. He knew it was time to fulfill his obligation to the elders of the tribe. A man who was part of the pack, controlled by the Council of Ten, had nearly been killed in a vicious brawl years ago. A man saved this fellow. The man who saved the one of most slain was Emmanuel. The man, who was named Gaiden, would reveal that his own father and himself had been given the power of the wolf. This power is, of course, werewolfism, or lycanthropy. The father's time was soon to come. It was old, over a century. The son repaid Emmanuel's kindness and bravery, despite his awful temper. He infected Emmanuel and taught him how to control the beasts, including the marking of the palm of the Five Star, a focal point to control his rage. This also gave him free reign to abuse his awful temper upon the tribe. And the elders ignored this, even after Gaiden grew disgusted and left. Now, the debt was being called, and Emmanuel had to stop the hideous candid menace that was killing his people. He looked to his son, and told him that night to stay inside and not come out of their dwelling under any circumstances. To keep his mother safe, he tearfully told Charles that he loved them both dearly, and that he was sorry. Under the cover of the full moon, he took on the other form, the other skin, the skin of the werewolf. The alpha of the dog-headed ones answered his challenge, as did his pack. The men of the tribe did not interfere, for they knew they would stand no chance. Emmanuel would face down the alpha, a massively muscled fiend that would stand over head and shoulders taller than the bestial and savage werewolf. The Dogman Pack did not interfere. There was an unspoken command from their Alpha. Unlike the Alpha in Chapter 1 of Werewolf Hunter, this one was older and had an understanding of honor, despite his vicious ways. Emmanuel tilted his lupine muzzle into the skies and howled his challenge as he cut with clawed hands the symbol of war and death upon his chest. The Alpha howled in response and the snarling dervish of destruction the two met, fang to fang and claw to claw. Had Emmanuel made it to Alpha rank and had more time to control the beast, he would have killed the Alpha in moments. However, this was not to be. He was merely a beta and only able to change fully on the full moon. Only the mark on his palm cupped him from losing control and killing all around him in an orgy of gore. This lack of experience led to his defeat. Despite his regeneration and the supernatural attributes in which he had over the Alpha, he was slain. One does not truly know if dogmen have supernatural qualities as werewolves, but regeneration was not a blessing bestowed upon the ones the tribe knew of. The Alpha, despite tearing Emmanuel's throat out, also was severely hurt. He would not survive his injuries. The pack howled in mourning and gathered their leaguer's carcass. They would be gone by sunrise. Charles had snuck out of the house and had watched everything. He swore he would never forget his father's sacrifice, nor would he shun the mantle of the wolf if it would ever be offered unto him 
this mantle he would seek out for years before finding a member of the Council of Ten. This man had been named Alphonse, an elder from Scotland. He would place the young Sue Brave on a series of trials. These trials Charles passed, and the power of the werewolf was bestowed to him. Charles Legrand Sanchez would take the name of Blackfeather, a symbol of rebirth and hope. He joined the council as he gained age and power. However, in the present day, he is known as Grey Wolf, the ender of the dog-headed ones, also known as the Grey Death, the protector of his people. I hope you enjoyed this minor installment into the Werewolf Hunter series. You all know what I do. I am the producer for Chasing the Truth, Dogman Camps, and the Vault of Nightmares. John Bell of Dogman Camps mainly does cryptids, but he's slowly branching out to other things every now and then. He is dying to give you the chance to tell your encounters. John Graham hosts Chasing the Truth, which covers everything paranormal and even cryptids. He would love to have you share one of your stories. Vault hosts the Vault of Nightmares, and his experience with cryptids is renowned, as <laughs> is his experience with many other things. He will gladly guide you down the Vault of Nightmares to share your encounters. Y'all already know my email address. It is westvic at dogmancams.com. Hit me up. You guys who know me on Facebook, hit me up there. Messenger, Reddit, you guys know the Thaddeus Cray name by now. Hit me up, and I guarantee you, Leave in the comments on Facebook, Reddit, whatever. I guarantee you, I will make sure you have the chance to have your story told. You guys be blessed, and you be safe. That is Cray Productions presents... Werewolf Hunter, Chapter 2. This takes place roughly two to three years after the events of Chapter 1. I sincerely hope, dear listener, that you enjoy this story. The shack is old, the air heavy, the man terrified and tired. Daryl Abernathy has decided at this moment he will run no longer. He owes people money, the wrong kind of people, the wrong kind of money. But even that does not terrify him. Like what he is facing now terrifies him. The fact is, he is dealing with something more than man, or maybe less. Does it matter truly? He knows that he is in mortal danger, and he cannot allow himself to go out without a fight. That is one thing. Daryl, at times, is not the boldest of men, but he is no coward. He is an Abernathy, and he will fight. The shack he sits in. He had known of it all the way from childhood. When he and his sister would hide here, get away from their father's abuse, as well as the heavy hand and belt which he would use upon them. He had taken many blows for his sister. Many. But now this place is no longer such a refuge. And that had been over 15 years ago. He stands silently. The 29-year-old man will no longer run. He hears heavy breathing. And he literally can feel the heat in the air drop. But this is not due to anything abnormal. It is due to his own senses being heightened by anxiety and fear. He feels his own blood rushing through his veins. With the rifle clutched in his hands, he steps outside. The moon stares upon him, as do the stars. And with this, he looks to the shadows of the tree line. He sees the form. It's not making any effort to hide. But of course, it never did to begin with. I don't know what you are, you son of a bitch, but I am not afraid of you! He yells. The creature, whatever it is in the darkness, it does not hesitate. He tries to aim his rifle, 
shoot it before it can move upon him, but it is too late. The rifle is snatched away from him. Massive limbs ah! slam down upon his body as he is folded in half. Literally, in half. And he knows no more. Hey fella, you mind putting that out? You know, I'm not exactly in the mood for us to get blown up. How about you know your role and be quiet? The man says, smirking. Screw you too, asshole. Not my type. Whatever, man. The younger man throws his hands up in the air, gets in his nice little sports car and drives away. Michael chuckles lightly. You've done with that type before. Kids. Besides, hadn't even been smoking the damn thing. Hadn't even been lit. He calmly turns off the gas and makes sure, of course, that his uh, gas tank is sealed up to his truck and is roaring and ready to go. It's then that he lights a cigarette up. Chuckles lightly, thinking of uh, different things. And then he feels his phone go off. It's vibrating. <laughs> Picks it up and answers it. Yeah. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I'm in Oak Run now. Quaint little town. <laughs> I've been here in my life, but, you know, there you have it. Yeah, I passed the Wobble House. That's where you want to meet. Not a problem. I'll be there. He hangs up, gets in his truck, goes on down the road. Across the highway, and he settles right there in the Waffle House. Parks. He gets out, ready to go. Looks around, not too many people. You can dig that. Michael Ryback, he's dealt with a lot of things. He's, of course, fought more than one uh, tour in the wars that currently ravage the world, as well as many of the things in which our own country in the USA tries to settle. And I mean that with quotations. He settles down as best he can. He makes his way inside. He sees a stocky bearded man sitting near the back. The man's eyes flick a amber for a moment. No one else, of course, catches this. Michael, due to the fact that he's dealt with so many beings, he catches it immediately. This must be Alex. He exhales lightly. Normally he's not so nervous, but this is kind of an exception to that rule. He sits down across from the smaller man, his large mass having difficulty actually getting comfortable in the booth. You think they'd make a uh, seat like this more comfortable? <laughs> and of course, a beggar like me can't be a chooser. Take your Mr. McIntyre? That's right. Two shake hands. And with this, Michael decides to go ahead and break the ice. My, uh, well, you could say a friend with benefits told me a lot about you guys. And also, I've dealt with your kind, uh, don't take offense to that if you can help it, but I understand. Mm, fair enough. I've dealt with guys like you off and on. I spent a little bit of time in the army. Saw a few things in Afghanistan I wish I did not, but there you have it. And I know a few uh, friends of mine who were native kind of enlightened me on things. Of course, uh, you know, my friend Felicia, she uh, enlightened me about what you do as well as the council. As you kind of figured, I called them and I figured if they could give me some work as well as maybe help me with some of my goals. That goal being revenge. Partly. Mainly, I guess I just want to try to see if I can help people. I've been doing this on my own, with my own funding. The fact is... Well, I'm not going to lie to you. There is a hefty paycheck that comes with it, but... You're going to have to put a lot of work into it, kid. I'm telling you that now. The man wants to tell him I'm no kid. But of course, in the end, he himself is a kid compared to this fellow. Alex has definitely handled things well the last two years. But in the end, his life has taken a toll on him. His hair is already starting to turn gray. So that is actually quite common when it comes to uh, an alpha rank werewolf who was turned at such a young age. He most likely will live many more years unless he's killed in battle or some kind of conflict. The man exhales relief. You know my story, 
I'm not sure there's a lot to tell. I'm not exactly the easiest to work with, but I am more than willing to try. Alex very calmly takes a toothpick and chews it slightly. The thing is, I believe you. I believed you from the get-go. The council, they don't play around. They do research on every person they come across. They know more about you than you know about yourself, if you get my drift. Perfectly, Michael says. So don't take offense with the things I'm going to ask you. I can take what you have to offer. Just let me know. All right. I need to hear from your own lips and your words why you want to do this. What set you on this path? And I'll fill you in on myself once all that's done. If we're going to be working together in any way, shape, or form, there can be no secrets. At least not when it comes to this. I'm not wanting your life story. I want to know what sets you into wanting to do this. Other than the money. Because it's more than that. It always has to be. Because had that been the issue, we wouldn't be talking now. I can respect that. Okay. He exhales lightly. Started about five years ago. I grew up in a town, small little mining town in Kentucky. Probably uh, not too different from a place you grew up at. I mean, I don't know much about you, but I have that. I can pick up vibes pretty quick. Alex nods. Okay, so I'll get to the point. My wife, her name was Felicity. Her father was a good man. I worked for him. As a matter of fact, uh, he uh, also was a pastor in Marston. His name was Joel Bristow. Mr. Bristow was a firm man. My family, the Rybacks, and his, the Bristows, they grew up together. We, you know, we were almost the reverse of the Hetfields and McCoys, you know. No fighting or squ you know, squabbling, any feud, nothing like that. We were, we, we were tight, you know what I'm saying? Real tight. We considered each other kin. We still do. I was one of uh, Mr. Mr. Bristow's main guys. I was one of his head foremen. He was firm, sometimes too harsh at times, but you worked with what you had, and believe me, you can get results. He was fair and a very good man, despite <laughs> the fact he could work you to the ground. I was able to keep up with him. Of course, me and his daughter, we'd known each other since kids in school. And, you know, we stayed together and eventually married. No real deep, dark secret there, right? It was my brother that was a problem. And not in a bad way. He was just boneheaded. You see, you have to understand. My, you know, our father, he died when we were young. I mean, Joseph, he was a good man, but working in those mines, you know, things happen. Of course. So, uh, getting past that. Henry, he tended to be... You know, he got into a bad crowd. Drugs, drinking, you know the drill. Matter of fact, I was forced to fire him. He worked in the same mine. But I didn't throw him out. And I'm glad I didn't, because he would have had nowhere else to go. But he actually got a decent job in Lester's gun shop. And things were going pretty good for him. He still would drink too fucking much, but that's life. So anyway, Felicity... She always kept the house, if you, if you get what I'm trying to say. I mean, she worked uh, for Mr. Bristow, too. After all, he was her dad. But it was only part-time, and pretty much it was agreed between all of us that it would be easier. You know, she was wanting kids. I mean, she really, really wanted a kid. And it was agreed between all of us that, you know, she would have much better luck with that if she settled down. You know, less stress, less... I mean, she kind of kept the house up. I, I didn't really require that. Henry did more of that, actually, than her. But don't get me wrong. She definitely helped me in more ways than one. She did most of the clerical stuff. She was... That woman was very, very smart. She didn't just look good. She was smart. And I counted on that. She was literally the foundation, which helped me do what I needed to do. All came to a head one night. You know, it was after a uh, co-worker's birthday. You know, we had all gotten a little more drunk than we should have, I admit that. And finally, we had settled out at the house. Henry was being a moron. He was firing that damn gun of his. 
It's like 2 in the morning, and of course we're in the middle of nowhere. That ain't a big issue. Problem was, <laughs> he was just, he was being stupid. Enough was enough. I was about, I was so fed up. I was, of course, like I said, I was drunk myself. Probably worse than him, which is saying something. But I was going to go out there and I was going to take that gun from him and shove it up his butt and maybe pull the trigger <laughs> sideways to get my drift. Of course, I'm talking mess, but still, I was going to thrash him, right? Alex nuts. Well, anyway, so I go out there. And actually, Felicity, you know, she says, hey, going back inside, I got this. She was the only one of us sober. And I'm like, okay, fine. Tired, I'm going to sleep. The man then clenches his fists. I was just patient with him. So anyway. I didn't exactly doze off. You know, something kept me from sleeping. Maybe it was the alcohol, I don't know. But a little time passed, and I heard that gun fire off again, you know, and I heard screaming. Bad screaming. Loud screaming. It was a sound of, uh, well, the best way I can describe it is, I know for a fact, if you're anything like I am, you've done your fair share of hunting. Probably more. Alex nods. Well, you know that sound of a knife cutting through something wet? You know, it's like when you're uh, dressing a deer. You know, taking the hide off of it so you can get the meat inside. Of course, it's like that. But it was a lot louder with a lot much more force. Of course, I hear my wife screaming. I mean, screaming like you wouldn't believe. And then there was nothing. I heard this heavy breathing and snarling. And, you know, I, it wasn't a. <sighs> Here's the thing I've dealt with wood boogers. He says, keeping his voice low. I'm no stranger to how those things operate. And for the most part, unless they're. unless they're provoked, they're not going to do anything. I mean, they try to drive you out of their territory or run you off what they consider is their area, or whatever. I mean, I've known of a couple of people who have actually been off their property. But not, normally not like this. I found them outside, torn to shreds. I mean, I'm not talking about just murdered or killed. I saw my wife and my brother torn to pieces. Or more like slashed to pieces. Now, I've... <sighs> he shot his lightning. Sorry. Stand. Well, anyway, I've seen wild animal attacks. This is beyond that. I was actually, you know, I did some time a few years ago. Matter of fact, a couple of areas up north, they needed a guide, a trapper. Now, I'm not exactly too uh, knowledgeable on the trapping side. Of course, I know a little bit, but not much. When it comes to tracking, that's another story, my brother. I have seen the results of animal attacks. I've seen the results of what happens when a bear kills someone. This was beyond that. Whatever had done this was beyond anything. I'll tell you right now, I got that answer, or that question, answered quick enough. Because I saw what had done this to my family. It was a big, upright wolf. A bipedal fucking wolf. This like, um, he's trembling now. Remember it. It was black. All black. This like, uh, Van Helsing. You know, when, uh, you know, that guy, Van Helsing, the main guy, right? In that movie, he, he, you know, he was fighting Dracula. He became that big black werewolf. He didn't look exactly like that, but it looked close enough. And that's what I was thinking at first, brother. I thought it was one of you guys that had done this. But I remembered, you know, what I'd been told through the stories, and of course, I realized this was not one of y'all. Number one, I have yet to see a werewolf have a tail. This thing was too bestial. This thing was, it was too much of, it was too animal-like, if you understand what I'm trying to tell you, perfectly. So I knew it was something beyond that. It just looked at me. I, he shot his light. I didn't even have the balls to, I mean, I was armed to the teeth, and I knew that I could not do a damn thing against this thing. It was just looked at me, as if daring me to do anything. As if saying, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> and then it just left me there. 
It didn't even touch me. It just left me there. Right there with the bodies of my wife and my brother. It took a few years, of course. Naturally, the authorities, they were suspicious of me. Especially, uh, well, I knew better than to tell them too much. I kept my mouth quiet. I just told them it was a bear. They went along with that, despite the fact a few people poked and prodded me on a few things. But I didn't change my story. I wanted that bastard. I wanted him bad. But I didn't know what he was. I remembered some of the native, indigenous people, even around here, that I talked with. They knew what you guys are. But this was something else. I never even heard the fucking term dog man until <laughs> you know, a couple of online horror narrations I had uh, been listening to. I've always been that kind of stuff. But it gave me the knowledge, at least to start looking. I was able to reach out few contacts I had on the inside of different organizations, doing what I do, doing what we do. It's easy enough to do. I knew a couple of people who are on parts of the dark web. You know the drill. You know the drill. I was able to get information on these things. And possibly what can kill them. Anything pretty much that is almost armor piercing. Normal stuff won't do it. Oh, no, it's not. So I found that alpha. Exactly what he was. He had a <laughs> he had a couple of others with him. I wasn't interested in them. I was able to find him. And I was able to blow his brains out, sending him screaming to hell. But it wasn't enough. I've been hunting these things ever since. I don't know if I can ever stop. Alex very calmly speaks. I can put that anger to good use. But I'm telling you right now, that kind of uh, obsession can be dangerous. I used to think that way too, about two years ago. My story's a little different, but not much. I'm not gonna put too much out there right now, because it'll be a distraction for our goal, all right? Let's leave it at this. It was not too long after my wife passed away. Cancer. It's a very nasty mess, leave it at that. So, after that period of time, my friends, uh, my friend and his wife, actually, they helped me get through the grieving process. Matter of fact, I was going to be hanging out in their cabin. They're actually in my friend's uncle's cabin at that time. They brought their son along with them. And yeah, we were all heading down that area. Unfortunately, we were caught in a trap, all of us. I was the one that found what was left of them. At least the end result. I tried to stop those monsters from killing my friends. And I could do nothing. True, I was able to avenge them, but they were still dead. You have to understand that. After seeing a few things and uh, studying these creatures, not all of them are like the ones I killed. And even the ones I killed, they were not really evil. They were trying to feed their pups and they were desperate. Now I make an excuse for nothing. I'm telling you right now, you're going to have to have a little empathy in this. Because if not, I don't have a use for you. I'm not sure I can do that, man. I can try. It's just every time I've run into these creatures, they're... People are, uh, pushing into the forest further. More than ever. Their habitats is being... They're being pushed out of their habitats. Their old traveling routes have changed as a result. So they're more likely to run into people now. Alright. So why did you want to meet me here? Well, first off, you passed the little evaluation I gave you. You were open with me, and I could tell, even though it shook you up, and I'm sorry about that. I get that. It had to be done. Alright, so you understand that. Number two. There's been a lot of murders in this town. Or supposedly, quote-unquote, it makes quotation marks with his fingers animal killings. I have business here, and that's why I wanted to meet you here. Because this is not just an evaluation of whether you'll be able to do what I do. Being a hunter, it isn't just knowing how to kill things. You have to have an eye for what's going on around you, and also understand that sometimes 
what you think you're hunting could be something different. What I'm confused about is why would the council, I mean, you and I both know that these guys are, they're, hope, they're high profile. I mean, they hold many of the biggest corporations in their pocket. Why are they so worried about an itty bitty place like this? I mean, doesn't make any sense. At least, it would have to be one <laughs> uh, hell of a reason. It's personal. I mean, unfortunately, not like that. I mean, it's a personal reason. You're right. The people in the Council of Ten, they're not going to get involved in anything around a small town unless there's good personal reason. Can't mention names of the man and who desires something done. But, I can tell you this. One of his family members, young man, came down here. You have to understand something. This itty bitty town, it used to be a logging community. But, uh, in case you ain't figured it out, uh, it's in the middle of a forest preserve. It's called that for a reason. Of course, they kind of limit uh, that kind of activity. Exactly. Their main lifeblood in a place like this, local law enforcement, uh, I'm pretty sure they're fairly corrupt. And there have been uh, a few alphabet agencies around here doing some investigating. But as you said it yourself, the council, they know a lot of people. A lot of people are in their pockets. They're able to get rid of uh, the suit problem. Unfortunately, local law enforcement ain't so easy to deal with. There's a little bit of corruption going on here, I suspect. I can't really say exactly what, because I haven't been here long enough. I've only been staying here maybe three days. A little place that uh, won't draw attention. Well, I'll get back to the point. A little town like this, its lifeblood ain't logging or anything because they can't do that much anymore. It's camping and hunting. You have a lot of people that, <laughs> especially in the summertime, as well as different seasons, hunting seasons. You have deer, a lot of them out here. So you can kind of do the math. Unfortunately, you also have kids that come out here during spring break. They, you know, they lease out property so they can get messed up, drunk, do drugs, whatever, have fun. <laughs> Usual, typical kid stuff. Uh, we all did it, of course. That's kind of what's going on. I'm not going to be saying too much out here. I mean, it's one thing if we're talking about cryptids. People ain't going to pay too much attention. At least not much. But now that we're getting to the meat of it, that's another story. What I need to know most of all is what you have with you. Perfectly. I can help you with that. Good. The big man grins. You know what? I didn't think you were going to ask. <laughs> Come on, I'll show you. He takes him outside. Opens up the back hatch to the camper of his truck. Alex peeks inside. He sees a few guns, of course, sidled secretively around. The entire vehicle, the windows were tinted. Barely illegal when it comes to the darkness. Good luck trying to actually peek in there without, uh, Having no clue of what's inside, if you get my understanding. Alex sees, of course, the guns. One is an AR-15. The other one is a 30 6 bolt-action Ruger. He recognizes that immediately. What's the case? I did not think you would ask yet, sir, but I am glad to definitely show you. He opens it very, very gently. <clears throat> and inside, he sees a 50 cal. So I take it, uh, that's what I use to, uh, take care of the bastard which killed my family. It proved invaluable, and it still does in a few situations. I saved up a lot of money, Mr. McIntyre. But I can't keep doing what I'm doing. You have to understand something. You can't hold a grudge forever. You've been doing this longer than I have, and... Yeah, you definitely uh, seem to be the expert, especially if they're paying you to do it. Like I told you before, I figured I may as well get paid pretty well to do what I do, and you'll definitely be that. But again, I need you with a clear head. 
You're not going to be any use to me otherwise. I don't do that the wrong way, but that's just how it is. I'm not taking that the wrong way at all. I keep up front two sidearms. One is a 45 Smith and Wesson, the other is a Deaded Eagle. For uh, the two legged predators, if you understand where I'm going with this perfectly. So, what exactly are you bringing to the table? Take a look. He stares down at Alex's left hand, which has changed to a massive set of claws. Dark hair, of course. Pitch black fur adorns his skin. And, of course, the claws are very evident in razor sharp talons. The palm is the texture more of that of a large canine or some sort of, uh, your pads is what I'm trying to say. Very thick textured pads instead of the normal material of the palm. And at that moment, he quickly sees the hand fade back to normal. The man, however, is sweating heavily. He shudders lightly. And Michael sees the pentagram in his right hand. You know, I never really, uh, understood that. Oh, this is called the Mark. I'm not sure if it's the mark of the beast of the Bible or not. It's just something that some of us choose to have it. Some of us choose just to learn to control our abilities uh, just naturally. I chose to have it because I was, I was infected at a very young age. I don't really want to get into that, but I was very young. Something unheard of among my kind. It... The ritual is simple. An elder will get a silver blade and carve the mark, the pentagram, into our palm. You learn to focus using the mark. I can't explain it. It's just simply a mental focal point. As you get older, it really doesn't have much meaning at all. There's not even really possibly a need for it. But, of course, the scar remains. And, naturally, it's going to bleed every time. It never fully heals, because of the silver, exactly. Now, I'm going to see you in about two hours. And what else are you carrying with you? Sorry, I got off track. I'll show you. He calmly walks into his, basically walks to his jeep, and he opens the side. He opens the uh, glove compartment. It's one hell of a hand cannon. Old 44, impressed. About as big as you, though, Alex chuckles. My friend carried it with him. I had no idea that he could even use a damn thing. I knew he was a good shot, but... <laughs> he was a skinny guy, you know, didn't really picture him. Of course, he always talked about it. I just didn't know he would carry it with him like this. I kind of decided to keep it as a reminder. And it's definitely been used since then. What else you carry? Old sawed-off shotgun. It's not really good for uh, taking down cryptids, but it's definitely good for intimidating a couple of people here and there, and definitely providing a distraction, at least long enough for me to do what I have to do. I understand. So, as I was saying, I'll see you in a couple of hours. I'm going to do a little bit of uh, investigating around here. I've been staying here long enough, but I need to get more answers. Once I talk to the property owner of uh, the area that we'll be looking up, I'll tell you more about what's going on at that point in time. There's a possibility we'll need all of your toys, and then some. Um, make sure to keep them handy. And I promise you, once I get answers, I'll give you answers. But I have to know what we're working with first. And then I'll tell you why we're here. And who exactly... ...desired things done. If that makes sense. I'll be waiting. A dark-haired woman sits near the back. She had been looking at both men. Especially appreciating the view of the bigger guy. That kind of man has always been one in whom she'd been drawn to throughout her life. But in the end, that's not why she's here. The little guy, in which she had been with, 
That guy scares the shit out of her. She seemed those kind. Beyond just your normal alpha male. Those kind of guys are dangerous. Almost, there's something primal within them that makes them almost more beast than man. She had actually dated that special forces kind of individual. The guy who scared the crap out of her. There was just something wrong with him. That short bearded dude, he has similar vibes. Not quite necessarily wrong, but definitely someone who's dangerous. The bigger guy gives similar vibes, but not quite so extreme. She had been observing them, mainly just being nosy. as a way to distract herself from her own problems. She used to work in this restaurant here when she was 17. She's 32 now, so you can do the math. She saved up to get her and her brother the hell out of this town. But in the end, after their father died, he'd return back home. At least he'd had a place to go to. Even though the place wasn't much, it was something. A small single-wide trailer. But then, of course, after the horrific abuse her and her brother had suffered, she herself is surprised at how well she's done with herself. Every week, her and her brother would talk on the phone for at least a couple of hours just to see how the other was doing. Her brother, despite the fact he was a major, major screw-up in life, was her support system. And now she's afraid that support system is gone. He did so much for her, and now... She's terrified. She already knows the elements that could pass for law enforcement in this hellhole. She's afraid that maybe, just maybe, something very bad has happened. She's looking for answers, and by God, she's going to find them. She pays for her tea, as well as her small meal. She tips the waitress and decides right then and there she needs to head to uh, her brother's trailer. Their father's old trailer. Maybe she can get some answers there. She still has a key. He had mailed it to her not even two months ago in case something did happen. She bites her lip with anxiety, but forces those thoughts away. She's about to open the door when all of a sudden she's blocked by a massive man. Big guy, at least six foot one, wall of muscle. Earl smirks down at her. This is the bitch I was one to talk to. Look, Earl, I don't have time for this. So unless... Look, I'm just going to make it real simple. Where is that piece of trash that's your brother? That's all I want to know. And then, I'll let you do what the hell you want. I don't really care. But you're going to tell me where he is. She tries to step around, away from him. And he grabs her by the wrist. Lady, I was talking to you. She sprays him in the face with mace. The man snarls angrily as he gropes at his face because of obvious horrific pain. Tries to step back to reach into her purse. There's actually a gun in there. She has to use it. However, the man smashes her in the face, full on, and near breaking her jaw and loosening two of her teeth with his fist, knocking her to the ground. She's tall and she's strong. She's no match for a man like this. And with this, he snarls angrily. You fucking bitch. I'll tell you right now, there's nothing gonna be left of you. No one's gonna find your ass either. He grabs her, struggling and kicking by the scruff of her shirt, dragging her outside. It's at that moment that there's another man in which she sees, barely able to from the force of that punch. But she hears the sound of a gun being cocked. And with this, a small man stands behind that of Earl. Look, man, I don't know what the hell you think you're doing or who you think you are, but this is... Shut the fuck up. Let her go. Or I kill you. You have... I said, let her go or you die. What else is there to understand? The man releases her. And the moment that he releases her, Alex makes his move. Beyond the view of the eye, which can blink, he smashes the, the, the grip of his gun, pistol whipping the man viciously. With enough force to shatter his jaw in two places. He knocks the man completely out cold. He falls in a heap. As if he'd been hit by a two-by-four. Or a ball bat. Which he may as well have been. Due to the strength of the strike. The manager steps out from behind the door and says, Look, I don't... You two, you, you gotta get the fuck out of here. I'm not gonna have... It's not a problem. We're leaving. The woman nods as he helps her to her feet. And with 
with this, she speaks softly. I appreciate the save, mister, but you have no idea what the hell you've just done. We can't stay here. She's, she's terrified right now. This woman has dealt with a lot of things, and she's no stranger to violence, especially with her profession. But this is beyond the norm for her. She'd expected trouble. And needless to say, she knew all too well about Earl from the get-go. She had to deal with this freak for so many years of her life. is pathetic. But this... She knew that it might happen, but it's almost impossible to prepare for such things. Alex speaks softly. Do you have a car? She nods. Were you heading somewhere before uh, that happened? She nods. All right. Do you have any place where we can talk privately? I'm not wanting any problems. I just want to see if maybe I can help you. I'm supposed to be meeting someone in a couple of hours, but maybe I can do something for you. She nods slowly. She gets in her sports car. She drives, motioning for him to follow her. He gets in his Jeep and does just that. As he follows her, he sees her pull that two-door sports car up into the parking lot of a very old, but fairly well-maintained single-wide trailer. He realizes immediately, this is instinct, it only confirms what he had suspected of to begin with. This woman grew up in this town, most likely. But at the same time, she couldn't have gotten out of here fast enough. He just has a hunch that maybe her own past was maybe not quite as horrific as his own. But in the end, details were different. Him losing his family in the, in the violent way in which it had been rendered upon him. It made him desire to hang on to what snippets of the past in which he could. A place which he could call home. Most likely, he just has a hunch. Just the way the woman moves as she nervously gets out of the car and waves for him to go ahead and get out. He nods. He can tell. This woman did not have the happy childhood that he did in his own home. This house right here is not a haven for her. Why the hell she would even think to come back here is anyone's guess. But he has a feeling he's going to find out soon enough. She cautiously fishes out of her purse an old key. She unlocks the door, and he follows her inside. The woman closes the door behind them. She calmly steps into the kitchen and looks around. She looks and sees a small dining room table. You have no idea how long it's been since I've been in this place. Too fucking long, she says. You grew up here? It's not a question. She nods slowly. You could say that, yeah. My kid brother, he's the one I'm looking for. He inherited it. Over 12, 13 years ago, after Dad died. Could have happened, couldn't have happened to a better asshole, but I still miss him, she says softly. Take it, uh, you're not too fond about going down memory lane. Look, so what exactly happened? Besides, I think I have something that might actually help you. You're looking rough, but I think you'll pass for human once you get cleaned up. You really know how to make a girl feel at home. You know that, right? <laughs> yeah, you can say that. He calmly reaches into his backpack and hands her a first aid kit. She uses, you know, different things in there to, of course, clean the blood from under her nose. So she feels in her mouth, notices those two loose teeth. I'm going to have to have these worked on. I had an overbite. Cost me a fortune to fix that. So what exactly is it uh, that guy wanted from you, other than to beat the hell out of you? He's probably looking for my brother, just like I am. At least that's what he was asking about, she says softly. That doesn't answer my question. She sighs lightly and breaks his gaze. That man you clocked the hell out of? He's a cop. 
Obviously, he wasn't in his uniform, but it doesn't matter too much. He's had this town in his grip for a long time, both him and his rotten dad. He's a deputy. His father's one of the sheriffs around here. He's actually the one that's been here the longest. The mayor turns a blind eye because he brings in money for the town. At least that's what Daryl was telling me. All right, that explains a little bit. You don't seem too worried. I've handled worse animals. Sorry, I have no respect for anyone who would strike a woman like that. I gotta give you respect, you handled yourself pretty well. So you're definitely not one that, uh, takes a lot of shit. I can respect that. But what exactly does your brother have to do with him? You don't exactly strike me as the kind of person who would associate with anybody who would even talk to someone like that. Well, it's a little bit different with family. As you may have guessed, and I'm pretty sure you have, I grew up in this town. I left when I was 17. I couldn't get the hell out of here quick enough. I took my brother with me. He enlisted. Of course, with the trauma he had dealt with after the beatings me and uh, him got from our dad, he couldn't handle it. He was kicked out right after boot camp. He always hated authority. So he figured he may as well at least try to do some local work, and he did. Uh, this town, it, the lifeblood of this place, it's hunting, camping, things like that. He would do local work as a guide for different people. Paid pretty well. Unfortunately, he got mixed in with the wrong things. He always kept to himself. It wasn't a bad crowd. It was just, he always had gambling problems. Always, even when we were young. Of course, the alcohol, the drugs. She opens the fridge. In case you haven't figured out, beer. Nothing but beer in here. No food at all. And with this, she points to the table. We'd have to sit here for hours at this table, me and him, while our father doled out punishments. I'm not going to go into the type. But usually it was a beating, a severe one, for any kind of a fraction. After Dad died, he moved back. He inherited this place, and, well, as you can see, he's taking pretty good care of it. Alright, so he got some bad habits. I can understand that, especially... Trust me, I've met the type. Many men can't handle that kind of thing. No matter how hard they try, I can understand that. Can you? She says, meeting his gaze. Trust me, I get it. She nods slowly. I worked at that Waffle House, you know. He listens. I saved every penny I could to get me and him out of here. And of course, I understand why he moved back. He hated Dad so bad. But he also loved him. Hell, I miss him, like I told you before. It's kind of fucked up like that. But anyway, not too long after I left this hellhole, I was able to get my PI license. It took a bit of work, but knowing the right people and taking care of things the right way, I was able to get my license pretty quick. That explains how you're able to hold your own pretty good in there, he says with respect. She nods gratefully. I appreciate that. But, like I told you, Earl and Ron, they're both corrupt to the fucking core. They're sick. Our father was a cop also, and that's how Daryl was able to get in with him. He tried to enlist himself on the force, but his background, by that time, he'd, he'd been arrested more than once. They wouldn't let him on, but they accepted his debt, I'll tell you that. There's a couple of places they uh, run here. Matter of fact, there's one uh, under the convenience store, outside of town. Under it, not in it, under it. A little gambling den they have there. Makes Earl a fortune. He gives most of it to his dad, but that's how they roll. How much was uh, your brother owing him? I don't know. I know it was 
well over 15 grand. I can tell you that. That's what he told me. And since he's not here, I have no idea where he could be. I think it's a safe bet that uh, neither man got a hold of him. Pretty sure that's some comfort. He was asking about him, so obviously not. She stands and reaches into the fridge. She takes out two bottles of beer. She tosses one to him. And with this, Alex smirks. You sure your brother's not gonna mind? As much of a pain in the ass as he is, he this is the least he owes me, she says chuckling. He opens one, as does she. They both knock back the brew. And with this, she shudders lightly. So what exactly are you doing in here, Mr. McIntyre? What I mean by that is, what are you doing in this town? A guy like you doesn't exactly just settle in a place like this. I saw you and your friend in the Waffle House. Like I told you, I worked in that place for a couple of years. And I've seen just about every man that comes through this town. Guys like you, I don't deal with too much. There was one guy I dated. Dude scared the hell out of me. Guy was a borderline psychopath. Soldier. A little bit more than that. Special forces, or so he claimed. Like I said, the guy was completely bloodthirsty. He's not missed, I promise you that. I made him get the hint, but... I thought he wasn't going to. I've dealt with his kind too, he says grimly. You give up a similar vibe, not the creeper vibe, but dangerous. Especially how you handled Earl in there, or out there, I should say. Most people can't do that. I've seen that man hurt many, many men. And not just because he's a cop. I don't know what branch he was in, but he was in the service. His dad and... My dad, they served, I want to say, in the same company, but I could be wrong. Alex nods slowly. In the end, I'm not sure it matters. I'll help you. You didn't answer my question, Mr. McIntyre, she says, smirking. He chuckles lightly. Well, honestly, if you're looking for your brother, I'm kind of curious. How many uh, missing persons reports... I've been in this town the last six months, darling. Do you have any idea? I mean, I can easily get answers myself, but maybe your brother, before any, you know, what happened, happened. Maybe you would know. A lot, she says. You have a lot of uh, people that travel through here. Drifters, things like that. Um, I have heard about some family members of different people who went missing asking questions, but there hasn't really been any answers. Daryl was telling me that uh, some guys in suits were around here asking questions also. So I'll tell you right now, whatever's going on, I'm pretty sure it has to do with the local booger problem, she says, raising it. And with this, Alex raises a brow. Boogers. <laughs> I'm impressed. Have you ever encountered any? She nods. There used to be this shed, not a shed, but a shack, that me and Daryl would go to. It was a hiding place for us, you know? We'd play different games, things like that. Now that I think about it, it makes sense. Go ahead, he says. I don't know who built that shack, but I can tell you right now. It was, it's been there a long, long time. Probably before even Daddy was born. What about your ma? I don't want to get into that. She passed giving birth to me. Maybe that's the reason Daddy hated me so much. I'm sorry. Well, it's alright. I just don't want to get into all that. But anyway, me and my brother, you know, we'd hang out in that place and we'd hide. Sometimes for two, three days at a time. You know, our dad, he didn't give a shit. He was either drunk or chasing whoever the hell he was chasing. That was all good and nice for both of us, she says grimly. So anyway, it started with, uh, you know, when we'd sleep there sometimes and we'd hear this banging on the walls and even a couple of rocks sometimes that were thrown. One even broke one of the windows. I, of course, wanted to get the hell out of there, but Dara said that wasn't going to happen. Why is that? Well, boogers are, they're kind of well-known around here. They're just avoided. 
It's really that simple. That might be what them people in the suits was asking about, but I don't know. Whatever the case, I haven't seen him around for a while. I'm kind of glad about that. Daryl decided to go ahead and uh, start leaving apples out there for him. And that's when we really got a chance to see him. Big. Big like nothing you'd ever seen before. Like, they look like men. Hell, they are men, but they're not. I've run across them. She, she looks at him. You're not calling me crazy, anything like that. Nope, I'm not. She laughs lightly. Whoever you are, Mr. McIntyre, you're something else. So what about your big friend? The one that you were uh, giving Google eyes at? Yeah, him, she says, chuckling grimly and blushing slightly. He's someone I'm kind of breaking in for a task. That's the reason I'm here, to uh, find out what's been uh, causing so many people to vanish. There's also been a couple of killings out here. My job to figure out what the hell's going on and get rid of the problem. So you're a contractor, she says. He nods slowly. Something like that. I take your ex kind of filled you in on that, too. He couldn't shut up about it, she says. Alex rolls his eyes. Most likely was full of shit. But yeah, that's kind of what I am. <laughs> she then grows concerned, but that doesn't make any sense. I mean, those boogers, you know, Bigfoot, Sasquatch, wherever the hell they are, they just want to be left alone. They didn't... I think there might be a reason that they're doing what they're doing. And I think we have to figure out what it is. You're saying we. And who is this we, she says, smirk. I think that might be the key to help and find your brother. And hopefully we can find him in one piece. She exhales lightly. I'm scared. You know that, right? I'm afraid of whatever answer I'm going to find. I'm not going to like it. I understand that, but I'm pretty sure you'd rather find out what's going on than... not have any answers at all, right? She nods slowly. Well, then she exhales lightly. I just want to find him before those two assholes do. I'm kind of worn kind of wondering what the hell we're going to do if we run across him again. I'll worry about that when the time comes. Obviously, right now, <laughs> most likely his dumb ass in the hospital. His daddy might be looking for us, but something tells him they're not going to look here too much. I have a feeling they've already been here, she says gently. Why are you saying that? Just a gut feeling. Not here. I know for a fact they've been looking around. They would know if Daryl showed up here or not. So I'm thinking that's probably where he is. That old shack. He knows those woods like the back of his hand better than even they would. Can you get me there? I can try. She says gently. <clears throat> and with this, Alex stands, setting the beer aside. I appreciate the hospitality. You have to go and meet your friend, huh? Well, I'm actually going to ask you to come with me if you want. I would like that, she says. I feel safe with you, at least for now. Until I can find him. I promise you, I'll do what I can. Alex's heightened senses had told him from the get-go that this woman had been on the level from him from the start. He can also smell the desperation and the fear. She's definitely used to handling rough customers. She's seen many things. But in the end, he understands. If you're willing to come with me, and you trust me, we're going to have to leave your car behind. She nods slowly. She gets that. It would stick out like a sore thumb. And with this, they get into his jeep. The person I'm going to meet ain't my friend. I'm not going to be meeting him. Until about an hour from now. I'm going to have to call him up in a second. And we'll figure out a meeting spot. But right now. I'm going to head to someone's property. Involving the person who I'm investigating. And who is that? I'll tell you when I find out myself. I know who they are. But I need no more details before I start blabbing. 
You okay with that? She nods. Who hired you? Again. One thing at a time. She nods. And with this, he fires up the engine, and they head to their destination. The old man, who is known as David Magruder, has owned this property for at least 40 years. As has his father before him, and his father before him. His line comes from a fine line of loggers. However, recent times had forced him to work as a guide, as well as lease out his property to many uh, different individuals, some uh, who were simply wanting to camp out, a couple others who were hunters. But in the end, this last one, he had been a troublemaker. Not a bad kid necessarily, but a kid. And then, well, that in itself is not good. Of course, so many people who travel through this town, vanishing as they have over the last few months. A couple of them had last been seen, of course, on his property. The people who demanded to speak with him are very scary individuals. They had been men in suits, but then all of a sudden, those scary individuals had quite literally flew the coop. They simply packed up and left. And he has a feeling one of those responsible is pulling up right now. He sees the jeep pull up and he walks down the stairway of his home to meet them on the front of his property. Can I help you? The man asks. Not too friendly. Matter of fact, you can. I'm with the council. Oh, Jesus Christ. I've been waiting for you, boy. That's all good and nice, old man. We need to talk now. Gladly. What about your friend? He looks to Rebecca. She nods. She gets back in the jeep. We can talk out here or inside. It ain't matter. I'm not going to stay here long either. I just need to know what exactly has been happening. I promise you I'll take care of your problem for you. Everything. It'll go away. But I need to know what I'm dealing with. I'll tell you right now, young man. The woods right there behind that tree line. Boogers. That's all I'm going to tell you. That's all I know to tell you. I had people asking me, the wrong kind of people asking me. I told them to whistle Dixie without using their mouth. But you? I've dealt with people who work for the council. Matter of fact, one of my nephews is one of you guys. Werewolf. Better believe him. He vouches for a lot of you people. Some things are bad, most are good. So I'll work with you. Might cost a little bit, though, if you understand. Alex very calmly reaches into his wallet and has in a couple of hundred bucks. Nice doing business with you. Alright, young man, I'll tell you. Yeah, there was a kid that, uh, him, his girlfriend, and his best friend were staying here. They were camping out in that little area right over there. A little spot. You know, I usually hollow out for hunters, campers, you know the drill. He wanted to do a little bit different. He wanted to party, get fucked up. I don't blame him for that, but it was the wrong place and damn sure the wrong time out here. I warned him he shouldn't be here, but the kid was paying good money. I ain't gonna turn that down. And in the end, I figured if he was a dumbass enough to get killed, maybe he deserved it. As long as them damn things didn't come after me, I have an agreement with him. I feed him a little bit, they leave me alone. But, a lot of the ones that was here, haven't seen them around lately. What do you mean? That's the thing. There used to be... There was four of them. Alright. And then there was three. The youngest one, you know, a little, it was a little family, a part of them. The youngest one, I think, just died from disease or something. I don't know. I stopped seeing him. But there was a juvenile, of course, a female. I'm guessing that was the mama. And then, of course, there was the alpha male, big bastard, at least ten foot, monstrous. Like, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't believe it if you saw it. You might be surprised. <laughs> Considering what you are, young man, I get that. You know, of course, some people call that habituating. I'm not going to agree with that. To me, it was an agreement. I fed them. I feed them sometimes horse feed, corn, grain, didn't matter. Sometimes apples, hell, even... A couple of times I shot a buck or a doe, and I give it to him. 
you know, man, they especially love the guts, if you know what I'm talking about. Big old gut pile, I'd leave it right over there by them trees. There was an agreement between me and them. They would leave me and mine alone. But that dumbass kid, he had a fucking gun. He shoot the damn thing all night. But the thing is, I told you, I stopped seeing the other two. You know, the mama and the, I'm guessing it was their son. I don't know if it was that or their daughter, I can't tell you. But I stopped seeing both of them. All I see is that big damn male. Thing is, he stopped accepting anything that I give him. Matter of fact, I left part of a boar I shot. He threw that damn thing at the side of my house. So I knew something was up. And that wasn't too long after uh, cops found that boy, his girl, and his buddy dead. I mean, he was the worst. His head turned around literally twice. His neck popped like a pimple. The girl, don't even get me started on her. She was ripped limb from limb. His friend, I guess, got it the easiest. His skull was crushed by a rock that was thrown at him. Alex nods grimly. I'm telling you right now, I have a feeling that male is the one responsible for uh, people vanishing as well as uh, the killings. I don't know who uh, did what to his, uh, well, his mate, whatever you want to call her, and his kid. I'm telling you, I'm betting you, they're the ones responsible for this. Alex nods slowly. I'm going to try to get rid of your problem. I can't promise anything, but I need to find answers. You do what you need to do. If you can get that thing gone, I'll pay you a lot more than, just believe me, I'll pay you a lot more than what you just paid me. If you understand where I'm going with this. Perfectly. Just so we have an understanding. <laughs> Rebecca grows concerned when she sees Alex return to the Jeep. He sits on the driver's side and, of course, prepares to start the engine. She puts a hand on his own. It's not something she would normally do with a fellow she barely knows. But this maybe is her desperation for answers, or maybe just some weird connection. She can't really put her finger on it. But she looks the shorter man in the eyes and asks him, Did you find what you were looking for? The man's rugged features reveal strain and pain and sadness. Well, I found a few answers, yeah. I'm going to go ahead and explain what I can to you. Because you're deserving to know what's going on. I'm working for some very influential people. People with money and power. People that you wouldn't even be able to believe. Just leave it at that. A family member of theirs was staying out on this man's property. Mr. Magruder out there. During spring break a couple of months ago. During that time, his body was found. Him, his girlfriend, and his buddy. They were literally roughed up very badly. And I mean badly. Something that no human being could do. I knew what I was getting into. I just needed to know really what was going on. And I found some answers that I wish I didn't. What do you mean? Can they help me find my brother? Believe me, I'm more than willing to do whatever it takes. I need to find him. Please. He squeezes her hand and then lets it go. I'm gonna try, but I can't promise anything. You may not like what you find. Her own lips pressed to a thin line. I'd rather know something than nothing. You nod slowly. I can work with that. Yeah, a booger is the one responsible for a Bigfoot. Most likely did this. And I have a feeling I know why. It's most likely a rogue alpha that's doing this. And it has damn good motivation. Somebody, I believe, killed his family. Why would they do that? that... He shrugs broad shoulders. Who the hell knows? But I have a feeling that it's... Uh, Involving a few people that we're not going to want to have to deal with. Mainly, uh, the guy I knocked out cold. Just a hunch. I could be wrong. I may have nothing to do with it, but... If your brother was fleeing out in that cabin, it's on that man's property. She freezes. She nods slowly. Confirmation. It would have to be. It's in this area. Right past them. Right past that tree line. 
it would take at least maybe 35, 45 minutes on foot, like I told you, but I can get you there. That's good to know. We'll be heading out there pretty quick. Do you have anything uh, with you other than that uh, pistol you was going to pull out of your purse? She shakes her head. I didn't exactly plan on anything, to be honest. I just came out here. I just wanted answers. I wasn't planning on anything. I can fire a rifle pretty damn good. Matter of fact, I'm a crack shot. Good. I'm not sure really what you can do, but my friend might have something you can uh, use. Because we're going to need all the help we can get. What exactly does he have to do with all this? Oh, Michael? Ah. He's someone that I was recruiting for this job. The people I work for, you know, I'm not the only one that works for them. Different contractors for different types of contracts. Sometimes, he scratched his nose lightly. A guy like me who has a little more experience will break someone like that in. See if he's uh, worth the trouble. We get paid pretty good to do what we do, so. It's kind of a screening process. This little operation here was supposed to be part of it. I just... This is the thing. I've dealt with Bigfoot before. Most of these creatures, they're not... They're not bad. They just want to be left alone. So something... Whatever set this big bastard off to be killing people the way he is, it's not good. And I see enough people lose those they love. It gets to me. She nods slowly. So, if you want to come along for the ride, darling, better strap up. <laughs> the big man pulls up after Alex had given him a phone call. He gets out of his truck. Wow, we have company? Uh, you mind explaining what exactly has gone down here that I need to know about? Alex nods and explains Rebecca's situation. The man smiles gently. I promise you, we're going to help you find your brother, all right? Whatever's going down, I promise you, we're going to find him. And with this, Alex explains everything as best he can about what's going on explains to him about the council member's family member, Ted Rex, being slain on this property, as well as his girlfriend and his friend. That definitely concerns Michael, to say the least. Doesn't make much sense. But I, like I told you, I've dealt with them things more often than not. It can be scary, but just going around Often people like that? That's something... It's weird. It would have to have one hell of a reason. Yeah, you can see that. I have a feeling that, uh... That big male out there in them woods... There's a reason he's pissed off. Somebody killed his mate and his kid. That's fucked up. Exactly. So you and me... We have to go in there... And take care of it. What about her? Alex looks to her. She shakes her head. I'm not staying anywhere. If my brother's in those woods, besides, you guys are going to need me. I know your type, Mr. McIntyre. You're a damn good tracker, but I know those woods. I don't know him perfectly, but I can get you there. If he's in that cabin, I know for a fact he'd be hiding in that place. And if he's there, I'm the only one that can get you there. I can get you there the quickest. How about that? All right. She says you can handle a rifle. I want to take a look and see how well you can shoot before we go any further. Fair enough. Michael wants to protest, but something deep within him tells him, no, not this time. He had noticed her eyeing him earlier in the restaurant, and maybe that's the reason he has such a hot, you know, soft heart when it comes to the situation. It's not a matter of him being, you know, a typical macho male. It's not that. Maybe it's because she reminds him of his wife. But in the end, maybe it's because of that. There's a chance for her to find her brother and get answers. The way he sees it, she doesn't deserve that. 
All right. Go ahead and fix those uh, two bottles up there. We'll see how good a shot she is. That looks nice and secures two bottles. To Mr. McGruder's fence. I have two AR-15s back here. You familiar with them? Very, she says. I respect that. Go ahead and take one right there. I want to see how well you handle it and how good your aim is. This isn't a matter of anything you might be thinking, but we have to know who we're dealing with. The fact is, we can't afford to babysit for anybody. Don't take that personal. It's just life. She nods. She fires two bursts. She hits her targets. Alex is very impressed. That answers that. Let's go ahead and make sure you're suited up. I'm not sure how well you'll do with a sidearm, but if you can handle that AR-15 like you did, I'm pretty sure we can get something for you. Yeah, I have uh, that 45. I'm going to shot you with that. Better than with this AR-15, especially at close range. My dad did teach me a few good things, she says, chuckling bitterly. That's good information. All right. Miss Abernathy, we'll go ahead and uh, make sure you have those. And we need to get a move on. It's going to be sun. It's going to be sundown soon. And I don't think we're going to want to be in those woods come nightfall. All three get geared up. Michael does bring that 50 caliber rifle. It's a very heavy weapon. But for a big guy like him, it's very little trouble. Subs to say... One might think it's overkill, but in the end, we're dealing with what they're possibly chasing down. It could be exactly what could save a life. Rebecca is the one that leads them. She knows this area. Once she's able to remember a few landmarks, it's very little trouble for her to lead them. It takes several minutes, at least a good 35 to 40. They get turned around slightly, but not much. She's able to lead them to the shack. Once they clear the line, they're able to see it, as I said. They're facing the back of it. And with this, Rebecca speaks softly. Follow me, she says, trembling lightly. Michael speaks gently. Look, it's going to be all right. We have your back, all right? She nods slowly. And with this, they walk around. The building itself is good size, but it's not massive by any means. It's about the size of a small cabin, no more, no less. But of course, it's pretty much a shack. Needless to say, her screaming <laughs> cuts through the darkening skies, a scream of grief and pain that cannot be denied. Michael, for a big man, runs very quick to see what the hell she found. And of course, right there, not even maybe 100 feet away from the front of the building, lay her brother, dead. He's literally been folded in half, as if something of horrific pressure came down and bent him at horrific angles. His bones are shattered, his skull split open like a melon. The woman buckles to her knees and cries. <laughs> There seems to almost to be a no end to her grief and her pain. As she grabs the body and rocks it back and forth. She doesn't care about the decomposition. She does not care about anything. She just realizes that this was her brother. No animal or predator had touched it after the one responsible had killed him in such a horrific fashion. As a matter of fact, the rogue male had left his scent all over the body. No predator is going to want to touch that. And then, of course, in the end, that had been by design a warning for anyone that would dare trespass in this territory again. And with this, she slowly lets go of the body. She's still on her knees, but she clutches that AR-15 in her hands. I don't care who did this or what, but I'm going to send it to hell screaming, and no one's going to stop me, she says. Michael sets a hand on her shoulder. She pulls away from him, as if to say, don't touch me right now. Alex puts a hand on the big man's arm, shakes his head. As if saying, let her get it out. Any of us are probably grieving in a similar fashion, if not worse. 
She just, you know, as a matter of respect. The big man nods slowly. And they let her get out. And with this, she speaks softly. Why? I don't understand. It... We'll find out soon enough. But we need to get out of here pretty quick. Unless there's something here you can find. Unless you think there's something here we can find. We need to find this thing, and we need to take care of it, Alex says gently. Matter of fact, we're being watched now. Alex cannot finish that sentence as a rifle shot pierces through the air, loud and clear, and his head jerks back. He falls in a heap, seemingly very dead, at Rebecca's feet. And at that moment, a man yells out, Don't even think about moving, either one of you. All right there, big guy. Drop that gun or I plug her, right here and now. And I ain't joking, I ain't got much to lose right now. And I ain't in the mood to be fucking with you. The man says. Michael wants to cuss the man out and tell him to play with himself. But he knows better. The man is holding an, a modified M16 in his hands. He's an older guy. Probably in his 60s. At least. If not, maybe even his early 70s. Michael lowers the gun. I said drop it, not lower it. You might want to do as he says. He's not in a good mood, and for good reason. Another man. Both men are cops. They're dressed in uniform. This is Ron Beatty and his deputy. The deputy is a man named Hank Pendleton. The rifle is dropped. You too, darling. I don't want to kill you. You're a fine-looking one. I guarantee you, I'll do it if I have to. She wants to tell him to play with himself. But she does as she's told. All right. Keep your hands up your side arms. And we'll all possibly walk away from this. You didn't have to kill him, you son of a bitch. Rebecca snarls angrily. Matter of fact, uh, you stupid cunt, I did. Ron says. That bastard, uh, made it to where my son probably won't be able to function without, uh, having his jaw wired the hell shut. For at least a couple of months, I figured I owed him that. The moment he laid a hand on my boy, he was dead. Matter of fact, I'm guessing uh, that right there is why he came out here to begin with, ain't it? He says, chuckling, motioning with his gun. He makes sure that uh, his uh, deputy Hank has the drop on them. That way, with his movements, neither one of them will do anything. He motions with his gun once more. That right there, that piece of shit you call a brother. He owed me and my boy a little too much. Guess whoever the hell is out in these woods did the work for us. <laughs> Michael laughs. And what is your major malfunction? What's so funny? There's nothing funny about any of this. Matter of fact, there is, Michael says. The fact is, you're going to kill us regardless. Oh, you better believe it. Seems like you have a good head on your shoulders. You're aware of the situation you're facing. I'd love to have you work for me. He shrugs slim shoulders. But, I can't always be choosers in life. Yeah, I'm going to kill both of you. I'll make sure it's quick, but... You guys have seen too much. And come across things that I really wish you hadn't. Yeah, I'm very aware who killed that bastard right there. Like I said before, it saved us the trouble. I'm the reason uh, that he's doing all this, too. What are you talking about? What the hell did you do? Michael says. Well, as you may have figured out, this fucking pandemic has kind of put the cramper on many things. Now, true, we can get away with a little bit more out in these uh, boonies than many. Unfortunately, people are scared. The way it is, you know. How life works. But I've been needed to make some money. Of course, we've been knowing about the boogers been wandering these woods for years. They migrate on a regular basis. Can't say one or the other, you know, this is how it works. I saw that big bastard, his mate, and their kid. I figured if I could bag the kid, 
There's been a lot of folks, you have them all the time around here, alphabet agency types, suits, feds, spooks, you name it, you got it around here. Yeah. Boogers are common knowledge, right? So I figured I'd make a little bit of money. I figured I'd put two in the little one. Take it away. I know it's kind of foolish, but a desperate man does desperate things. Special pieces of shit like that owe me money. So me and Hank here, we figured, go ahead and bag one. We're able to uh, take the little one out. What a problem. We weren't exactly expecting that cunt of a mother to try to get involved. Had to do her too. This right here, he says, padding. The M16 in his hands. Took a couple of shots in the head. But she went down. Thing is, uh, yeah, that big old male come charging out. We need to get the hell out of Dodge. We got away, barely. I'm guessing he's been killing people since. That was close to a year ago. Michael shakes his head in disgust. You're a real piece of shit. Do you have any idea how many people are dead because of you? He shrugs some shoulders. Man's gonna make a dollar here and there, right? In the end, well, I said all I needed to. Kinda got a little bit off my chest. I feel so much better now. There's so much lifted off my shoulders, right? Okay, kill them. It's at that moment that Rebecca makes her move. She very calmly and quickly, with trained precision, is able to draw her firearm. And she shoots the man in the shoulder. Michael uses that distraction to pull that Desert Eagle. And he shoots Hank twice in the chest, creating massive holes in his torso. He falls dead before he can even utter a word, much less fire a shot. He then calmly walks over to the sheriff. He just he wasn't just shot in the shoulder. That 45 slug, or that round, that bullet had pierced into his shoulder and ricocheted off the bone and traveled through his torso and out his side. The man is dying as we speak. He very calmly blows the man's brain out all over the grass. Rebecca flinches as she sees him shoot the man in the head. Michael very calmly puts his gun away. He steps forward and very gently takes the gun which Rebecca holds, that's 45, and very gently pulls it away from her grasp. The woman is shaking, just traumatized. He very gently pulls her into an embrace. Shh. It's okay. It was them or us, all right? There was no choice. Look, you saved my life. Believe me. I owe you one. I'm going to make sure you're okay. He pats her back gently, as if to calm her. It actually works. And she stops shuddering. But she doesn't shed tears. She's too far gone for that. What about... What about Alex? He didn't feel a thing. It went straight through. Bullets lodged in his brain. He holds back the fact that even that he isn't sure could actually kill one of Alex's kind. And with this he speaks. We're gonna find this thing. And we're gonna end it. Okay? She nods mutely. And with this, he holds her at arm's length. Do you understand what I'm saying? We're gonna stop this. It's not gonna hurt anyone else, but I need you to work with me, okay? We're gonna stop, we're gonna stop this thing right here and now. But I'm gonna need your help. The woman nods slowly. I think it might be a good idea to camp out here. We have supplies. I don't think these idiots call for backup. So we should be all right, at least for right now. I'm sorry about Alex, she says. You and me both, he was a good guy. I don't think you understand, it's my fault. Had he, he knew what he was getting into, just like both of us did. It's just how it works with men like us, all right? She nods. Okay, come on. Let's get you inside. 
Okay, let's get you something to eat and get you relaxed, all right? That's the best that I can do for you right now. I don't know what I can do beyond that point. I need to make sure these two assholes are situated. And then, well, I'll make sure your brother's situated also. We'll figure that out once we take care of our problem. You understand? She nods. Old man Magruder looks to the $200 bills in his hands. He feels like he is Judas Iscariot himself. It doesn't make any sense. That young man had mentioned the Council of Ten. And he knows all too well, hell, any man who ever had power in their lifetime would know of the Council of Ten and what they are. Of course, it's a very well-guarded secret. No normal man would ever know of what they are. But in the end, he had rubbed elbows in his youth with some very powerful men. That young man with the beard. He knew for a fact he was a werewolf. He had seen the way he had moved. And werewolves are beings of extreme power. When working alone or in packs, this much he knows. He's seen teams of these guys in his youth. During his time in the service, he knows what they can do. And that man, he could tell from his own experiences that he was an alpha. Why does he feel such guilt? An alpha should easily have been able to make short work of any Sasquatch or any other cryptid out there for the most part without a hitch. It makes no sense. But this feeling in his gut, this clairvoyance he has always had throughout his, his life, ever since he was a little boy, it is not wrong. He knows that something very wrong has occurred, and he feels guilt about it. Now, true, he would have been more than willing to pay to have that thing dealt with. He doesn't know if it had killed its own family or not. The fact is, despite the agreement he had made with that tribe of Sasquatch, it had gone mad, and it had killed a lot of people and cost him business. He had been straightforward with those two men and that woman. He should have been sending them to that monster's death, and not them to their own. It makes no sense to him. But he knows something dreadfully wrong has happened, and he feels shame and guilt. Well, old man Magruder was never a coward. And he also knows he's not just being watched, he's being stalked. He turns on the floodlights to the property. However... Whatever is out there, well, he knows who's out there, and what. However, it doesn't back away. He hears heavy breathing. He grabs up his rifle and steps outside. There's a very powerful thump that can be heard on the side of his property. His house. He clenches that rifle tight in his hands. He speaks softly. You know, I always had an agreement with you and yours, right? Always did. Now, my parents had agreements with you guys. I don't know what the hell killed your family, but it wasn't me. I know. You ain't gonna let me walk away. But I want you to know one thing, big fella. I ain't going down without a fight. You know, you didn't have to kill all them people. It wasn't gonna bring nobody back. The creature walks quite well within his eyesight now. He makes no effort to hide. His movements are graceful and savage, primal. The beast stands at least ten foot in height. Its features are all too human. Almost like that of a Neanderthal, but much, much hairier and larger. The creature's eyes are crimson. They glow with rage and hatred. All right, Lord. I'm coming home, the old man says aloud, as the creature's hands flash forth before he can fire a shot. He sees those huge hands reach for him, and he feels them grab him, and then he feels nothing at all. Rebecca wakes up quickly. Hey, it's okay. I'd let you know it's your turn to take watch in a couple hours, all right? 
you nod slowly. When are we going to move? About five more hours. Right now, we have a couple of MREs here. We can rest, eat up a little bit. Then we'll start moving at daybreak, okay? Right now, neither one of us are in the shape to do so. Once we take care of this thing, and believe me, he passed the 50 cal that's setting the side of it. I promise you. I have the right equipment. I'll take care of it. I'm praying we're able to. And then, I make sure that we get Alex, your brother, out of this place. What about them? I give a fuck less about them. Like I said, I don't think they're going to have too many people looking out this deep. Pretty sure they've been uh, declared missing, but I'm not too worried about that. We're going to take care of uh, this big bastard that killed your brother. And then, I'm going to get you home. The man grabs up that 50 caliber rifle with strong hands. He passes the side of it and looks for Rebecca. This bad boy right here has gotten me out of worse situation than this. I had to see what that would be, she says. I think most people would, he says, smirking lightly. She's actually relieved. She has praised that that's confidence and not some false bravado. However, it's at that moment that Michael grows still. He sees where Rebecca is looking. The woman's features reveal pure horror. He speaks softly. Whatever happens, stay put. If I don't come back, or if something goes down, that's when I want you to run. Do you understand me? The woman speaks gently, firmly. I'm not going to abandon you. This isn't the time for that. I want you to promise me. She simply nods. And with this, she steps outside. The darkness is pitch, of course, black at this moment in time. He sees nothing but shadows. However, the shadow is massive. And with this, he tries to take aim with that massive gun. But the form moves beyond what the eye can blink. Rebecca closes her eyes in horror as she hears the sound of a man screaming. <laughs> flesh literally being torn asunder as Michael feels his own body torn asunder, bones shattered, and his body is thrown against the wall of the shack through it with such force that it practically explodes in a shower of blood and gore. His very dead eyes stare up from the ground at Rebecca. She screams in horror pure terror, as well as no small amount of this shock, as the massive, dark-haired beasts blots out any sort of light from outside. He is so massive he fills in the door. She sees those red eyes, and then his massive hands reach for her, and then she sees nothing. Where Alex lay, there was no longer a man. The shift had happened within seconds. His bestial form is much more savage than it had been in the first chapter. Instead of a slightly lupine muscle, no. Now he has a massive, woven head upon massive shoulders. The werewolf stands. The bullet which had been lodged in his brain now pushes out through his forehead. It is extremely and excruciatingly painful, but the creature is so far gone it could care less. His hunger takes over, and with this he drops to all fours. He sniffs the dead corpse of the large man, who had died very badly, but he halts. Something within the beasts keeps it from feeding upon him. No. He wanders outside. He sees two bodies. 
actually three. One is so far decayed, there's not much use of trying to feed upon it. He sees two fresh bodies, fairly fresh. Rigor mortis has set in some, but they'll prove nourishing. He devours them to the bones. The protein, of course, rushing through his system, quickly snaps the man in control of the beasts. The pentagram flickers upon his right hand. His clawed hands flex as he stands upon hind legs, recognizing and remembering what had happened. Of course, that big man, that was his friend. One more in whom he had failed. Someone who had looked up to him as a mentor, and whom he had let die. The werewolf howls the night, his grief horrifically evident, his pain even more so. He bends down to all fours once more, whimpering lightly as he sniffs the corpse. <laughs> it's then that his savage mind quickly remembers someone else. A woman. Rebecca. She's not here. But he can also catch her scent. She's not dead either. His own memories of dealing with the Bigfoot. His time abroad. When he is in Afghanistan and Iraq. Those times that he had been in the military. Those memories in which he'd had from his own childhood and dealing with these creatures. True, it had been limited. Those memories come to the forefront. And he knows already too well what this creature has planned for that woman. He cannot allow that. He forces himself to remain in control. Despite the beast wanting to go completely amuck, he cannot allow that. He drops back to all fours. And he runs through the darkness, past the wood line, and God help anyone who tries to stop him. <laughs> she awakens with a splitting headache. She realizes most likely she has a concussion. She shudders and resists the urge to puke what she just recently consumed. The meager contents of her stomach beg to be released as she forces such things aside. Rebecca knows that she has to get herself together. The memories of her brother's death pierces her like a harpoon in the heart. But also, she remembers two good men that have sacrificed everything to help her. And that, also, she cannot cry. She's too far gone. She sees a fire burning. Where is she? She realizes she's in a cave, a very deep cave. Of course, the forest preserve itself is rife with such things, so she's not surprised. Of course, it makes perfect sense. Naturally, that's where this thing would have had to hide. Of course, she realizes she's alone, at least for now. She looks to her hands. In her arms. Nothing's broken. She's bruised. Obviously this thing had brought her here for purposes that she doesn't want to think about. She herself is no stranger to the old tales of uh, wood boogers kidnapping women and doing things. She really refuses to think about that, but it makes perfect sense. She walks outside of the massive cave. It takes time, but she's able to do so. She notices two mounds near the mouth of the cave. She recognizes them immediately as graves. She bites her lip. She closes her eyes. She doesn't know what she's going to do. But she can't stay here. It's at that moment that she notices something watching her. The creature snarls. He is massive. He literally blocks out the light to the entrance of the cave as he snarls low and very gently shoves her back to where she lands on the rear end and as he roars loudly quite literally causing her organs to shake from the vibration 
Look, I, she can't even speak. She's just so deep in shock. I'm sorry for what happened to your family, but I'm not the one responsible. The ones that did it, they're dead. Please, let me go. The creature snorts as if in amusement. His eyes are no longer flickering crimson. They're a deep, dark brown. But there seems to be almost an internal fire within them. The creature, very calmly, growls, motions for her to walk back into the cave. She shakes her head. You're going to have to kill me. The creature, very calmly, prepares to advance. She has no idea what he plans. She's not stepping one foot further back into that cave. She plans on fighting. She knows horrific things may happen. But she's done running. The massive werewolf barrels to the trees. The foliage is so thick along the ground that one his size should not be able to move through it. But in the end, when it comes to what he is, he's able to move through the trees as easily as on the ground. Easily as any dogman, if not quicker, as a matter of fact, due to the supernatural nature of his existence. Alex drops down to the ground once more when he realizes he's in the area. He raises upon his hind legs and snarls. His night vision quite easily picks up two signatures. He can tell by her scent she's very close, and she is terrified. He has failed too many people he cares for. He will not fail this one. He will die before that happens. Rebecca closes her eyes, thinking at that moment she can actually feel him approaching. She realizes she cannot fight. She's too afraid. She curses herself for her cowardice. But this thing's stench, as well as its power, is overwhelming. However, at that moment, she actually feels a cold draft. She opens her eyes, and she sees the massive creature. His back is facing her. He sees something. What? It's then that she sees the stuff of nightmares. A massive werewolf. Not quite as big as a Sasquatch, actually not even close. The beast stands a good six and a half foot. Massively muscled. Heavily built. Extremely stocky in strength and power. Its fur bristles as it snarls and actually roars in the creature's direction. The Sasquatch is truly surprised. He has met with dogmen before. The dog-headed ones are easily dispatched. They hardly ever even think of coming near ones such as him unless they're in packs. And he had long since driven out any stragglers in these woods. But no, this is something different. Something off. A Sasquatch, just like a dogman, has a better sense of smell than any pig. This creature, he smells something wrong. Very, very wrong with this thing. He looks slightly behind him to the woman. He senses a connection between this creature and the woman. It makes no sense. He has simply planned on claiming her as possibly something to enjoy and then casting her aside like he had with a few human women that he had gotten a hold of since his mate's death. Simple thing. He doesn't understand why this creature wants her. The fact is, this thing is in his territory, no matter how dangerous it is. This cannot stand. However, he has no chance. No chance in hell. Rebecca looks in horror as the werewolf lunges forth, slamming his massive talons into the Sasquatch's chest, raking deep, deep gouges where no other firearm will be capable truly of making a dent in all that heavy muscle and thick, thick hide. The creature's chest is slashed to ribbons. Blood flies everywhere as the Sasquatch roars and roars as he grabs the werewolf and throws him into the side of the cave. She can hear bones snap and a heavy whimper escape from the blackbird beast's maw as he very calmly and swiftly springs back to his feet, and he lunges, but this time his massive jaws open wide, and the Sasquatch quickly throws up his arms, but those massive jaws find purchase upon his right wrist, and the 
The sound of bone crunching and flesh rending cannot be denied. The creature roars in pain and sends out a vicious punch with his left fist, catching the werewolf full in the muzzle. Alex feels his bones break and his oh, still traumatized brain damn near turned to jelly in his skull from the force of the blow. He is knocked literally at the creature's feet. He snarls angrily and viciously raises up his fists and slams down, snapping the werewolf's back in two places. And with this, he snarls even lower, angrily, in rage and hatred at this creature that would dare intrude into his own lair and violate the sanctity of where he buried his son and his mate. This thing will pay dearly for that. Now with this, he very calmly situates himself, his massive form and greater weight, finding purchase as he sits upon the werewolf's back. He can feel the bones in the werewolf trying to knit back together. He can allow this. He grabs Alex's upper and lower jaw and prepares to pull apart a killing move in which his own father had taught him. The Bigfoot, that is, and how to kill dogmen. Whatever this thing is, most likely it can die in a similar way. The same way in which Alex had killed the Alpha in Chapter 1. However, that is not to happen as the creature feels a, a very sharp branch slam into its back. The creature growls angrily. It's a distraction for Alex to make his move. By now, he is fully regenerated, despite the injuries to his back. And with this, those jaws in which he and Bigfoot have been about to pry open. Now, let's leave it at this. That's not going to happen. Alex bites viciously with those massive jaws upon the Bigfoot's left hand. And with this, he bites down hard, swallowing the Bigfoot's hand all the way to the wrist. The sound of crunching bone and flesh and a hideous shriek cannot be denied. The blood flashes forth, raking deep, gouges and furrows into the Sasquatch's face. The werewolf in this attack rips out the Sasquatch's eyes. The pounds <clears throat> raking through sensitive flesh. And his face is damn near torn off of his skull due to the force of the attack. The Sasquatch gurgles and tries to get back to his feet, but there is no way in hell that's happening. The over 600 pounds of pure solid muscle and weight of werewolf finds purchase upon his back. Now this Alex bites down upon the creature's neck. The massive rogue male tries again and again to get the creature off of him, but Alex is too strong and too much blood has been lost. The creature gurgles and convulses as Alex bites down on the almost non-existent neck. He's able to find purchase as his right hand grabs the creature by the sagittal crest of his skull and he holds it still and he bites down with enough force to break the creature's neck. And with this he wrenches the massive body back and you can hear the popping of his spine. And the creature flails no more, and breathes no more. The werewolf lets go of his enemy, letting the corpse fall completely to the ground. The creature raises upon his hind legs. Rebecca, of course, grabs that branch in pure terror. The werewolf is completely in control of his thoughts. He had already fared well from those two policemen. So in the end, he has control. He can change back without too much difficulty. He has no desire to feed upon the Sasquatch whom he just killed. As a matter of fact, he has no joy in what he did at all. And when he fought the Alpha in Chapter 1, that had been different. That had been out of a desire for revenge and hatred. This has simply been something that had to be done. He could not allow someone else who depended on him to die. He understands the woman's fear. Now with this, he very calmly draws 
in the dirt with a massive taloned hand. One clawed finger. I will not harm you. She looks at him. What are you? He writes his name. Alex. Alex. What are you? What? The creature meets her gaze. And with this, he wipes away what he had drawn in the dirt with his claws and writes once more, Do you trust me? The moment he wrote, Do you trust me? That brings her back full circle when she first met him. He had asked her that. When she had asked for his help, she nods and then finally speaks. I trust you. The creature nods slowly. And with this, it stands fully and whimpers. She sees his form contort. It's a matter of just seconds, actually, when it happens. The fur recedes, that massive woven head fades. That horrific amber eye glow, of course, returns to a normal human tone. His slightly tanned skin is evident instead of horrific black fur. The short, stocky man stands before her. And with this, she simply says, Thank you. Alex nods silently. And with this, she finally finds the courage to speak. Why didn't you tell me? Would you believe me? She exhales lightly, shaking. And with this, she breaks down. Just... Not sobbing, but shuddering. She's still kind of past that point of crying at this point. Alex pulls her to him, embracing the taller woman tightly, in strong arms. She finally is actually able to break down. She then is to cry. She doesn't shed tears, it's just a dry sobbing. Alex himself does cry as well. For the things that he had been forced to see, and the things he had been forced to do. But at least this one time, he had been able to reach someone. And at least for this one time, they did not die. Alex takes roughly three days to fully heal. It had not just been his back that had been broken. That had healed almost instantaneously due to his regeneration. However, the deeper organ damage, while it had healed almost instantaneously, the bruising, as well as other types of trauma, due to the amount of the injuries, it had taken a little longer to completely pull him through. There had not been much food in the cave, hardly any, but there had been plenty of water. So needless to say, takes him roughly two more days. Rebecca is hardly in any shape to go anywhere. Of course, for her to go by herself, half naked, into those woods without any kind of defense would be suicide. She goes for a couple of days without food. But he's able to bring a few things in once he does recover. Being what he is, he's actually able to bring in some game. It's on the fifth night that Rebecca finally speaks. She had hardly said a word before. As she looks at the naked man before her, what now? Once I'm fully recovered, we should be within probably 12 hours. <clears throat> he coughs lightly. I'm able to shift without too much of a hitch now. Of course, I was able to bring us back some food too. Deer is not easy to catch, especially when I'm in this kind of shape. She nods gratefully. I try to make sure that Michael, he didn't have any family. I'm going to try to make sure that he's buried at least. It's at least I owe the kid. I'll make sure you and your brother get out of here also. What you do from that point on, I can't really tell you. But I'm sorry. The woman puts a hand to his Makes me you know, finger to his lips. She shakes her head. She looks to him. 
They had bonded quite a bit in this time in the cave. Not in a romantic way, but she does lean forward and she kisses him. Something to think on. The man nods slowly. He takes her hand and squeezes it. Within 24 hours, both of them are able to get out of that cave. He gets them back to civilization. Even though it takes quite a time doing so. <laughs> a week passes. And certainly, loose ends are cleaned up. Alex definitely is able to communicate with the right people. And thus, it leads up to the scenario right now. We find both him and Rebecca sitting in the same Waffle House during, from the, during the beginning of this story. They're both sitting in the same spot where Alex and Michael have been sitting. Thank you, she says. Alex grabs her hands gently and squeezes them. Hey, look, it's the least I can do. You've been through enough. So what are you going to do now? She asks. I want to make sure Michael gets buried by his wife and his brother. It's the least I can do for him. I know the right people to talk to. What about them? She asks. She means, of course, uh, the sheriff and his rotten deputy. When it comes to them, at least from what I've been hearing about in the paper, they look the mobs away, and the mob blinked right back. I knew they were dirty, but my God. He shrugs broad shoulders. Does it matter? They're dead. They're in hell where they belong. So what about you? Well, when you made sure that uh, Daryl got, you know, taken out of there, I was able to get him put uh, in the right funeral home. I don't know who the hell you talk to, but they're declaring it an accident. They're refusing to say what kind of accident, but it's just that. And I'm not exactly going to be pushing that any further. I know better. He chuckles lightly. Let's leave it at that. There won't be any questions asked. The only demand is that I don't come back here. People aren't exactly too happy of the fallout. Especially old man Magruder. He's pretty well respected throughout here. A lot of people are looking my way. They're not happy of him dying like he did. It wasn't your fault. How? It doesn't matter. That's just the way politics rolls, especially real local politics. What can I tell you? She nods slowly. And with this, she finally finds the courage to ask him. So what are you going to do now? I'm not sure, Alex says. This kind of made me rethink a few things being what I am, the things I've done. I've been hunting things, things I can't really tell you about. Things kind of like me, but not. I've been letting revenge eat me up too much. I want to do something different. Will you keep in touch? Of course. Just make sure your brother gets... The final rights or whatever it is you want done that he deserves. Yeah, we can keep in touch. I'd like that, she says. And with this, she leans forward and kisses his cheek. The man pats her shoulder. She walks, she basically stands, and with this she hands him a card. The card reads, Abernathy Investigative Services, based out of Los Angeles, California. So I guess that's your home away from home. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I plan on getting the hell out of here. The sooner the better. Once I make sure that... He's buried by Dad. I know that's what he would want. He nods slowly. Now with this, she winks at him and says, Pay me a visit sometime. Don't be a stranger. I promise you... You'll have a better experience than you did here, she says, chuckling. And with this, she waves at him and walks out the door. Alex enjoys the view all the way to her car. She gets in it and she drives away. He looks to the card. 
chuckle slightly. And with this, he says to himself, Well, Sarah, I hope you're proud of me. I'm trying. At least I didn't let someone else die. I wish I could have helped Michael a little better, though. He was a good kid. He didn't deserve what he got. I'm trying to make things right by him, too. He puts the card in his wallet and stands. He knows for a fact Mr. Blackfeather, his mentor, his comrade, the man he calls father, practically, will be more than willing to work with him. Alex is tired. He seeks a better path. All of this killing, he's done. At least for this moment. He walks out to his jeep, fires it up. He has no idea where he'll be going. He just prays that as the sun rises, so will his future. Earl Beatty is serving the pink wave of satisfaction all the way to Dallas. It's been roughly four months that he was able to escape that mess in that damn town. He misses his father, but in the end, he's kind of glad that whatever happened didn't happen to him. He'd like to thank that little bastard who uh, broke his jaw the way he did with a bullet in the face. But him being forced to lay low actually allowed the authorities to pass right over him. At least that's what he figures. He didn't know why the feds were asking him uh, as few questions as they did, but they simply ignored him and then let him go. Well, he's seen so many of his associates, of course, put in prison. He shrugs broad shoulders, even now, knocking back another round of scotch. The bartender says, hey, man, you know, uh, that woman over there, she's been really checking you out. Really? Yeah, why don't you go ahead and talk to her, the bartender says, smirking. Earl shrugs broad shoulders and figures, what the hell? The redhead is actually possibly the most beautiful woman he's seen in his life. She's stunning. Almost angelic in her appearance. Tall, too, damn near as tall as he is. He can live with that. With this, he taps her on the shoulder. A uh, friend of mine over there says you were checking me out. What's your name? Marie? Mirrored and Triculos lies to him. Ah, you have an Irish accent there. From Ireland or Scotland. She rolls her eyes and very calmly meets his gaze. I am from Dublin. She lies again. Okay, Marie, my name is Earl. I am the Earl of this fine establishment. I can tell that. She once more meets his gaze and grabs him. Allowing the skin-to-skin -skin contact, of course, to engage in its full control of his mind as she works her way into his thoughts. She speaks very softly. I'm going to give you the ride of your life. A time you will never forget. If you will follow me. She winks to the bartender who smirks and nods. This guy was an asshole, a pig from day one. He'll be glad to get rid of him. And yes, he knows what she is. She very gently leads the big man outside to an alleyway. And with this, Earl's mind begins to clear. This woman is too strong. She's pressing with too much force. Well, normally, he'd be begging for something like this. This is different. He's had more than one experience with a very attractive woman. He himself is not a bad-looking man. At least they'll get him in the door before they saw what a kind of tarantula he was deep inside. But when he sees her eyes turn black and her fangs drop, he cannot scream. She bites down, ripping out his throat, drinking deeply. And with this, he breathes his last, as he sucks away all of his life force. She wipes her lips as the troubled husk drops to her feet. She pulls out her phone. Miss Abernathy, I just wanted to let you know it's done. You always, pay, you always did very well by me. You were one of my best workers, she says softly. You do not need to worry. 
You will not be found. Keep up what you're doing. I guarantee you, I'll have work for you very soon. He said, she says, to the P.I. And what she has dealings with on the phone. She very calmly turns it off and looks for the corpse. She shakes her head in disgust. Men like this, she's dealt with all of her life. She grabs him by the scruff and drags the corpse away to a car in which she was very easily able to appropriate from another contact. She throws the corpse into the trunk and slams it shut. Sometimes what she does troubles her. In moments like this, not at all. And thus concludes Werewolf Hunter. Chapter 2. I look forward to releasing more content as time passes on. But for now, my friends, be blessed and be safe. Productions presents the Pericolici, a story of a man named Abel who was brought low through treachery. And due to this, his anger at the world made him act as an animal. And then it truly became one. Truly a cross between animal and man. And then, on the day in which he met a monster, even worse than himself, he was changed into a creature beyond both vampire and werewolf, a fiend of true terror and power, and yet this one moment in which he defied his maker, would he truly become the man in whom he had been before? I present to you a werewolf hunter side story, Pericolici, and also how the Council of Ten came to be. I hope you enjoy. The air is freezing cold. Most human beings would not be able to handle it. Hypothermia would have gotten them in a matter of moments. However, to one such as Charles Legrand Sanchez, also known as Blackfeather, it means very little. After all, this had been part of the trials, and which would allow him to ascend to that of a werewolf, and later to become part of the Council of Ten. Charles has always been an emissary for the Council. However, tonight, he has been called by the First, the founder of the Council. The timing could not have been more interesting, to say the least. He recently, not even a month ago, had attended the funeral procession of his own maker, the one in whom had infected him with lycanthropy when he was a young man. The man known as Alphonse had finally met his end. He had not died on the battlefield as he wished he could have. He had died in bed, ironically surrounded by loved ones and family. Charles, in the end, despite the fact the old warrior would have wanted to uh, die and go to Valhalla in his own way, Charles would have to say his maker had died a good noble death. And make no mistake, the halls of the afterlife would definitely be welcoming to the man. He pushes his thoughts away as he walks through the snow. 
He's in the Carpathian Mountains, a place that has been ravaged by war and death. To an elder alpha like Blackfeather, even though he is not native to this land, he cannot help but feel the spirits watching him, their presence. Up ahead in the distance, he sees a very large estate. The house, or closer to a mansion or a manor, is old. Charles narrows his eyes. Indeed, he has found the place in which he has sought. He has sought the home of the founder of the Council of Ten, a man who is as much werewolf as he is a human being. He opens the door. He finds to his surprise that the entire interior is very well lit, but not with anything of the modern age, no. There are different gas lanterns that flicker in the darkness, as well as no small amount of candles. He cannot see the object of who he seeks, the individual who is known as Abel, the oldest known werewolf, to truly live. But then, of course, in the end, he is not truly a pure werewolf. He is something else. Something that back in the old days would have been considered an abomination, and they would have sought his life. However, when this man had changed into the creature that he is now, a being beyond vampire and werewolf, well, let's leave it at this, his ingenuity as well as his survival skills had saved both species. Finally, Charles is able to get a bead on the man. He walks down the stairs. Very calm, very relaxed. He is a slight man. Slightly shorter than that of Charles' thin, strong form. Yet the man is slightly more heavily built. Despite being so compact an individual. He is pale, insanely so. His skin seeming almost luminescent in the candlelight. Charles, however, is not alarmed. In fact, he is somewhat glad to see the man. It's been some time, Abel. <laughs> Indeed it has, my friend. Indeed it has. Welcome. Is there anything that you would like? Not really. I was able to bring a few supplies with me through these damn mountains you live in. And I was able to hunt not even a few hours ago. What did you bring down, if I may ask? Just a couple of deer. Nothing special. Bad enough. So you have at least been able to eat your fill. This is a good thing. So, tell me, why have you come? Charles was quiet for a few moments. He knows that to say the wrong thing would offend the man. However, it would not put him in danger. He's not worried of that, despite the immense power that the man known as Abel Solinsky does possess. They are old friends, comrades, as a matter of fact. Charles has come simply on a personal affair. He decides to voice his statements very carefully and respectfully. So he directs the statement back to Abel. Well, last time I checked, it was you that uh, contacted me. This is true. For a couple of reasons. And what would that be? Well, first off, pick a seat. You standing there looking like some intruder in the middle of the night makes no sense. Take off your coat. Make yourself comfortable. Of course. I'm sorry. I've just been dealing with a lot. I'm aware. I'm aware. The man takes his coat off and sets the parka aside on a hook. He makes himself comfortable by the fireplace. The compact man known as Abel sits across from him, steepling his fingers as he sets his elbows on the arms of his chair. He looks through his steepled fingers and speaks. Yes, I have wanted to talk with you, mainly to see how you were. You have always been a good friend of mine. And of course, the council has voiced a few concerns to me, but in the end, I grow tired of their petty squabbling. You, know, you are the one that founded them. Indeed, but I also made it to where they should be able to survive on their own, without my constant supervision. I grow tired of being a father here. 
I think you understand this. Indeed I do. Well, when you had decided to call out to the council for the usual annual welfare check, if you want to call it that, <laughs> I decided to be the, the one to come see you. It's been a while and I've missed you, for one. But also, I was curious about a few things, and I honestly need your advice. I shall try to strive as best I can to give you the insight in which you seek, young Sanchez, but I cannot promise that it will be satisfactory. He was the only one who ever called Blackfeather by his last name now. It was a very close form of endearment between the two. Fair enough. The fact is, Abel, I'm kind of curious. One, how you really became the founder of the, our group, and how you've been able to... The squabbling, the petty fighting, it gets old. I have heard. Romanchek especially, he has grown ambitious. And there has been talk of possibly having to remove him. Unfortunately, when it came to removal from the council, there was only one way, if you were part of the Council of Ten. And that was either through, of course, expiring of old age, or being slain. We will immediately guess how that removal was going to take place. Most likely, the other nine members, including, of course, Blackfeather, would set upon the man and tear him to shreds. However, possibly there might be another way. And Abel understood this, and this is why Blackfeather had come to ask for his insight. What exactly is the problem? Well, for one, he's been uh, cavorting with an old friend of mine. The problem is, he's also possibly been dealing in things that are very unsavory. What sort of things? We're not sure. Who is the other one, and whom has been associating with Romanchek? His name is Garrett. Garrett's an old friend of mine. Unfortunately, well, his pack resides in Alaska. All of them are good people. All of them. He, at first, I thought was a good man as well. Unfortunately, these last few years have made me question that. About 15 years ago, he was removed as uh, Alpha because of a few bad choices he made, which got a few of us killed. As that in itself proves he is a foolish one. Why is he allowed to live? Well, unfortunately, it's not exactly so cut and dry. You can't exactly just go around just killing someone because they make a few errors. It's not so simple like it was in your day. <laughs> My boy, it was never simple. That is the first thing you must understand. The man said, his amber eyes glinting in the darkness. But I shall tell you. The best way in which I shall be able to. What sort of things has this get it dealt with? What are the things that are so illicit in which he is talking with Roman Chekova? Well, for one, we believe that he is, for one, making very illicit deals with the vampires. Which vampires are you speaking of? Not the ones in which we have alliances with. Damn it. You speak of Malachi, do you not? The one and only, he says grimly. That in itself is very bad. And of course, if it is found to be true, then he must be dealt with immediately. He then very calmly unsteeples his hands and sets them on the arms of his chair, tapping a long nail finger against the fabric as if deep in thought. What are the Urza? Things in which you believe he is guilty of. Let me hear these things, and then I shall tell you my response. Well, it's bad enough he's been possibly dealing with affairs involving Malachi. You know as well as I do a lot of the things in which that bastard deals in are, of course, human trafficking, drugs, and only the great spirit himself knows. However, there's one thing in which I'm not sure, but I do have my suspicions, and this is, of course, just a hunch. Out with it, then. I believe he's smuggling cryptids. Abel's eyes glow red for a moment. 
and that in itself sends chills down Charles's back. Normally I would say, destroy him immediately, but you are aware such accusations, if proven unfounded, could possibly involve yourself being removed from the council, and this I would rather not see. I'm aware of that. So how do you think I should handle this? Abel stands and looks to his friend. Abel's features are hawkish. The man himself appears nothing truly spectacular. He simply appears as a man who has seen too much and suffered an eternity. I will have to tell you many things. Are you prepared to listen to me? Of course. First off, I sense that when you came in the door, you had questions for me, and it was beyond the normal seeking advice in which so many of our kind have come, seeking from me. You seek to, you seek to know truly how I would handle this situation. You desire to know truly what I know. I shall tell you. But first, you must be prepared for this story. It will be very in-depth, and I will need your full attention. Of course, I'm glad to hear this. Once Abel is sure that he has Charles Blackbrother's undivided attention, he begins his story. We now begin the story. The man known as Abel Solinsky had been born in a very small village in the Carpathian Mountains. He had studied to become a man of order and law, pretty much an enforcer in the village. The baron in which ruled this area, for the most part, was a just and decent man. However, as Abel grew into adulthood, he definitely achieved his dream. He wound up being a personal enforcer for this baron. And things worked fairly well. He himself was able to actually marry and have children. And overall, the affair in itself was quite a pleasant experience for him. He was able to handle the affairs of the people justly, and he definitely had to, at times, be ruthless and put people to the sword. However, despite this, he always prayed to the Lord, may I be just and may I be compassionate in the things that I do. Unfortunately, I cannot tell you whether the Lord heard his prayer or refused to do so, yet in the end, this was not to be. When the Baron died, his son, a very rotten, vicious, entitled bastard of a man, decided that he needed his own sycophants, in whom he could trust implicitly to take the place of those who were in his father's court, including the soldiers and the generals. Abel's family was put to the sword, his own wife accused of witchcraft and burn at the stake. His daughter, as well as his son, were cut down under mysterious circumstances, and Abel himself became a man on the run. He swore to avenge himself upon those who had slain his family and those he held so dear, and dishonored his own name through the lies in which it had sullied his reputation. In the end, he gave in to the monster within, a man filled with rage and hatred. He joined a band of cutthroats and vicious, vicious bandits, raiders. These individuals would raid, rape, pillage, murder. The townsfolk, every chance they got, these were not a merry band of thieves. These were vicious murderers, monsters, which wore the skins of men. One of these men, the man who led the band, seemed to have a gift. 
he seemed to be able to take the most damage in combat, as well as always elude those in which sought this band of cutthroats in which Abel had joined. His senses seemed uncanny, his strength, his ability to heal from any injury. It was inhuman. So one day, Abel approached this man, whom to this day his name has been forgotten to the sands of time. The man, the leader, looked to Abel and told him that he had been granted a gift by the gods when he was young. And in this, he was able to change from man into beast, and that he had always had these senses ever since. He had killed his own maker, and himself was hunted by the pack of the one in which it infected him. But it always, due to his viciousness and cunning, stayed one step ahead. Due to his own bestial nature as a man and his cruelty, he had surprisingly been able to manage control of the beasts without the mark on the palm. It had simply been done through willpower. However, he had been taught many of the old rites, as well as the ways of the wolf, before he had slain the Alpha in which had brought him across. The leader told Abel, I see promise in you. I'll tell you what. I will give you what I have, but you must swear undying fealty to me. Abel, of course, did not deny this. In fact, he embraced his new fate. And sure enough, he drank the blood offered to him of the leader, which, of course, was a faster infection than just the bite. Within a matter of weeks, he himself was a werewolf. These two men led the raiders through an orgy of bloodshed and more death. Unfortunately for them, the Inquisition during this period of time had begun. This had been the result of the third first vampire, Malachi's cruelty to human beings, as well as his desire to spread his rule over so many. Mankind, especially those in the church, had rebelled, and unfortunately, those in which were vampires were being discovered, and they themselves being put to the sword as well as the stake. Many of the werewolves in which Malachi had had dealings with were also discovered, and thus the true purge began, the stuff of nightmares, and it was during this period of time that two species Originally enemies were now joined together in persecution. The hangings, the burnings of so many people, most, of course, who were not undead or of the lycanthrope strain. In the end, it didn't matter. So many died. So many were killed by the Inquisition's wrath, as well as their insane hypocrisy. Two-thirds of both species, werewolf and vampire, were destroyed. Had it not been for Brius's, the first vampire's, intervention, his children Mirrodin, as well as that of Nikolai, would have suffered the same fate as many of their own children. Malachi had to be stopped, and Brius himself, in a very vicious battle, in a location, in a river, which only the vampire elders know of, had slammed a stake through his son's heart. He had not been able to bring himself to kill the youngest pureblood. Yet in the end, Malachi's reign of terror, at least for this moment, had stopped. Many of his own children fled, as well as those and who had been caught in the maelstrom of the Inquisition's persecution. The few werewolf elders in which survived knew that they could not do things the way they had before. Many things were outlawed, including the infection of any child below 13 years of age. This was simply the law. They could not afford to have any such abnormalities in their ranks which could bring them attention. So thus, the Council of Ten was created. The ten strongest packs in which it survived, each one had an elder. These elders, whether 
whether they be male or female, the strongest in their packs, were appointed. And in the end, for their own survival, these ten individuals' word was law that would never be questioned again, because in the end, if they did so, they could risk their species' extinction, and this could not be allowed. The vampires, in which it survived the persecution of the Inquisition, also made strong alliances with the vampires, the first pure-blood vampires, Mirrodin, of course, and Nikolai, and their children. The children of Malachi, of course, definitely still maintained their ability, and make no mistake, their deeds of pure evil will be written in legend all the way to the present time. During this period of time, Abel himself had lost the support of the leader when it came to this band of raiders. Abel himself had grown a truly cold and evil heart. He had made deals with Malachi, as well as those who served him, and what he would do is betray his leader's trust. And in this, he shoved a silver blade into the back of the one in whom had infected him and taught him everything he knew. In doing this, he would leave his leader's corpse for the crows to devour and the wolves, ironic, isn't it, to consume. In this, he made his mark as a very cruel and evil man, a man who was definitely not anywhere near the kind and justifiable soul of his human life. It was during this period of time that he procured a shipment of children, orphans, urchins, different individuals of children, and who would not be missed. These children were packed up in crates and cages, and the raiders under Abel's command would give these children to different factions of vampires who operated under Malachi's hunger. The men in whom were under Abel at this point in time were so disgusted that they had to do something. This was one thing they could not abide by. There were rapists and murderers, but this was beyond even what they could fathom. So they were able to betray their leader, Abel, and they set a trap for him. In this trap, they cornered him and trapped him in a pit, a very heavy, deep pit in which he could not escape. The bars were impenetrable, even for his bestial strength. And in this, they lit the pit alight, setting him on fire and leaving him for dead. The fire should have finished him, as it would have with almost any living creature, werewolf or otherwise. Yet for some reason, his spirit fought on, he refused to give in and let these bastards who betrayed him get away with what they had done. Just like the Baron's son, just like those bastards who had killed his wife and his children, he would get his revenge. This he swore. Late that night, near his time of death, he looked out of the bars of the pit in which he had been trapped in and lit a light. His vision was fading, but he could see a man, a massive individual, of broad shoulder and very savage appearance. This was the third son of Brius Triculos, Malachi. The vampire had simply asked him one question, do you desire to live? Abel, of course, it said, of course, I have no desire to die like this. Are you mad? Of course, I will do whatever it takes. I want to get back at those bastards who did this to me. And he himself could not deny the evil he had done, but at this moment in time, his own anger and desire for revenge clouded his thinking. And Malachi had given him what he sought. With effortless movement, he was able, just with one hand, to reach into the bars of the pit which trapped Abel. With a very casual gesture, he ripped the bindings off from the pit and yanked Abel up by the throat. And with this, he looked the dying werewolf in the eyes and told him, 
you will only serve me. This shall be my command to you. Your own desires no longer matter. But Abel looked the man defiantly in the eye and said, But you promised. <laughs> you were a fool, boy. For indeed I shall keep my promise to you. You will get your chance for revenge. But first you must prove to me, Are you worthy of getting that revenge? You shall serve me, and only me. And then, perhaps, I shall give you the privilege of setting straight the wrongs in which have happened to you in this life. I must admit, the children in which you delivered to me were quite tasty. I wonder how you shall taste. You need not worry of the lycanthropy. My power shall wipe that from you and make you whole and one of mine, he said. And with this, he bit down those elongated fangs ripping out the throat of Abel's neck as he drank deeply and slowly, relishing the agony and pain of Abel's final moment as a living man. And with this, he, he with a very long clawed hand, sliced his wrist and forced Abel to drink deeply. The change rapidly occurring as his body began to eliminate the wastes of his mortal life. However, there was something that happened in which even Malachi could not really fathom or understand. Abel was able to wrench free of the vampire's grasp as an unholy hunger and rage filled his body. And with this, his body began to contort like it always had in the past when he willed a change. His appearance morphed within a matter of seconds to that of a huge bipedal wolf, a massive beast, yet there were subtle differences. His ears were no longer lupine, they were closer to that of a bat. A knob of flesh, which was very similar to that of a vampire bat, adorned his muzzle. As he then rubbed in Malachi's face, the two battled and fought viciously. If the vampire Malachi and his arrogance, who he thought would be able to actually purge lycanthropy from a man and make him a very powerful and willing slave, met defeat that night. He was driven away, having narrowly avoided the final death. And thus, the first and only hybrid being of vampire and werewolf was born. The Pricolici. Many a vampire, and even a werewolf at times, would try this experiment and fail, because only the power of a pure-blood vampire, one of the first three under Brius, would be able to pull this off when it came to a werewolf. Handling his new desire and need for blood proved even more of a challenge than all the things he had learned when it came to the ways of the wolf, under the leader's teachings. Yet Abel was a man of very strong mentality, as well as will. In this, as well as many, many very near uh, fatal mistakes, he was able to actually master both the vampire, as well as that of the lycanthrope, within him. He began to learn quickly. Silver would affect him. It could actually kill him more so than any other thing. The reason for this, even to this day, he does not know. However, despite this, he found that he could actually handle the sunlight, unlike other vampires. This in itself would prove quite useful to the man. And as the Inquisition and the Purge continued, wiping out the ranks of both werewolf and vampire, Abel bided his time, and by this time he had learned to control his powers both vampiric as well as that of the wolf, which he had always known before. So therefore, in this, while originally he had had to hide away from both species and their desire to end his life, or unlife in this case, he had used his wisdom as well as the fact of his guilty conscience. His battle with Malachi had truly opened up his eyes. While he had gone feral during that period of time, it actually brought a very rare point 
in his fairly long life by now, and that was humanity. He felt true guilt of the evil in which he had done, the rapes, the murders, giving children to blood-sucking fiends as currency. He swore that he would do better, and this is what he was able to do, truly. As I said, he bided his time, and he was able to gather many together, most importantly, the surviving werewolf packs and tribes. He told them, I understand that I am not as you are, but if you dare challenge me, I will destroy every last one of you. And the fact is, as powerful as he was, it's possible that he could have. So through the power of might makes right, he was able to gather them to him. And in this, his meeting with the Alphas over of these few remaining tribes actually worked out. They were all able to actually work together under his command. And in this, they established the first Council of Ten, a cabal of leaders and which would never be questioned by those of the werewolf species. Their word was law, and different tenets were put out. And in these laws were assured the survival of the werewolf. Strong alliances were made with Myrden and Nikolai Triculus through Abel's help in bringing Malachi down. In this, certain oaths of fealty were sworn. And because of the power in which Abel had, they did not gather together to destroy him. As a matter of fact, they admired his courage, and despite being both werewolf and vampire, they did not consider him an abomination like they would have in the past. Such times were over with. It was now more important that both species survived. And this is how the Council came to be. With Abel always being in the shadows, always giving advice, and at times commands to those in which he had helped save so long ago. Abel grows silent once the story is told. His hawkish features show little emotion, yet his eyes seem to pierce the soul when he looks through that of Blackfeather. It is obvious he is curious of the younger man's reaction. The old Alpha sighs lightly and responds. It gives me a little bit of insight, I have to give it that. But of course, that was the intention. Now, do you understand what you must do? If you find out that he is doing such horrible things. Charles sighs lightly. Of course, you'll have to be destroyed, but it's not that easy. You have to understand something. Garrett, he helped me to learn. Not in the ways of the wolf, but he was a friend. You understand? He gave me advice, just like I'm seeking from you right now. He was a good man. At least I thought he was. You have to understand one thing. The only thing that changed me from the monster in which I was was I saw my own humanity. And then I saw what I could have become. The one that was Malachi is a true demon. None have ever been able to truly withstand him. But I was able to. Of course, before his father did what had to be done. Yet at that moment, I made a promise to myself, as well as those in which I interact with. And what's that? Is that I would try, despite the fact that I am this creature, the one in which you call a precolici. I swore that I would be a better man, the man that I was when I was a human, before I became what you see before you. And in this, I tried my best to instill the laws on which your council has embraced. Sometimes, especially when it comes to trafficking of things in which are best left alone, you must understand, cryptids, despite the fact so many of them we have had to deal with, especially the xenocephali, he means the dogmen, of course, not all of them 
are as our enemies. You may soon discover this. You dealt with more dog men than I would probably want to know about. <laughs> indeed, my friend, indeed. But moving on from that, the fact is, if he is smuggling and imprisoning living creatures, he must be destroyed. But how do you plan on finding out this information? This man, get it. If he is making deals with the vampires who were made by Malachi, as well as possibly corrupting one of your members, how can he prove this? This man surely is not a fool. At least, not when it comes to being found. Charles nods agreement. That's the truth. However, there are certain things I can't exploit. I don't like having to do it, but... Well, if Alphonse taught me anything, it was how to do that, he says somewhat bitterly. I heard that he passed recently. Yeah, about a month ago. I'm sorry. He was a wily old bastard, but he was a good man regardless. He will be greatly missed. <laughs> Indeed. So, how do you plan on getting this get it to open up to you? You say you will have to exploit. Tell me, please. Come, come, share. I will tell you. Roughly, I would say, close to 40 or so years ago, give or take maybe a few years, I came across a boy. He had been infected at a very young age. A damn rogue had infected him, and of course, well, the boy was lucky enough to have killed him. Unfortunately, the damage was done. When he was 13, of course, on the full moon, he was in an orphanage, and he killed all of his friends as well as the caretaker of the home. But I was able to take him under my wing. I had to, unfortunately, kill one of my own, but they wanted to be a narrow-minded bastard, so I didn't have a choice. His name's Alex. He's a good guy. Good kid. He's actually possibly one of the strongest, and maybe the strongest, in which I've come across. Next to you, of course. That in itself is a rarity. Very few have ever survived being bitten at such a young age. How young was he, do you think? Well, from what he's told me, I believe he was seven, eight, maybe even younger than that. He don't really talk about it. He's never really shared that much detail with me, but he's been trustworthy from the beginning. I plan on exploiting Garrus one flaw. And what would that be? The old man's bitter, and he's lonely. You understand? He seeks companionship. I'm thinking about having Alex, who's his name. He's been an enforcer, as well as a hunter of dogmen for the council for quite a few years now. He's semi-retired, but I'm thinking maybe, just maybe, this could get him out of his head, and uh, actually maybe doing the council a favor one last time. I would advise you to be careful with this. If your protege is as strong as you say, then I have no doubt he can handle himself in this situation. How is his intent? I you mean his heart? About as <laughs> he's about as good as they come, at least when it comes to one of us. That is a good thing, so he can be trusted. I'm impressed. However, does this get it from what you have described, especially if he is an alpha in ability and former alpha in rank? And he is as old as you say. He will be very crafty, very manipulative in his own way. You must make sure that your protege does not fall for this. I know. It's going to take time. But I appreciate the feedback you've given me. It's kind of given me a little bit more of a focus of what needs to be done. Indeed, if he is doing this to innocent beings, this get it must be destroyed. And the same with this Roman check. If this is true, they both must die. There is no other statement which I can make. They must be dealt with. This is business that must be taken care of. I need to know one thing. However, young Sanchez, I'm hardly young anymore, old man. <laughs> Should have enough, responds the centuries-old hybrid and which appears to be a man no older than his mid-thirties. Yes, I promise you. 
I can take care of this. I know for a fact uh, Alex will be able to as well. I'm glad to hear this. Now, is there anything else that you need? Well, I need to rest, and by tomorrow I should be able to leave freely. Very well. It is good to see you, old friend. The two talk over small talk, and for the most part, anything in depth is over with. However, this conversation has filled Blackfeather with a very strong determination, as well as a respect that even the oldest of monsters can find their humanity once more. It fills an old man with hope, as well as a stronger intent. Thus ends this chapter. I hope you enjoyed this side story of the Precolici. This, of course, as you may have figured out by now, is linked to another universe in which I've created. That, of course, of Unforgiven. If you get a chance, listen to those stories as well. There are several chapters, and the final one is not quite done yet. I know it's not as popular as Werewolf Hunter. But like I said, give it a chance. And it will hopefully help you uh, to understand the lore behind my mythos a little bit better. Also, in case you haven't noticed, this is setting up for Alex's next uh, encounter when it comes to the affairs before him in Chapter 3. And truly, it's going to take time, but I'm getting there. I hope you guys enjoyed this story of a man who found redemption for ironically becoming something truly unique, as well as both more and less than what he ever had been before. You guys be blessed, and you be safe. That is Cray Productions presents Werewolf Hunter, Forbidden Cargo. Sit sail with me, dear listener, on a sea voyage of terror. Alex, a few years after the events of Werewolf Hunter, Tragedy of Oak Run, and directly after Abel the Founder, is called in to help the Council of Ten one last time. He will witness things that shake him to the core in the depths of depravity. You will also witness a werewolf of unparalleled cruelty and power, in which even Alex might not be able to defeat. In an old rundown tavern in Anchorage, Alaska, two men sit, nursing their drinks. One man is a large fellow, powerfully built. His name is Joshua Falcone. This man has done many things. All of them, for the most part, very bad. He's a master criminal and has no shame in this fact. These qualities have endeared him to another man who sits across from him at the bar. The old man is obviously deep in thought. He's troubled, but also somewhat hopeful. I'm telling you right now, Garrett, this is a bad idea. Joshua says. The thin, almost frail-looking man meets the other man's gaze, his cobalt blue eyes seeming to pierce the other's soul. I haven't been able to talk to one of my own kind in years. You are aware this is an excuse for the council to poke their nose where it doesn't fucking belong. Possibly. But from what I'm hearing, he's as as disgusted with them as I am. They took everything from me, boy. You know that. I get that, old man. But this is not... I think you're letting your emotions cloud your judgment. Possibly. This young Either man way. is on the level. And I th- actually believe he is. It'd be very valuable. Especially... If there's two of us of the same race, species, working together, trust me, (laughs) the council won't know shit. Speaking of the council, you know, Rumenshek, he's been taking chances with us. He's asking more. I'm thinking maybe we can actually provide. Well, doing what we do. You know, that one uh, juvenile Sasquatch, he proved very lucrative. Yeah, we're able to get him to the right buyers. We're lucky that Rubenshek knows these people, or else we we wouldn't be able to do a damn thing. 
Well, the council, the other council members found out about it. Number one, he would be torn to shreds and I'd be next, as well as anyone connected to me. He's not that stupid. He has no desire to commit suicide. And of course, he knows that if he tries to flip the dime on me, well, I'll sing like a bird. He's not stupid. That's one thing we don't need to worry about. Now, as for our cargo currently, I have to admit, she's a fine one. Yes, yeah, she is, he said, wiggling his brows. <laughs> you need to kind of uh, keep your urges at bay for right now. Like I said, I think this man's on the level with us. I'll be able to know quick enough. What kind of rank do you think he is? You mean in abilities? I'm not sure. I don't really know much about this Alex. I know he was mentored by Blackfeather, who used to be a good friend of mine. It's very possible this could be a trap, but if it is, well, I don't care what kind of abilities he has, alpha or not, how many people can take me? And I have the advantage of this being my home base. All I have to do is kill him, dump him overboard, and that's it. No harm, no foul, and, well, the fact is, the council, they'll have to uh, deny any responsibility, because they're not stupid either. I think Roman checks us a wee bit too ambitious, if you get my meaning. Yeah, I understand your concerns there, too. But like I said, as long as he keeps things on the down low, we should be fine. And like I told you before, if he says anything or tries to make a move against me, all I have to do is throw myself at the mercy of the council. That'd probably still kill you. It's a possibility, but I have my doubts on that. They're stuck in old ways, stupid, honorable ways. They're easy enough to trick. The only one I'd be concerned about is the damn founder. You mean that... Whatever he is? He said he's like you, but not. He's half vampire as well. I personally think that abomination should have been destroyed a long time ago. But in the end, he was the one that founded the council and gave me opportunities earlier, and even now down the line. It's a system that's easy to manipulate, but I have to be careful. We have to be careful. What about the brothers? Are they... Well, old Red's keeping them out of that damn vault. That's one thing which I can definitely say he's useful on. <laughs> you were very, uh, very uh, skilled, I have to admit, in capturing him. Never thought a dog man, of all things, would actually prove to be as useful as he is. Well, you whipped him real good into shape, I'll give you that. Garrett nods. He was a handful. He damn near got me, too. Not too many dogmen could take one of my kind. As a matter of fact, it's almost impossible. This Alex, actually, I've heard, he actually took out an entire pack of them, which is pretty impressive. I mean, even a beta or a gamma could easily take an alpha dogman and tear it apart, potentially, but take an entire pack of them like he did? That in itself. I don't get it, though. You say that he was one of their hunters. He's part of the Brotherhood, that's right. Well, ain't, isn't the Brotherhood like the elites? They're the elite soldiers <coughs> that do the council's bidding, yeah. Well, if this guy was one of the brothers, you know, part of the Brotherhood, well, you know, they're a pretty loyal bunch. Why, again, the council's fickle. They'll throw you out without even thinking twice about it if it suits their interests. They're always cowardly, covering their own asses. Hell, Rumenshek is a perfect example of that. Despite the fact he's a very lucrative client. I'm a little concerned about that. He's been putting more demand than I think we can handle. Now the Sasquatch, that juvenile, we're able to get to the highest bidder. Definitely didn't hurt our pockets. I know, I know, I know. I'm just saying. I think we have to be careful with this. All right, now, this cargo we have is in that vault in the hold of my ship. Shouldn't be much of an issue. And as the brothers, like I said, this supposedly is their last run. At least that's what Jonathan told me. 
how do you want to handle them when it's all fixed and done? Let them go. I'm a man of my word, despite what many people might think, he says, looking pointedly to Joshua. I get it. I get it. I'll let it be. Good. Now, moving on from that. The way I see it, they know to keep their mouths shut. They're not stupid. And we pay them well. Let's them get another crew. Besides, if the middle boy knows anything like he uh, knew the contacts we did in prison, which led him to me, I don't think we'll have a problem. Besides, he did say that he would help me get more people once they left. You can't really blame them. I mean, you see only so much and you don't handle so much when it comes to humans. They simply had their fill. I can respect that. They were good, you know, they're loyal for the most part. They don't know exactly what we have this time, and I can't take chances with that. And I won't. So, you know, providing they don't discover who we have, or what we have, shouldn't be a problem. So what are we going to do if this uh, little recruit of yours becomes a too nosy? I told you, I'll deal with him. But as powerful as they come, whether he's an alpha or not, I don't care. That's when we tear him apart. And as I told you, the council will deny all plausibility. They won't have a choice. What about Abel? Founder? It's an abomination, like I said. It needs to be a but he's too uh, busy being in that ivory tower in the Carpathian Mountains to be a concern to me. I care less about all that foolishness. So this is what's going to happen. In the next couple of hours, this young man is going to make himself known right here in this bar. You are not going to be a problem. Do you understand? I stu Do you understand? Yes, sir. Good. Now, I have things to do. I have a couple of more drinks here to enjoy. You go on, do your thing, whatever. But make sure everyone is in line. Do we understand one another? Or I'll make sure the brothers behave as well. Good. I'll go. The man nods and leaves to take care of the affair in which he was ordered to do. Garrett is very calm and patient. And with this, he looks to his cell phone. He feels it vibrate and then ring. This must be the individual, he thinks to himself out loud. And with this, the waitress comes. Or, you know, the bartender, she comes and offers him a drink. He takes it. Thanks, sweetie. I'm going to go ahead and take this call real quick. And with this, he answers the phone. I take it that this is, uh, Mr. Haggerty? Matter of fact, it is, young man. I take it you're Alex McIntyre? That's right. Good to know. I'm not going to say anything over the phone. I want to see you face to face. We'll figure out what to, where, what to do and where to go from there. I am going to warn you one, on one thing. You know what I am, and I know what you are. We're probably two, uh, flip sides of the same coin. That's why I'm giving you this chance. I need not say any more. I'm not exactly in the mood to uh, go around issuing veiled threats, but I'm going to give you this one-time warning. It's not a problem. It's not going to be an issue. Good to know. I'll see you here in an hour. He hangs up. Sure enough, he sees the individual at the door. Garrett himself is a tall, slim man, close to six foot one. He only weighs maybe 165 pounds, soaking wet, at least in his human form. This man, however, is short, stocky, muscular. He has a thick beard, adorning rugged features. Garrett narrows his eyes. The man's scent can't be denied. This is indeed a fellow werewolf. Alex calmly walks up to the man. I take it you're uh, Mr. Haggerty, correct? Indeed, Mr. McIntyre. Pleasure to meet you. Two, shake hands. I figured this place right here would be a good place as any for us to meet and to talk. 
There's nothing against you, young man. I'm just not one to be trusting too easily. Can't afford to be. As I said, I've already given my warning, so there's no need for us to go any further down that rabbit hole. But I do want to know your story. I need to understand who I'm working with and what I'm dealing with. All right. What exactly is it you want to know? I want to know why you're so interested and keen to work with me. How do I know that you're not someone sent by the council? That's what I want to know. I have to tell you why. They fucked me over just like they did to you. Intriguing. Enlighten me. What made you do what you do? I know a little bit about you. You were, for a time, part of the Brotherhood. As powerful as it gets, as well as dedicated. Many of those in the Brotherhood hunt down cryptids to keep their numbers low, especially dogmen. I heard that's what you did. You also have quite a high count. You've killed well over three dozen of them. They were difficult to deal with, but I had to. I saw two friends of mine torn to shreds. They were actually all I had left in this world that I considered family. My wife, as you know, died of cancer. I'm aware. So, well, the two of them. Their names were Arnold and Rachel. As I said, they were good to me. Do they know what you were? Alex uh, shakes his head. No, not truly. I think Arnie may have had his suspicions, but I kept him in the dark for the most part. I desired to protect him. Especially from those who uh, aren't exactly friends of our kind. Commendable. But I take it these dogmen tore them to shreds? Yeah. They prepared a trap for him, actually. We were all supposed to meet at <clears throat> my friend's cabin. It was owned by his uncle at the time. They had a son, too. The kid was the only survivor. He's actually turned himself around, but him getting there was a very rough road. So, you did this for revenge then? At first, yeah. But then, I kind of got tired of doing it. And when I told the council about it, that I was tired of hunting these things and I wanted something else... They told me that I needed to keep my mouth shut and keep doing what I was supposed to do. I was paid well to do it. I said, I'm tired. They told me point blank <clears throat> that if I didn't, they would hurt the boy. Because he is somewhat under their protection, or he was. Black brother himself told me, if I change course in my path, then that protection will be removed and something might even happen. <laughs> Typical. He was always a coward like that, trying to go after innocent people. Disgusting. Alex smirks lightly. He, of course, knows all too well about Garrett, as well as the things in which he does. The fact is, Alex has had to be a very good actor much of his life. Partly due to what he had become, at such a young age, against his will, but also simply to survive. So Alex knows for a fact, while this man is wily, and very dangerous, he has to be careful. Because one wrong move could get him killed. He has too much to ride on this. He promised to do this as a favor to Charles. Because in the end, that old man, he owed everything to. While Rebecca had not been too keen on him doing this, in the end, she had actually sat down and talked with him, saying, I think you need to do this. And Alex has finally said, you know what, I'll do one more favor for you guys, and that is being the council. And therefore, you know, once Charles had filled him in on what Abel needed to be done, especially when it came to one corrupt member of the council possibly, possibly being involved in this man smuggling cryptids, Alex knows for a fact this man is a hypocrite. He wants to rip this man's throat out right now, but that's not how the protocols work. So he fiends very well and exhales lightly from his cigar. Yeah, you could say that. He never was one to keep his word. Never. So in the end, I had to make sure that the boy was secured in a very late, you know, safe location. Leave it at that. I understand you can't go into any further detail. I respect that. So, now you know my story. 
I want to know yours. He kind of told me a little bit over the horn, but I understand you want to know who you're dealing with. As you know, I'm an alpha. There's a pack here in Anchorage. They come and they go, as they please. We always did. I was their leader. I was voted in. This is a normal process. Unfortunately, I admit, I made a few mistakes. The council, though, didn't see all the good I had done. They chose to betray me instead. Of course, by pack. I can't really blame them too much. They fell under their authority and they had to exile me. It was either that or me be killed. I have no desire to die, boy. If you understand where I'm going with that. Of course, who does? You know, unless you're suicidal, which I don't think you are. Not at all. So, as a result, I no longer had their funding. And, as you probably have guessed, I've always been a man of the sea. It's always been a place where I feel calm and at peace. My father, he was a uh, crab fisherman here in this city, as a matter of fact. Very, very strong-minded man. Unfortunately, an accident claimed his life. I was but maybe 17 when I met Blackfeather. Of course, he was much younger than he is now. We became friends, and he offered me a chance, an opportunity. He offered me the power of the wolf. So he's the one that infected you. Yes, he is. Unfortunately, that's about as far as it got. While we remained good friends for a long time, he himself ended up turning his back on me after I was exiled. Of course, Alex knows the truth. He knows the real reason in which Garrett had been exiled. The fact is, the man loved to hunt humans for sport. And he had done it one too many times. Risking the exposure of the race, as well as that of the Fellowship of the Wolf itself and the Council. And such things cannot be allowed. And Charles Blackfeather, of course, being a man of moral ground, he immediately abandoned all connection he had with Garrett. So Alex knows the truth, but he bites his tongue and sympathizes with the man. He can tell this man is desperately lonely, and he actually does have some empathy for the old bastard. The bearded man decides to get to the point. I understand. Isolation when it comes to uh, those like us, it does something to the mind and the spirit in a very negative way. Exactly. We're social creatures. I may have done questionable things, but I didn't deserve what I got. Just like you. I think we have much in common. I'm going against my own judgment. Possibly of loneliness, but also... Again, I see a kinship in you. You're an alpha. I can tell that about you. I could definitely use one like you to keep things in line. So what exactly are we dealing with? Well, we're not going to be talking here. We'll be talking on my ship. If you understand where I'm going with this, of course. Come. And with this, the two men stand and leave the bar. The ship itself is a fairly nice one. It's an older cargo vessel. Definitely seaworthy and reinforced. Alex can tell Garrett is a man of definite mechanical knowledge as well as seafaring knowledge. He's impressed. Yet he also feels sad that such knowledge can be wasted on such a very evil man. But again, he keeps his opinions to himself. They're in his office, fairly large area, which is basically the captain's quarters. Alex takes a seat when it's offered. All right, this is how it's going to play, and this is what we do. Number one, I will pay you very well for your services. Number two, I'm a man that does not abide laziness in any way, shape, or form. You don't have to worry about that from me. I believe that, as a matter of fact. Now, there are other members of my crew, which you will have to, of course, get acquainted with. One is my first mate. Try to avoid him if you can. He's very abrasive by nature, but at the same time, he's very loyal to me. And somewhat protective. Then, of course, I'm his meal ticket, so you can't blame the guy for that. He's very intelligent for a human. Very resourceful. He's actually proved invaluable. So, what about him? What should I know? Well... He's a man that grew up in the streets of New York, an Italian family. 
Yeah, his mob connections are dead. Unfortunately, many of them sold him out, and he was sent to prison. How's that for loyalty, huh? <laughs> but anyway, once he got out, me and him hit it up pretty good, and, uh, well, the last 15 years, he's been nothing but loyal, as I said. All I have to do is ask him to jump, and he asks how high. So I think you understand where I'm going with this. I expect complete loyalty in my men. And he definitely does not disappoint, as I'm sure you will not. All right, now what about the others? Their names are Jonathan, Aaron, and Stephen. Stephen's the youngest. He's a little more curious than the others, too much for his own good. Jonathan is the oldest. He keeps everyone in line for the most part. He doesn't go around asking any questions, and he doesn't go around poking his nose where it doesn't belong. On the other hand, well, the middle, the middle of them, the middle brother, his name's Aaron. They're all, uh, for the most part, here because of him. He had connections while he was in prison. What was he locked up for? Honestly, last time I checked, it was bank robbery. Nothing too nefarious. He simply got too greedy, and, well, the other two went along with him, and, well, they all got in some serious trouble. Jonathan, of course, has not made that same mistake again. He's the one that is pretty much situated in himself as the one in charge. Aaron, on the other hand, is ex-military as well, so he has contacts in which you can only dream of. Much like yourself. Special Forces, then. Matter of fact, he was. Stephen, he's still very young. He's probably 23, 24. Just a boy. As I said, he can be a little bit belligerent, but at the same time, he's also one that gets the job done. I don't have too many rules, just that you do as you're told, and make sure that, of course, this ship is kept intact, as well as the vault near the hold of the ship is undisturbed. What exactly is in there? That is none of your business. It never will be, if you understand. Of course, Alex says. Unfortunately, I have to cover my rear end on this. You, know, you obviously know what I do. Especially since I heard that Rumenchek himself vouch for you. Alex nods. While in fact, that is not the case. The council has simply, simply been able to provide very realistic looking forgeries of paperwork. Leave it at that. So Alex simply listens to the man before asking what exactly, uh, I'm not exactly interested in what is in the hold of your ship. That ain't my business. But you're saying that we're dealing with cryptid smuggling. Is that correct? Indeed. It's very lucrative, and unfortunately, very dangerous. As a matter of fact, that's something I need to tell you about. I know you're not exactly a big fan of dogmen. I have good reason to hate them. But also you told me you were tired of doing uh, damn council's dirty work. You can say that again. Fair enough. I was going to let you know there is a dogman on my ship. He is the one that protects the cargo. And while I do understand that you would not have a problem disposing of him, if you go any, in any way against him, that's considered a disrespect to me. And make no mistake, this is the second time I'm going to give you the warning, but I have to. I'm listening. Make no mistake, if you even think of disobeying any of the rules that I set forward for you, I will not hesitate to kill you and throw your body overboard. Are we clear? Understandable. Good. Just so we have that out of the way. As I said, you will definitely earn your keep. I will pay you about the same, since you are what you are, like I am what I am. I will pay you the same as Joshua, which is a pretty hefty amount. I'm not going to discuss that right now, because it depends on which happens for job for job. Let's leave it at that. We're going to set sail tonight. I have a very interested buyer who wants to purchase what I have. However, I cannot afford to be caught on land at this time because I have received word that the council has their lackeys and spies in the city. And unfortunately for them, if I am out to sea, of course there will be no eyes or ears. Number one. Number two, they have no jurisdiction. So that is where... The negotiations will take place. 
and then we will sit port, possibly back here in Anchorage, or another area near the coast. I cannot tell you exactly where, but once, the, once all deliberations and communications are set, then the trend, and then of course, the transference of what I have in my cargo hold, as well as the cash to us, once all negotiations and business transactions are complete, you'll be paid very well, I promise you that. I'm a man of my word, because only ask Joshua, and he will vouch for me, obviously. And I'm not simply talking about a man who's a lackey. Let me tell you something about Mr. Falcone. He thinks for himself. Sometimes he thinks too much for himself. Fair enough. I'll follow your orders to the letter. Good. Get yourself some rest. Make sure that you learn quickly. And as I said, so we follow my orders. Keep your eyes and ears open. As well as your head low. And don't get too nosy for your own good. And eventually I'll start showing you how to possibly handle this stuff on your own. Maybe eventually you want to strike out and actually do the same thing that I do. I'll be your mentor. I believe you'll be a very apt student, but I'm not going to do this right away. I have to understand if I can trust you. Are we clear? Of course. Go. Alex very calmly prepares the room which is offered to him. He unpacks his stuff and gets himself prepared to rest, at least for a couple of hours, before there's a knock on the door. Come in, he says. A large, dark-complected man enters the room without even saying as much as a hello. Ah, so you're uh, the fellow that the captain was talking about. I take it you're Joshua. Ah, you're very observant. I can respect that. I'll tell you straight up, I don't trust you, nor do I like you. And that's nothing personal, that's just how it is. Now, I'm not going to say you can't earn that. As long as you do what you're told, you and me, brother, we'll get along fine. We clear on that? Of course. So what exactly are my duties going to be? That's what the captain wanted me to tell you. It's not going to be much, mainly, uh, of course, helping uh, keep this ship maintained. Uh, maybe some security work every now and then. I'm not sure if you know exactly how uh, a vessel works, but I'll show you myself if I have to. I've been to sea a couple of times. When I was younger, I worked as a longshoreman. Ah, so you definitely know the way of handling things when it comes to cargo. Good. There will be times that you will be uh, asked to prepare meals for the cargo and different things, and that's simply how it is. You'll eventually know what we're dealing with and what, how we handle such things after the first transaction. It should be happening in about 24 to 48 hours. I take your client is... Uh, fairly well off. Yes and no. That's one of the reasons we're having everything delayed. We've gotten the first half of the payment. This next uh, transaction will be the second and the final. Of course, expenses with, with the expenses that were, uh, how can I say is the best way? How we caught this one was by sheer accident, number one. You have to understand that. But it's also more exotic, as well as more valuable than your average you know, this isn't just like some normal cricket you'd find. This is something I didn't even know existed. So you're talking about something very rare and valuable, yes. Extremely valuable. And because of this, we cannot risk anyone having loose lips or being distracted. You get me what I'm trying to say? Yeah, perfectly. First, you know, I think you're a nosy bastard that needs to be thrown overboard. But you can change my mind. Something to do as you're told. Help out when you're asked, I guarantee you. If you win my respect, I have your back. The captain is boneheaded. He's too boneheaded at times. He has a lot of pride. Sometimes he gets it over his head, especially when he's dealing with things like we have right now. All right? He said there was a dog man on board. Yeah, he's, well, he's an old one, probably about... I say he's actually well into his 40s. Of course, dogmen, as you know, live damn near as long as humans. So that's not even an issue right there. But he's about as strong as they get, too. I found him in Bagnum. The old man was able to whip him into shape. And believe me, he wasn't easy to do. Matter of fact, I was kind of worried. That's one of those situations where I told you he likes to get over, in over his head. 
as an example of what I'm talking about. So, I'm not sure how you'll be able to interact with them. I know you have a hard on against many of them dogmen, and I can't blame you. Trust me, they're a pain in the ass to deal with. But you're gonna have to put up that all that aside if you're gonna stay on this ship. It's not a problem, Alex says. Trust me, I overcame my desire for revenges and things a long time ago. Good. I know they've taken the lives of many people. I understand why you would have a problem with them, though. I'm not going to blame you for that. But again, your personal animosities have to stay behind if you're going to work with us. Of course. Good. Now, that that's out of the way. There's also three other crew members. Their names are Jonathan, Aaron, and Stephen. They're good guys, but they kind of stick together. The only one I'd be concerned about would either be Stephen or Jonathan. Jonathan's kind of overprotective of the other two. But he keeps them in line and uh, keeps them on the straight and narrow. And of course, you already know. He'll be preparing meals, mainly. And some security. Mainly to make sure that the other three don't get too nosy. I want you to do whatever it takes at times, if needed, to dissuade them, to change their minds. You understand? Perfectly. And if that means doing what must be done, I don't expect any hesitation. I've taken my fair share of life. I'm very aware of that. I just want to make sure. Now, do I want you to just go around being a bully? No. That's not what I want. I simply want you to be aware and keep an eye on everyone on this ship. The fact is, the only two people you to take orders from are me and Garrett, the captain. Anyone else, they can play with themselves. You answer directly to the two of us. Anything else? I'm kind of curious, what got you involved with this? I don't, I don't have a problem answering that. <laughs> Number one, Garrett was there for me when I got out of prison. I was a little too ambitious for my own good, leave it at that. No more, no less. Alex, of course, wants to laugh in the man's face. He knows all too well what this man had done. He was a former hitman for the mob. A very sick and twisted deviant, a sexual deviant on top of it. Alex already knows something is very wrong when he had heard the term exotic when it came to their cargo. Alex swears right then and there, I'm going to kill this man. I just have to have the right time and the right place. This man is going to die. The scent of said cargo is all over him. He can't believe that the captain had been so foolish as to let him on this ship. But in the end, he also knows the captain's not an idiot, not truly. He was simply lonely and desperate. Alex can understand that. But whatever is going on, whatever is on this ship is very female, you can tell that much. And it's not human. He'll have to bide his time. He's not sure how he'll handle old Red. But he'll do what needs to be done if he has to do it. He knows he has 24 hours to act. And even then, he has time. As a matter of fact, maybe dealing with all of this and taking care of everyone on this ship while they're out to sea might prove more of an advantage to him than he can actually imagine. So therefore, he makes a decision then and there. He'll play the good little stoolie for now. Charles has simply asked him to find out information, not to go much further than, the, than that, unless he had a choice, unless he had no other choice. The way Alex sees it, he probably ain't going to. Time passes quickly over the next 12 hours. He gets about three or four hours sleep, and then he begins to realize what his duties are. Mainly, actually, his mainly cooking duty. He doesn't have a problem with that, even though he wishes personally he could poison at least two of uh, the five people that are operating on this ship. Unfortunately for that, well, it wouldn't do much good besides. Especially with one of his own kind, they'd be able to smell the poison before it even was served to him. And of course, he didn't have such supplies anyway. But, one can wish, can't they? Alex decides simply to be quiet for the most part. He has no qualms interacting with the other three. Jonathan is a big fella, not quite as big as Joshua, but Overall, he seems like a decent dude. He made a few bad mistakes in life, and he's now trying to right those wrongs. Alex can respect that. The middle one, Aaron, is kind of arrogant, but he's not a bad guy. He's simply one that, well, Alex can definitely recognize the type. 
you know, former military, much like himself, you know, he kind of actually reminds him a little bit of Michael from Chapter 2. That fills the, fills the man with a heavy heart. He promises this time he'll watch out for him as best he can. He doesn't want anyone else to die under his watch who don't deserve it. And then, of course, there's Stephen. The fellow doesn't know how to shut up, period. But Alex humors him more times than not. He prepares the food as told. And, of course, at times, well, he hears Stephen talking to his older brother, Jonathan. I'm telling you right now, Steve, leave that shit alone. Oh, come on, man. I want to see what's in that damn vault. I mean, I really do. I, mean, I think it'll be kind of whatever it is. I mean, I wonder if it's some kind of prehistoric lizard or another Sasquatch or something, you know? I think what you need to do, boy, is leave things alone, Alex says. No argument in his tone. And who the hell... Trust me. His eyes flicker amber for a moment. Oh, shit. You're like the captain. That's right. And trust me. You ain't wanted to fuck with him. You damn sure ain't wanted to screw with me. Do we understand one another? Yeah, perfectly. There's a snarling <laughs> down the hall. A very large creature lays on the ground, simply relaxing. He's chained to the door. The beast is massive, red, and gray. It's obvious this is a dogman. He's older than any dogman that Alex has ever encountered. Of course, there are some that live to an advanced age, but this one, for this one to be an alpha as long as he has been, Alex can tell this one is a fighter as well as a warrior. Yeah, the captain was able to kind of get that one into uh, shape. <laughs> it was kind of fun to watch, but at the same time, I thought the old man was going to get it. It's then that Aaron speaks. You know, Stephen, for someone who talks too much, you sure as hell don't know how to keep a secret. Then, of course, maybe that's the part of talking too fucking much. Relax, both of you, Jonathan says angrily. Now, Mr. McIntyre is just doing his job. Exactly. Okay, so if you're like the captain, that means you two, uh, we know each other. Not very well, but we have similar pasts. Just leave it that. Uh, so mutual interests, I can respect that. Jonathan says. Hey, there's nothing wrong with wanting a good-sized paycheck. I totally understand about that one, Mr. McIntyre. Uh, don't mind my brothers, they're idiots. Both of them. You know, you really can be an asshole sometimes. The brothers are interrupted by a Joshua, who calls out, All right, boys, break's over. Get back to it. Come on, I'm not paying you just to lay around and be lazy assholes. Come on! They all nod and get back to work, maintaining the ship, as well as different things which have to be taken care of. And with this, Joshua smirks lightly. I said, I handled that. Pressed. Keep doing it. Me and the captain are expecting uh, some company very soon. I want you to keep out of the way. So keep doing what you're doing. Keep cooking. I saw that you were interacting with Red there a little bit, but don't worry too much about that. Isn't that right, boy? The dog man makes no sound. It simply snarls low. <laughs> Dull green eyes revealing hatred. Uh, he's a vicious bastard, but we got him beat. As long as you don't get on his bad side, you'll be fine. And with this, he walks away whistling. Alex is left to himself. And with this, he looks at the dog man, who, like I said, is chained to the vault door. The creature snarls low. And Alex has killed many of his own kind. Alex very calmly focuses, allowing the change to slightly take place. But nothing in a threatening manner. He simply allows his eyes to turn amber and his ears to slightly grow pointed. Relax. I'm not your enemy. Do you understand? The dogman growls lower. Now, standing, at first on all fours, but then on his hind legs. Alex flexes, growls viciously. And with this, he, he moves almost as if to charge. But then... He sees Alex's eyes, and he seems to understand something as Alex speaks. I had to kill one. Not much unlike you, little younger. 
big guy, just like you. But I didn't have much choice then. He crossed a line. He killed some friends of mine, him and his pack. Now, I ain't killed many of your kind for a reason. I understand now that you guys ain't much different than us. You're just, well, kind of on the different flip side of the same coin. I know you guys ain't like us, but you ain't that much different. I don't have a problem with you. As a matter of fact, I might be able to work with you. The dog man growls slowly. <laughs> but then, he stops burying those nasty serrated teeth and calms down. His tail begins to wag lightly as Alex very calmly crouches down. I'm not going to harm you. The creature lays back down on all fours, looking up at it, whining. I might even be able to free you. How would you like that? I know you understand what I'm talking about. The creature actually simply exhales and whines at me, just like a dog. I can't promise you anything. I might not be able to do a damn thing for you. But I'm going to try. I might have to look and see what's beyond that door sometime. And I trust you to have my back. The creature narrows its gaze. Snarls off. Ah, so you're kind of protective of what's in there, huh? Why is that? The dog man simply refuses to respond at all. He simply curls up right in front of the vault door. They treated her bad, huh? The dog man does not respond, but his posture is all the answer Alex needs. I need you to be patient with me. If I can figure out what's going on and who our visitor is going to be, I promise you. I guarantee you. He ain't gonna be a prisoner anymore. You understand? I have your back. I need you to have mine. The dog man simply chuffs slightly and actually nods. All right. He pets the creature very gently and he allows his own features to return to normal. And with this, he commences carrying on the rest of hours pass from that moment. And indeed, they have all pulled out to sea. However, Despite the fact that they are in the middle of the ocean, it is not much trouble for them to see a very expensive yacht pull up. A dark-skinned man, a man who is obviously of Latin descent, can be seen with a couple of goons on either side of him. And with this, Garrett stands on the bow of his ship. Ah, Mr. Zanzibar, it's a pleasure to meet you. I take it you have my, uh, soon-to-be property? Indeed I do. I think you will like her. I think you will like her quite a bit. Well, I want to see her as soon as possible. With that, sir, I shall definitely be glad to uh, make sure it happens. Do you have the money? I sure do. One, a very big burly goon steps forward with two suitcases filled with money. They're opened. And of course, Garrett, being what he is, consents that this stuff is not fake. It's the real deal. That box right there has a quarter of a million solid gold bars along with this quarter of a million in cash. Now, do we have a deal? I'm a man of my word, you know that. I have to admit that Sasquatch, <laughs> that one was fascinating. Whatever happened to it? Well, Let's just say that my own client was very interested in buying it. Glad to hear it. How are things with Rumancheck? Hey, he's still an arrogant asshole as always. Indeed, Garrett says, smirking. The man known as Miguel Zanzibar was born in Venezuela. He is well known for being in Maduro's back pocket, as well as being a very corrupt, vicious man. He also has a very nasty reputation for collecting cryptids. And with this, he's led down to the vault. Alec is very quiet. He himself is remaining silent. He has no idea what's going on, and he won't be able to know until the transaction occurs. He doesn't even know if he'll be able to intervene beyond getting information and relaying that back to Charles. He doesn't have a cell phone. He had been searched before, even being allowed on the, on the, you know, the ship. 
You'd be forced to leave that behind. That, of course, Alex can't blame, you know, Garrett for being so superstitious. You know, well, not superstitious, but suspicious or paranoid by nature. You can't blame him one bit. But that doesn't make him any less of a bastard. Alex does not make any sign known or any inclination that he's spying on anybody. However, being what he is and being as skilled as he is in espionage, being former military, it's very little trouble for him to easily get past the few cameras that are installed on the ship. He had actually been easily able to make note of where each one was without any hesitation. So he's at a perfect viewing point. He sees a man actually shorter than himself, fat, and two big goons on either side of him. This asshole here must be the uh, so-called client in which Garrett was dealing with. He angles himself to where he can see down the hall, right out of eyesight of anyone else. His own heightened senses easily catch a view of what he sees. The short fat man, that is Miguel Zanzibar, steps back in shock when he sees Old Red standing on his hind legs, towering at least a good eight foot. All 900 pounds with a solid muscle bearing down upon him. The only thing keeping him back is that chain, which is retracted into the wall around his neck. Enough, Garrett snarls. There's actually a bit of a bestial, guttural growl when he says those words enough, too. That of Old Red. The dog man very calmly or meekly, I should say, lowers his head in submission and backs away. Alex can narr cannot help but narrow his eyes. Even with his enhanced vision, it's hard to get a good view of what's going on. But he sees everything. He sees the f short fat man, the disgusting pig, step forward and look to the cargo. Indeed, she was exotic. She's a girl. Her skin is blue. There's no hair on her body. Curled up against the wall like a cat hissing, bearing her very sharp, needle-like teeth. Her ears are webbed, as are her hands and her feet. Where her ribs are, between them are gill slits, which open and close. It's obvious this girl can breathe in the air and, you know, like on land, and of course in the water. Gary has never seen a mer creature before, but of course he had heard of her. The females are actually very attractive. They're the ones that usually will be used to bring in human prey. And, of course, their mates, the males, are big, horrific creatures. Think of the uh, creature from the Black Lagoon, the Gill Man. They're vicious creatures like that that have no qualms eating human flesh. The females, like I said, are used as decoys. Yet, despite this, Alex cannot help but feel the desire to kill these men here and, here and there. Yet he knows he has to wait. He'd been told by Charles, if possible, do not take their lives, because it could simply bring more heat upon us than we really want from the council, the old rules they have to abide by. So he knows for a fact he'll have to wait. And hopefully, maybe, if he can keep his temper in check, he'll simply bring back proof and bring it to Charles, and then the rest will be taken care of from there. However... The next two minutes of conversation give him a better opportunity to take things into his own hands. I'm going to have to come back in two days. Ah, so you don't want to take her here and now? No, I've given you most of the money, and I trust you. You've always been trustworthy in the past, and you know for a fact I'm not a man to be crossed or fucked with. Never suggested that, but I can't hold her for more than three days. You are aware of this. Well, I am understanding that you have your own uh, issues you have to deal with, as well as eyes upon your person. I get that. My God, she is beautiful, the man says. Unfortunately, as I said, I have to take care of a few business affairs before pleasure. So therefore, hold on to her. I'll be back within exactly 48 hours from now. And then, we'll simply, we will simply complete the transaction at that time. You have most of the money. So I know for a fact that this will not be a problem. Not at all, Garrett says. The two shake hands. Alex even now wants to puke. He sees Joshua standing in the back, in the background, licking his lips, looking at the girl. He is going to kill all of them. This, he swears. But he must take his time. He looks to Old Red. The dog man looks right back to him. He realizes he has an ally. He'll have 
have to be very careful and play things out properly. He decides right then and now. He cannot wait for the council. Because the fact is, if this girl is taken, they won't be able to find her. And any evidence, well, he, he is very aware that Garrett is intelligent enough to know not to drag his heels on things. So be it. He'll have to do things his own way. Joshua Falcone zips up his pants, whistling in satisfaction as he closes the vault door. The fact was, well, he'd been able to sedate old Red with a couple of tranquilizer darts. He didn't have to worry about that one. Yet he feels that he'd been watched. He doesn't know why. He knows for a fact that, well, their new member for the crew, Alex, as well as the brothers, had all stayed sealed away like they were ordered to. So, why does he feel like he's being watched? Doesn't make any damn sense. He decided to have his last bit of fun with the girl. You know, after all, you know, him being a deviant as he is only made proper sense. Besides, with that fat bastard taking her away, he figured he may as well show her what a real man's uh, touch is like before she has to settle with uh, mediocre goods. But in the end, screw it. A buyer is a buyer. And with this, he makes his way to his room. He turns on the shower. He's about to get undressed and clean up. However, it's that moment that he f actually feels someone in this room with him. That doesn't make any sense. He wonders if Zanzibar had actually had one of his goons stow away on board the ship. Maybe try to do something stupid like, you know, maybe get the cargo for free. Who knows? And that way he can take back the money that had been offered to Garrett and himself. He doesn't know. But he's not taking chances. He reaches into the drawer and pulls out a 9mm Glock, looking around. However, a blur moves beyond what the eye can see. As a, as a very powerful hand grabs him by the throat with such force that his hyoid bone is actually cracked and he's forced to his knees and the gun ripped away from his hand with such, with such force that two of his fingers are broken. And with this, the small, powerfully built man viciously headbutts him as hard as he can right in, the, right in the nose, shattering his nose. And with this, the man tries to engage with his own very high knowledge of street fighting, as well as his greater physical size, but Alex is too strong. With a vicious punch right to the man's temple, he's knocked, quite literally un damn near unconscious, onto the floor of the ship. He's very calmly turned over. The man shakes his head, trying to get the cobwebs off. As he quite literally tries to, you know, grab and push the smaller, but obviously much stronger werewolf off of him. Alex his features are quite human, except for those amber eyes. And with this, a knife is pressed to his throat. Make one fucking move and I kill you. God damn it, I knew! I said, shut the fuck up. I smelled you all over her. I smelled her all over you. This is a goddamn child. What the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> hey, what can I tell you? You jealous? And with this, Alex very calmly cuts into the man's flesh, drawing blood, and near cutting his throat. Oh, what? Stop! You want to keep talking? I'm going to ask you questions, and then you're going to answer them. You're going to kill me anyway. Of course I'm going to kill you. You were dead the moment you laid hands on her. It's just a matter of how quick you go, or how long it takes you to die. You understand? Fuck you. No, boy. Fuck you. And with this, he grabs the man by his testicles and squeezes, eliciting a horrible screech of pain as I claps his hand over the man's mouth. Shh. Now I can do this all night. Believe me, I'm going to enjoy it. You ain't. All right. What do you want to know, you bastard? How'd you catch her? <laughs> It was luck. She, uh, sometimes the captain, you know, he likes to go fishing for crab, different things like that. You know, supplement income when we can't catch good cargo. She was caught up in the nets. Hell, I didn't even know anything like her existed. I mean, I knew the captain was, and you, what you are, but uh, it's too good to be true. Beautiful. Most beautiful thing I'd ever seen in my life. Garrett decided, you know, she would be a perfect catch. I don't know how he knows what she is, but 
He knew enough that she could survive on land for an indefinite amount of time. He knew what to feed her. You know, she seems to like seafood and all that good crap. Wasn't an issue. But... <laughs> Damn it, let me go! I promise I won't... <sighs> so that's what it is, huh? She simply was in the wrong place at the wrong time and you decided to be a fucking pervert. Now, I want you to know one thing. And what's that? The man struggles, trying to push Alex off of him. This. And with this, he sees Alex's hand. His left hand is the one holding him down. He sees fur ripple across the man's hand and claws erupt as his, quite literally, those claws dig into his throat. He feels them cut into his flesh. And then all of a sudden, there's a sickening pop as the man's neck is snapped. Alex very calmly spits in the man's dead face. Don't worry. You got uh, some other people gonna be joining you in hell pretty fucking quick. I promise you that. Jonathan is currently performing his rounds along the ship. He notices the door to Joshua's room open. A strange. The man is an asshole. He's a thorough asshole. He never, ever leaves that door open or unlocked when he's not in there. He's about to uh, shout a warning to his brothers, and all of a sudden Alex grabs him, clamping a hand over his throat, literally his mouth, holding him against the wall. The man tries to fight back, but Alex again, since he's not human, he's just too strong, despite the other man being quite a bit bigger. Shh! Look, I'm not going to harm you. Trust me, if I wanted you dead, you'd be dead already. You know what I am. Yeah, no shit. Jonathan says. Calm down. I ain't your enemy. Actually, I got something to show you. All right. I want you to get your brothers. And I'll be honest with you. How the three of you respond to what you're seeing will determine uh, a few things. Like whether we live or die. You're a smart kid. Alex has that 9mm in his grip. Don't do anything stupid. I think all of you are on the level. I don't have to kill one man tonight. I didn't exactly regret it. Don't make me regret killing you. Because I don't think you're the same kind of individual that's deserving it. Don't be stupid. Get your brothers. And make sure that the old man ain't notified. He probably already knows. I'll deal with him. Get him. Now. He nods. And with this, he quickly rustles up Aaron and Stephen. The three quickly make themselves known. All right, you got my brothers here. What's going on? Well, I want to show you boys something. And with this, old Red, very calmly, obviously now he's... Very awake and very, very furious. However, he sees Alex. The man nods to the dog man. The massive beast growls softly. What I told you, boy. Trust me. The creature nods and shuffles out of the way. Alex very calmly produces the key in which he had taken from Joshua's corpse. He had locked the vault. I want all of you. Follow me to stay close, but not too close. I'm not sure how this girl's going to respond. Girl, Jonathan says in shock. Aaron speaks up. What are you talking about? There's no damn girl in there. You're crazy. That's not... I mean, no... I said shut up and keep close to me. Steven speaks. I think he's right, man. Let's just... For once, the one who speaks too much is the wiser of all three. Jonathan nods. And they follow Alex into the vault once, it's, once the door is pushed open. The girl, of course, is bruised horribly. Her blue skin has cuts all over. She's curled up into a ball, a fetal position. She kisses viciously at Alex. But then Old Red drops to all fours and barks softly. And growls. The girl looks to Old Red. Obviously, there's a bond between the two. 
She hisses back and then looks to Alex. And with this, Alex at that moment is hit with mental images. Images not of his own mind's making. First, Alex almost panics when he sees these images that are not of his own thinking. But then, of course, he remembers what Blackfeather had taught him about the Nereids, also known as Merfolk. He grits his teeth as he forces himself to accept the images being projected into his mind. Horrible images. He sees through the girl's eyes, her swimming with her family. A very horrific looking creature, as I said before. A male version of her species, obviously her father. And of course a very attractive, older version of the girl. Slightly larger, obviously her mother. And then another creature, horrific, actually larger than the father. The woman's mate, the girl's mate. He's young, but he's massive for one of his species. Alex, at that moment, winces, and he speaks softly. I'm not going to harm you. I'm going to try to free you, you understand? But I need you to remain still. The girl grits those razor teeth at him. But she then calms down somewhat. Her lovely features are no longer feral, but quite lovely. As Alex actually feels his heart hurt. As he then sets a hand on her shoulder and very calmly unlocks both her, both her restraints as well as the chain around her neck. The chain clatters to the floor <clears throat> as Alex then speaks softly, looking to the three brothers. He, notice, he notices their look of horror and disgust <clears throat> at what they had obviously been an unknowing party to. It's Stephen that speaks. My God. I mean, I don't care what she is. She's just a girl. Oh, my God. What the fuck have we been doing? I mean, I thought these were just monsters. And... I understand why you think that. The male versions of her species ain't too attractive. But that ain't exactly why she was wanted, was she? And with this, the red growl of that girl, looking at them, almost judging them. But it's Aaron who speaks, so what do you need us to do? I need you all to keep an eye on her. I have an old man to kill. Someone, get her a blanket, something. Try to get her some food, something, anything. Just make sure she doesn't leave this room. Aaron nods. And with this, Jonathan takes charge. All right, you heard the man. Come on, let's do this. Alex very calmly makes his way to the captain's quarters. The room is empty, but he can easily catch the scent. The scent of the filthy perverts in which it started this entire bout of madness. Alex has seen the bruises. He's seen the scratches. The man has to die. There's no doubt about it. The council, if they have any issue, they can kiss his ass. Besides, this is the last favor he owed them anyway. He says, I'm sorry, Charlie. But I can't. He follows the scent to where the old man stands, right at the bow of the ship. His hands are in his pockets. He simply stands casually, ignoring the salty wind that blows all around them. <laughs> you killed him, didn't you? It's not like you didn't deserve it. You're just like the rest of them. I should have known you were the council's fucking lapdog. I'm gonna be honest with you. If I hadn't seen anything that was uh, too suspicious, I would let it go and told him to stick it. You have to understand something, old man. I ain't exactly a friend of the council. I just owed him a couple of favors, mainly the one who made you. He's ten times the man you are. <laughs> Spoken like a true fucking hypocrite. No, boy. You're the hypocrite. No, you old bastard. You're the hypocrite. <laughs> it's a hypocrisy simply to do what one has to do to survive in this world. I wasn't lying to you, son, when I said my own people turned against me. I know exactly why they did, too. 
You're hunting people for sport. No freaking reason at all. Of course, we're predators. Both creatures like you and me. We've always been predators. Don't tell me you haven't killed for the thrill of it. I've hunted animals more than once, but never the two-legged variety, unless I deserved it. And who are you to decide who deserves what? <laughs> at least I don't go around trying to put my hands on young girls who ain't deserving to be treated like that. <laughs> Spoken like a true neutered member of our society. The founder, it was all his doing. I heard many stories of him during his human years. And then how he became one of us. He was a true savage, my God. He was a true one of us, he was a true warrior. <laughs> Truly how we were always meant to be. And then, again, he was neutered by his own conscience. He became something he never desired to be. You're right, maybe he is an abomination in some ways. But it ain't a choice of his that he made. And I'll be honest with you, he's always had my respect. Unlike you, you're just a mad freaking dog. That's all you ever were. That's all you ever gonna be. <laughs> I'm offering you a chance, son. You can't take me. You know what I am. I'm an alpha. Unlike anything you've ever seen. You also are aware, I'm pretty sure like they told you, just what I can do. I'm very aware. You're a Thropa, not a Lyca. Now I'm going to go into a little bit of a technical term here, so please understand why I try to go through this with you. A Lyca is what 80% of the Brotherhood are. Or those of the Fellowship, the entire gamut of werewolf kind. And these, of course, are the ones that turn into massive lupine beasts. Of course, looking similar to that of the Dogman, or not unlike the Lycan from Underworld, actually very similar to that. Think of how William Corvinus looks, but black, if you get my drift. Or any other color of the natural spectrum of wolves. However, a Lyca is this, but the Thropa is another. The Thropa is roughly 20% of werewolf kind. And these form into that of the Wolfman. Think Lon Chaney, not Lon, yeah, I think it was, yes, Lon Chaney. Think of him, the Wolfman, if you understand where I'm going with this, or the 2010 movie with Benicio Del Toro. That appearance. Well, physically, they're slightly weaker than that of the Lyca strain. They actually have more control of their bestial side. They can actually even use weapons and different things and actually even speak in that form. And truly they are feared, even among those of the werewolf species. Even the alphas try to leave them alone, especially an alpha rank. And you just killed my best fucking friend. As well as the fact, I don't have a lot much to lose right now. So who is supplying you? Roman check? Of course. He's a vain bastard, but he's also very pragmatic. I have to give him respect where it's due. The council has always had issues when it comes to certain things. True, there might be a little bit of the more morally bankrupt affair. But they're lucrative, more money. The power in which we truly all could have had. But no, the freaking founder, Abel, decides there's certain routes we cannot take. And of course, his word, the man makes quotation marks, is law. Well, guess what? Fuck the law. Fuck all of you. Now, I'm willing to let all of this go if you'll just let me walk away. Take the girl. Take whoever. I don't care. But if not, I am going to spill your guts all over this deck. The man very calmly pulls out Two silver blades, massive Bowie knives from sheaves that are held behind his jacket. They glint in the moonlight. And with this, Alex raises his brow. How the hell are you able to hold those? As I said before, being what I am, this strain, it allows me to concentrate a little bit better. Especially when it comes to the other side. His eyes glow amber. His features begin to grow hairier. He 
his feet start to crack as his height and muscle mass begin to build. His clothing is shredded. All in loose tatters to be washed away by the wind. The beast stands at least a good six foot ten to seven foot tall. He is not massive as most werewolves would be, because again, he is more of the wolfman variety. But he is impossibly muscled. His teeth, while they're close set to his face, are razor sharp. His claws, massive. The beast stands forth on hot feet as he speaks softly. I give you one chance. Walk away. His massive talon hands hold those silver blades. His hands actually smoke and bleed slightly, but Alec is impressed. He realizes he has no choice. He may not even have a chance to shift in time, but he cannot afford to let those brothers who have helped him when it comes to acquiring to that girl's safety be harmed, even if it means his own life. With a 9mm Glock in his hand, beyond what the eye can see, he shoots the massive wolfman, quite literally in the chest. Of course it does no good. The bullet simply hits into hard muscle and very thick hide, but nothing. Of course, there's no bleeding. His regeneration immediately takes care of that. The creature chuckles <laughs> and lunges forth. However, Alex, and he slams his elbow, quick and as hard as he can, into the back of the creature's head. He is actually able to knock the beast to the floor. Due to his own adrenaline flowing through his veins, as well as his own lupine strength. Never forget, Alex is a very powerful alpha, possibly the most powerful of his kind. Due to him being infected at only a very young age. If you remember chapter one, Alex at that moment wills a change. He realizes the gun is useless, so he throws it to the side. The change happens within seconds. His own body ripples and contorts into a massive lupine monster. However, he does not focus the shift as much as he had like when he came against the Sasquatch in, channel, in Chapter 2. He knows to literally force himself to become that much of a monster, he would lose his own ability to think as well as any reasoning, and that could possibly actually prove his undoing. So he maintains for the most part the lichen type form, and with this, he slashes forth, trying to slash into Garrett's face. However, Garrett smirks and dodges to the side, slamming one of those silver blades into Alex's shoulder blade. The werewolf falls in pain and drops to the ground. And with this, Garrett stabs down with the other knife, stabbing into his back, paralyzing it. The silver, of course, halting any regeneration. And with this, he crouches down, whispering into Alex's ear. I'm going to kill you. Slowly. And then... I'm going to keep your head as a trophy on my wall. He growls each guttural syllable of any, each word, quite literally a curse of death. However... Before he can make the killing blow, a red furred form slams into the gray form. Garrett, knocking him literally damn near into the ocean. However, Garrett holds his own as he literally slams those razor claws of his into old red shoulders. The dog man growls with his back jaw, slashing and snapping for the werewolf's face. However, again, as I said before, a dogman, no matter how powerful and old, is very rarely a match for a werewolf. And this, of course, proves true. As Garrett roars in the dogman's face, and consciously sends out a slash, raking into Old Red's face, taking out his right eye. The dogman whimpers in pain as he crashes to the ground. The creature, that is Garrett, snarls and grins lightly. And with this, he says, bad dog. 
And with this, <coughs> the Lyca Strain Werewolf, not Lyca, but throw up a strain werewolf, quite literally straddles the dog man's back and grabs both the upper part and lower part of his muzzle and jaw and prepares to pull him apart. Alex, of course, is very familiar with this move. However, he cannot stand or even think to try to do anything. Those blades are still lodged in his back and his shoulder. However, the sound of a gunshot pierces through the darkness. As Garrett howls in agonizing pain, as at that moment, Jonathan can be seen the 30 6 rifle in his hands. I always knew packing this around him would come in handy. Now fucking die, you bastard! And with this, he shoots the second round. However, Garrett is too fast. He moves, of course, beyond what the eye can see. Him being the vicious alpha that he is. And with this, he grabs Jonathan by the shoulders. And with vicious teeth, bites in and rips out the man's throat, killing him instantly. Alex growls viciously, forcing himself to try to stand. With extreme effort and no small amount of agonizing pain, he allows the final part of the transformation to occur. He no longer holds back. And due to what he is, his, his normally fairly short but long, you know, definitely canine muzzle elongates. <coughs> to a very massive size. His claws ma become even more massive. His ears become larger. His body becomes even more muscular. And with this, he forces the regeneration, despite the agonizing pain of the silver, damn near killing him right now, to rip through his body. His muscles flex, and the silver blade that was in his back falls. Garrett looks in horror at the creature in which he faces now down before him, the blackbird beast that is Alex McIntyre, roars angrily in his face as he charges forth. However, Garrett takes advantage of them, the fact that he's still hurt and wounded from that silver. He very quickly dodges under Alex's slash and slams his shoulder as hard as he can against the larger werewolf's back, sending him sprawling. Too slow. You're good, he says, exhaling softly. Never seen one. Get up from that. Too bad. And with this, he very calmly picks up one of those blades. He begins to advance on Alex, who is still too hurt due to the fact his back is, you know, of course, silver is flowing through his veins right now. The damage to his back is, is bad. He's damn near paralyzed, despite the fact he was able to force himself to stand. Alec, with this moment, rises. And with this, he halts. He smells something. And he can also sense their presence. A loud rasping can be heard through the darkness. As Alex looks in horror and shock, to see two massive blue-skinned creatures. It's obvious they just leapt onto the ship with inhuman ease. They're massive, both of them. The older male stands at least a good seven foot from head to toe. He is very lithe in build, massive, venomous claws sticking out from webbed fingers. His features, as I said, they resemble very close to the Gill Man or that creature from that movie, The Shape of Water if you understand where I'm going with this. Quite literally, a fish-like monster with very hideous intent. The creature hisses viciously and advances upon Garrett beyond what even a werewolf can actually manage. The other one, obviously younger, massive, truly even for their standards, grabs the other side of Garrett. Garrett struggles royally and viciously. He actually bites the shoulder of the older of the two creatures. The creature howls in pain, or more growls in pain. It is actually Garrett that howls. And suddenly, at that moment, a very sharp, viciously made object, made of obviously fish bone, as well as some kind of cartilage and stone, is stabbed into his chest. 
Another is stabbed into the side of his neck. And with this, the younger of the two, the massive creature, quite literally with no small amount of effort, slashes his claws, those poison dripping claws, into Garrett's chest and out through his back. And with this, the father gurgles some weird communication to the younger. He nods, and with this he bites into Garrett's neck, sending more venom careening through the werewolf's immune system. As the poison takes his control through his veins, his flesh begins to blister and blacken. He convulses, and with this he gurgles, not like that, and then he dies falling dead at the fish creature's feet. The younger, the massive one, begins to advance upon Alex, obviously thinking that well, he was his scent is similar to this one that he could tell had raped his mate. The scent is similar, they're the same species, so he's naturally thinking this one has to die too. But it's at that moment that a cat-like shriek pierces through the darkness, and the girl, his mate, scuttles in front of him, and then crouches right in front of Alex, hissing at her own mate. He steps back, surprised. And then he understands. The creature growls softly and exhales. Gurgling in that guttural language to that of the father. The father nods slowly, and with this, they throw the body of Garrett overboard. And with this, they look to Red. Old Red is very much alive, but hurt. Alex forces himself to stand. He's too exhausted right now to take the form of any human being. Plus, the fact is, if he tries to now, he changes back, he would become feral. Permanently, permanently locked in a human form that leaves him to the full moon but still permanently in a feral mindset. Not a good way to go. However, the hunger takes over. And with this, he drops to all fours, running into the area in which he'd killed Joshua Falcone. He devours the body right then and there, nothing but bones remaining. And he forces the chain. body sinks back to that of a man. Alex coughs up blood, <coughs> looking to the girl, as well as the two massive creatures. And it's obvious he sees a third, a female, among them, obviously the girl's mother. Alex speaks softly. Go. There's nothing for you here. Go home. The girl nods, and with this, she reaches forward and actually runs a clawed hand along Alex's face, through his beard, as if saying, thank you. He nods slowly. The two surviving as brothers, Aaron and Stephen, come forth from the shadows. Damn it, Johnny. Why the... God damn it. Why did you have to be a hero? Stephen s screams, crying over his brother's body. He's on his knees, his hands literally on the man's chest. Aaron calmly sits a hand on the younger brother's shoulder. He did what he needed to do. And with this, he looks to Alex. Is it over? Is he dead? Yeah. What were those things? For at this moment, they all can see the creatures, including the girl, jumping off the bow of the ship into the water. Her family, he says. Stephen nods slowly. Do you guys have any idea how you can get us back to Anchorage? Alex says, coughing up more blood. You gonna be all right? It's gonna take time, but yeah, I'll be okay. And with this, both nod, and they basically crouch and mourn over their fallen brother. Alex speaks softly. I'm sorry. Aaron speaks up. I saw what you were trying to do. You did what you could, man. 
Believe me. I think that Johnny here would understand that too. Alex nods slowly. And with this, the two brothers take control of the ship and they head back to port. Once all is said and done, once they reach port, Alex, of course, makes a few phone calls since he has access to a phone at this moment in time. Charlie, of course, answers, imme you know, answers immediately. And within a matter of hours, different members of the Fellowship are there. Of course, werewolves in the dark clothing make sure the scene's secured, as well as all the bodies taken care of. Charles looks to the form of Joshua being carried away in a stretcher. He did a number on him. Didn't have a choice. Of course. You had to eat him to change back, didn't you? And if I wanted to remain sane, I didn't exactly know of any other way. I wasn't exactly going to go around eating on that poor kid. He saved my life. <clears throat> and with this, Charles coughed slightly. Jonathan. That's, just, that's what you said his name was, right? Yeah. I'll make sure that him and his brothers are compensated as best as I can to the best of my power, but no worry, they'll keep their mouths shut. It kind of makes me question their character, though. They had no knowledge of this. None. Still, they knew that old bastard was going around smuggling cryptids. They've had a hard enough time, Charlie. Leave it alone. Besides, I'm done. This was the last favor and you called it. I know. I need to know. Where's Rebecca? And with this, Alex looks up as Charles smiles gently and steps back to the side. The taller woman known as Rebecca Abernathy looks to it. She says nothing. This simply crushes the shorter man as her fiancé by now to her chest. She hugs the man tightly and simply buries her face into his neck and Alex buries his face into her hair. The two rock each other back and forth. There's nothing else to say. And with this Alex looks to that of Charlie, and with this he asks, so what's going to happen from here on out? What do you mean? Well, this should be more than enough evidence of what you're needing to take care of Roman check, right? Or are you just going to sweep this under the rug like anything else? That hurts Charles deeply, but in the same respect, he understands why the one who is like a son to him would say these things. No, this time... It's going to be handled by... The council's not going to do anything. The founder has taken it up on himself to deal with this. It's about damn time. Look. I'm tired. And with this, Rebecca speaks. Charlie, I appreciate everything you've done, but we're going home. All right. It's like you said, you know, we're done. I won't ask for anything else. If you guys want to live your lives, feel free to. And with this, the two walk away hand in hand. And with this, Rebecca gets Alex into her car. In the passenger side, she guns that in. And she drives towards the airport. And definitely towards home. Leaving Charles to his thoughts. After the snafu, which had happened with Garrett, as well as <laughs> his little uh, cryptid smuggling affair, Miguel Zanzibar has gone into hiding. He knows all too well the wrath of the Council of Ten. And suffice to say, he has no desire to become torn to shreds by a pack of flesh-eating lupine monsters. However, it's at that moment that he sees someone else. She's beautiful, drop-dead stunning. She's a little tall for a female that he's used to, but she's absolutely gorgeous. She had come up to him 
and simply offered her services, saying that she was connected to a few of the escort services in which she had dealt with in the past. And of course, with this alabaster skin beauty, he wasn't turning her down. However, at this moment in time, the two of them had definitely engaged in a few uh, affairs, or at least she had promised that he would definitely enjoy the finest of pleasures for the night. So currently, he's chained to a bed. However, the redhead smirks slightly. You know, you need to review your clientele a little better than you have. What are you talking about? Simple. It's not the werewolves you need to worry of, my dear, is me. Oh, you need not worry for calling for Juan or whoever the hell he is. My friend Stanley took care of him. I have to say that from what Stanley told me, even though he cannot speak, he was quite tasty. You see, I owed the council a favor. And Abel himself needed a favor of me. He's a good man, so I could not say no to him. Besides, in the end it matters little. I always repay those debts. And with this, he very calmly leans down, looking the man right in the eyes. You're a pig. And while I'd like you to squeal like one, I do not have time. I have a debt to repay. So therefore, I must tell you good night, Mr. Zanzibar. It was not pleasant. The woman, very calmly, allows her fangs to drop as she bites down into his throat. And Miriam Triculos drains him. <laughs> Nothing is left. It's a mummified looking corpse laying there in the bed. He didn't even have a chance to scream. And with this, Stanley, the massively built vampire which he had brought across roughly 200 years ago, looks to her. She smirks lightly. I take it you weren't playing nice, were you? He shakes his head. <clears throat> I... So this is the way of things. Get the chopper ready. I believe David will be very concerned if I do not hurry home soon enough. The man signs lightly. Aye, he can be a mother hen, I know. But I'm worse. The man rolls his eyes and nods. She swats him upside the back of the head. Stop it, you. Come on. We need to get back home. And with this... They leave the corpse of Miguel Zanzibar, as well as that of his goons, to rot in the estate which they had thought would be their safe haven, but actually it proved to be there too. Alexander Rumenchek is exhausted. After being found out by the council of his own unscrupulous dealings. I mean, come on, think about it. The old ways were antiquated, as well as that of... They were pathetic. There was no need to live by such rules anymore. They were men that walked among sheep. Wolves among sheep. Why should any of the council bend to the will of that abomination? True, he had founded their ways, but also he had weakened them. Pathetic. However, he is now living in fear. He thinks that he has it safe in his base in the Virgin Islands. However... He's very aware that someone is here. His men are all dead. And he is alone on the estate. His little beachfront property. Now, the last place on earth in which he will ever be seen alive. He knows this. And with this, he tries to will the change. But for some reason, he can't. This makes no sense. He himself is an alpha of no small rank. However, he feels a presence in his mind. Something that literally is overtaking him, which he cannot understand. Ah, I see that you are aware of my presence, are you not? Abel says softly. You have to understand something. As a creature, being what I am, I have certain, the man taps his forehead, abilities. Call it psychic twinkle. <laughs> Twinkle, yes, I know. A very bad, bad joke. But in the end, it matters little. I can stand into the sun, but I don't sparkle. The man very calmly reaches across the table, looking to the glass of wine in which Rumenchek had poured for himself. He calmly sits it. Vintage! Very fine vintage, I must say. 
You have good tastes. Unfortunately, the other things in which you have foul tastes in are going to cost you your life. You are a monster. You remind me in some ways of what I was at one time. But then I saw the light. Oh, yes, me and my puns. Please forgive me for that. Ah, my friend, Old Red. Yes, a very powerful member of the Brotherhood. Found him. And, well, my friend Charles brought him to me. Well, our two races have definitely been enemies at times. We are both learning to, in time, hopefully coexist. Isn't that right, boy? He pets the dog man's head affectionately with a long-nailed, fingered hand. The creature whines lightly and wags his tail. It's obviously he's on all fours. And with this, Abel Zelensky smirks lightly, revealing fang teeth. <laughs> I also promised him a new chew toy. He does not like you very much. Let me change. At least give me a fighting chance. He can feel the hybrid's mind, quite literally, his mind taking control over his own thoughts and body. How simple. Then Malachi gave me his blood. Certain things, I guess you could say, were opened up before me. It is, it, it drains me some to overpower the minds of my own brethren like this. It ends the way, that is just how it goes. Now, I'm not interested in sin. He says this. I am not interest, interested in excuses or why you did what you did. I know why. But the fact is, you have endangered our kind. You have endangered all of us. And for that, you have to die. Go ahead, boy. Enjoy your snack. And of course, this moment, the only thing which Romanchek can do is he is devoured alive by the dogman. Extreme. <laughs> His powers, useless, and his regeneration is quickly cut short. As old Red, the one-eyed dog man, gladly bites into his face, killing him. And with this, Abel very calmly whistles to him. Down, boy. Come. You and me, we will find many things and travel different lands together. The two of us. I know your time is short. But I cannot change you. It is not among my power. Unfortunately, that is just how things work. But I promise you, you will never, as long as you live with me, fear for your life. You will never grow short of prey to hunt. The old man barks happily. If he could smile, he would. And with this, I end chapter three. Of werewolf hunter i hope you enjoyed this installment into the werewolf hunter series it took a while for me to actually finally be able to make it but i was after getting it all together and just running it out there i was finally able to get it out onto an audio format i apologize to the birds in the background but unfortunately i had no other option or opportunity in which to start the story off but either way despite that i hope you enjoyed the story i definitely plan on putting out more content you guys be blessed and you be safe